from the first lady on the subject matter, which is a central concern to uh, all families in this uh, country. And because of her experience and her leadership, uh, this committee and the Congress and the American people would have benefited greatly uh, from her comments. And we will look forward to an early Senator Ted Kennedy in Washington, Chris Plant, a CNN producer, is at the Pentagon where there is a significant fire. Chris, you're on the phone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Tell me what you know. Well, uh, arriving at the Pentagon a short time ago, uh, there was a uh, huge plume of smoke which continues to rise from the west side of the Pentagon over in the area where there is a uh, helicopter landing zone. It's along Route 27 if you're looking at maps of the area. The building is currently being evacuated, and uh, police and emergency units are, of course, responding from uh, all around the building uh, and from the local Arlington County Fire Department. The plume of smoke is, uh, is enormous. It's a couple of hundred yards across at its base. It is billowing into the sky hundreds of yards. It's impossible for me to say from this side of the building whether the building itself is uh, on fire or up in flames or exactly what caused this. I did not hear an explosion, uh, but there is certainly a very, very significant fire in this enormous office building on the west front. Uh, the building is being evacuated. The Defense Pro Protective Service officers, the police force for the Pentagon, are uh, on a very tight string right now. As I arrived, okay. I was Chris, told at gunpoint... Chris. Chris, yes. let, me, let me interrupt you for a second. Just hang on. Don't go anywhere. We're getting reports now that uh, the White House is being evacuated as well. We don't know precisely what uh, what has caused that decision to be made, uh, whether that is precautionary, whether something has happened at the White House. Again, the president is in Florida this morning, so the president is not in any danger. But the White House, of course, is fully operational, whether the president is there or not. And we have reports that the White House is being evacuated. Uh, getting back to Chris in a moment, we also have reports now from uh, Chris Plant on the scene that the Pentagon is being evacuated as well. All of this coming on the heels of a large fire at the Pentagon. And we can't tell you at this moment whether that fire is inside the Pentagon building itself or on the ground to the Pentagon. And these two planes that you can see behind us that hit the World Trade Center. Uh, that's Washington, the old executive office building, I believe. And you can see the plume of smoke behind it, which we will assume until we're told otherwise that that's the fire at the Pentagon. I believe that's correct uh, as you look now at Washington. So we've got uh, a major fire at the Pentagon and the Pentagon being evacuated, the White House being evacuated. And we don't know precisely the circumstances there, what caused that decision. And we have these two enormous uh, explosions at the World Trade Center here in New York where two planes slammed into the buildings. We are also getting reports now that there is a fire on the mall in Washington, that part of the Capitol that runs uh, essentially from the Capitol to the White House in kind of a straight line going uh, up Washington, D.C., and we have reports of a fire there. Uh, this, what you're looking at now is Washington, at least if I can see the monitor in front of me. It's a little tricky from where we are, but that looks to me like the old executive office building, and then in back of it you see the large plume of smoke. Here in New York, uh, sirens everywhere, people out on the streets staring at this uh, grotesque scene of the World Trade Center buildings. It was in February of 93, if memory serves me correctly, that there was an attack, a terrorist attack on the World Trade Center. Bomb exploded in the garage of the Trade Center on that day in February of 93. Uh, here we are in the year 2001 and what appears to be deliberate attacks on the World Trade Center. And then we have these two reports out of Washington, the fire at the Pentagon. Chris Plant is still uh, on the phone, I do believe. Um, and right, we'll get to hit him in a second. Greta Van Susteren is at National Airport in Washington. Greta, what are you hearing? Uh, I just got off my plane. I was headed to New York. Planes were stalled. I'm at National Airport on the parking lot. I heard a huge noise. I looked over in the direction of the Pentagon. There's a huge plume of smoke coming from that area. I can't verify it's the Pentagon because there are these buildings in the way. You see particles coming down in the air, some sort of white particles. I can't tell what that is. I'd heard a noise slightly before I'd seen the smoke. I don't know if it's an airplane or if it's a bomb, but it was certainly something. And obviously there's a terrific fire going on. 
Um, skies are clear here except for the tremendous amount of smoke that's coming from there. Lots of sirens from all different directions and, of course, a lot of uncertainty here at National Airport. Uh, Greta, thank you. Uh, I want to just, again, recap as we pick up small pieces of information along the way. Associated Press is reporting that a plane, it was a plane that crashed at the Pentagon, and the Pentagon is being evacuated. There is a large fire there, and that is the smoke you see in the shot that you are looking at now. Whether that fire is in the building itself or outside, we have not yet confirmed. There is a fire on the mall in Washington. The, the, the cause of the fire on the mall in Washington, we cannot yet tell you. We can tell you that the White House has been evacuated, and we can tell you that two planes have crashed into the World Trade Center in New York. All of this began uh, just a little more than an hour ago at about 8.45 Eastern Time. Chris Plant, tell me what you've learned since we last talked. Well, in speaking to people uh, here at, uh, at the Pentagon as they're being evacuated, from the building, I am told by several people that there was, in fact, an explosion. I was told by one uh, witness, uh, an Air Force enlisted, uh, senior enlisted man, that he was outside when it occurred. He said that he saw a helicopter circle the building. He said that it appeared to be a U.S. military helicopter and that it disappeared behind the building where the helicopter landing zone is. Excuse me. <clears throat> and that he then saw a fireball uh, go into the sky. Uh, I'm attempting to make my way around to that side of the building in my car right now uh, to see if I can get uh, a better uh, visual perspective on the scene on that side of the building. But I can tell you that security has certainly clamped down. The U.S. Park Police and other federal law enforcement uh, department has arrived in force on the scene. There's a Park Police helicopter overhead. Uh, every car that arrives at the gate uh, where I was located was being stopped by officers at gunpoint. Everyone is being forced out of their vehicles as they arrive at the Pentagon. It's a very tense situation, obviously, uh, but initial reports from witnesses indicate that uh, there was, in fact, a helicopter circling the building. Uh, contrary to uh, what the AP reported, according to the witnesses I've spoken to anyway, uh, and that this helicopter disappeared behind the building and that there was then an explosion. Uh, that's about all I have from here. Okay, l let's do this, Chris. Why don't you continue reporting, and we'll pass along a couple of other things that we're picking up along the way. Uh, trading at the New York Stock Exchange. The Stock Exchange, as many of you probably know, but some of you don't, is in that part of Lower Manhattan, not quite far as far down as the Trade Center, but it is in that part of Lower Manhattan, and trading has been suspended there. Bridges and tunnels coming into New York have been closed. Uh, that will create a whole different set of problems. We are also being told that the FAA has suspended takeoffs and landings. And I want to make sure I get this right, guys, that in all, uh, at all airports around the country, uh, so uh, air travel in this country has come to a halt this morning as clearly uh, people are trying, people in government, people, police forces, fire departments are trying to figure out what exactly is going on. Uh, there are several now incidents that look for all that we can tell to be a major terrorist attack here in the United States. So all airports all across the country are closed. All bridges and tunnels coming into Manhattan are closed. The Pentagon has been evacuated or is being evacuated. The White House is being evacuated. The president who is in Sarasota today uh, to make a speech on education has spoken briefly to cameras and is, uh, will shortly make his way back to Washington. They are checking out uh, Air Force One now. Let's go uh, to Atlanta. Chad Myers can talk to us a bit about the air traffic problems. Chad, are you there? Aaron, yes. Um, all of the airports across the country have been shut down. We started with Zone New York, which includes Islip, Newark, JFK, LaGuardia, all the way down to Philadelphia, and then IAH, Houston, and then San Francisco, and then LA. They were just falling like a deck of cards, and then all of a sudden the FAH just said, we're shutting down everything. All flights have been canceled and for another seven hours, which is about five o'clock Eastern time, and then we'll reignite there. We'll take a look what's going on after that. The 
probability of extension, as they call that, is high, which means even after 5 o'clock, the airports may still be shut down. We'll keep watching it for you here from Atlanta. Um, Chad, just, uh, and if you don't know, just say you don't know. Do you, can, can you recall a situation where every airport in the country had been shut down? Absolutely not, except in wartime, of course, uh, Aaron, and obviously this is uh, not that. But uh, with all the airports, that, as they were going down from west to east, we could see them, and then we could eventually see from New York, and then they canceled Boston as we got the report that the first flight, or one of the possible hijack flights, did come out of Boston, and then it just started going down from there. But never, ever before, have we ever seen all of the airports shut down like this, not this quickly. Chad, thank you. Stay on this for a while. We'll get back to you. We know that many people are uh, just joining us. We want to get everyone on the same page before we move on. So one more time, let's go through the sequence of events. At about 8.45 Eastern Time, a plane crashed into uh, the foremost of those towers that are the world the World Trade Center. Uh, that's uh, Air Force One you see in Florida, the president on board. Uh, obviously extraordinary security around the plane before the president got on, and the president is heading back to Washington. A short time ago, the president made a statement. He said, terrorism against our nation will not stand. The government will hunt down those responsible. Mr. Bush said today, we've had a national tragedy. Two planes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on the country. And we also have a report now that the, it was a plane that crashed into the Pentagon and we have a large fire at the Pentagon. The Pentagon is being evacuated as we speak now. The White House has been evacuated as well. CNN's John King joins us on the phone. John. Aaron, I'm standing in Lafayette Park directly across from the White House, perhaps about 200 yards from the White House residence itself. The Secret Service has pushed most people all the way back to the other side of the park, trying to avoid having that done to me at the moment. Just moments ago, they started slowly evacuating the White House about 30 minutes ago, and then in the last five minutes, people have come running out of the White House and the old executive office building, the built, which is the office building right directly across from the White House. About 10 minutes ago, there was a white jet circling overhead, now, you generally don't see planes in the area over the White House. That is restricted airspace. No reason to believe that this jet was there for any nefarious purposes, but the Secret Service was very concerned, pointing up at the jet in the sky. It is out of sight now, best we can tell, but they've evacuated the entire White House staff and the old executive office, as well as some townhouses that are government offices. Many of our viewers might know Blair House, where other international leaders stay when they are in Washington. That block of townhouses has been evacuated as well, and they are pushing us now back toward H Street, which is the next main street to the north from Pennsylvania Avenue across from the White House. Okay, John, hang on one second. We're also getting reports at the Capitol, the Treasury Building also being evacuated. John, is this evacuation from the White House, was it orderly? Did it seem panicky? How would you characterize it? It started off as orderly, much like we get when there are occasional bomb scares near the White House. but the Bursting into flames as it crashes into the World Trade Center within 20 minutes of the other Trade Center Tower having been attacked as well. Uh, once again, uh, the nation, as we speak, is under lockdown. Our armed forces are taking all necessary precautions to prevent another attack. Those include closing all United States airports as a result of this attack, as you see there, one that occurred about an hour ago, and an attack in the Pentagon as well. Uh, we are a nation in lock under lockdown, and once again, we are prepared for the worst, but we are prepared. John? All right. David Asman, thanks very much. I want to go to our Washington managing editor, Britt Hume, who has uh, the outlook from the nation's capital. Britt, this raises all kinds of questions about America's response, and I guess that a response is not going to be immediate, is it? Well, whether it is immediate or not, the one thing I think we are seeing, John, is this uh, series of evacuations from various uh, buildings around Washington. And I think it's important to say that we don't know and have no reason to believe that the White House, for example, was uh, facing any immediate or imminent threat. The same is true on Capitol Hill, where it appears they will be evacuating uh, the building up here soon. No, uh, nothing has happened at either of those places. Obviously, if you put your yourself in the position of officials with responsibility for any of these places, the safe move uh, in light of what we've seen is to evacuate places, just as the safe move was for the... Uh, uh, for the authorities to close the airports to keep uh, any new planes uh, out of the sky. So 
Uh, I think uh, we have a blend here of things that have really happened which are chilling in themselves and things that are happening out of precaution that may or may not denote any particular threat. So it's worth, uh, worth keeping all that in mind. As for whether there'll be any retaliatory action by the United States, obviously that's uh, days away and we're, you know, if not longer, we may, uh, it may be a long time before we know exactly how this was orchestrated, organized, by whom, and so on. Uh, this, of course, though, John, I think this is one of these days where we can say that things will not again be the same in the United States of America. This is the kind of terrorist attack that is the nightmare that uh, experts and others have warned about, uh, but some of us may have thought really could not happen on such a scale. This is quite remarkable. It is that. Uh, Britt Hume in Washington, thanks very much. And uh, I think when the investigation is all over, uh, we will find that this was perhaps somewhat easy to pull off, but uh, that is yet to come. Jim Angle is joining us now from Washington. Uh, Jim, what can you do? Um, the Federal Aviation Administration has actually gone even further than it did a few minutes ago. It, it was uh, forming all, asking all planes not to take off. Now the FAA has ordered all aircraft currently in the air over the United States to land at the nearest airport. Now you can imagine what may be happening or what they think might be happening in some part of the country that there is somebody else on some aircraft coming from somewhere or going somewhere <coughs> with evil in their with evil intentions and so all aircraft currently in the air over the United States have been ordered to land at the nearest airport. I think one of the hang on a sec, John, I just want to check one thing because um, one of the very first people the president talked to was the director of the FBI and Pierre Thomas who covers the Justice Department and the FBI for us has been here. Um, they may think they prepare for this kind of thing, Pierre, but man, it must have been a shock. Stunning shock. Uh, the FBI Special Operations Center is now in full alert. The FBI yeah. extremely concerned that there would be additional attacks. Normally when you have a situation like this, they immediately get on the line with the CIA, the various intelligence agencies, trying to get a sense of who might have been planning something. But right now, the first order of business is to protect against a second attack, third attack. The feeling is normally when you have this kind of situation, there will be more attacks almost immediately. Let's go to the Trade Tower again because, John, we now have a... What do we have? We don't... Wow. It looks like a, a new plume, a new large plume of smoke. Now, it may be that something fell off the building. It may be that something has fallen. We, we don't know, to be perfectly honest. But that is what you're looking at, is the current... That, that's the scene at this moment at the World Trade Center. Dan Daler from ABC's Good Morning America is down uh, in, in the general vicinity. Dan, can you tell us what has just happened? Yes, Peter. It's, it's Don Daler down here. I'm four blocks north of the World Trade Center. The second building that was hit by the plane has just completely collapsed. The entire building has just collapsed as if a demolition team set off. When you see the old demolitions of these old buildings, it's pulled it down on itself and it is not there anymore. That should be it. it Thanks has very much, Dan. Collapsed. The whole side has collapsed? The whole there? building has collapsed. Should come the I whole building, building has collapsed? The building has collapsed. That's the southern tower you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. The second building that we witnessed the airplane enter had been, the top half had been fully involved in flame. It just collapsed. There is panic on the streets. Thousands of people running up Church Street, which is what I'm looking out on, trying to get away. But the entire, at least as far as I can see, the top half of the building, at least half of it, I can't see below that, half of it just started with a gigantic rumble, folded in on itself, and collapsed in a huge plume of smoke and dust. We're talking about massive casualties here at the moment, and we have... Whew. That is extraordinary. There is panic on the streets. There are people screaming and running from the site. The gigantic plume of smoke has reached me, and I'm probably a quarter of a mile north of there. Peter. Now, this is a... This is what it looked like moments ago. My God. The southern tower. 
10 o'clock Eastern time this morning, just collapsing on itself. This is a place where thousands of people work. We have no idea what caused this. Um, if you wish to bring uh, anybody who's ever watched a building being demolished on purpose knows that if you're going to do this, you have to get at the, at the under infrastructure of a building and bring it down. Peter? Yes, Dan. Uh, what, what appeared to happen from my vantage point, the top part of the building was totally involved in fire, and there, was, it, there appeared to be no effort possible to put that fire out. It looked like the top part of the building was so weakened by the fire that it just the weight of it collapsed the rest of the building. That's what appeared to happen. I did not see anything happening at the base of the building. It all appeared to start at the top and then just collapse the rest of the building by the sheer weight of the top. There was no explosion or anything at the base part of it, but I, I did see that the top part of it started to, to collapse. The walls started to bulge out, bricks, glass things coming, that, coming out, and then it collapsed in on itself, and it appeared to just fold down from there, from the very top. Thanks, Don, very much. Um, just looking at that, I don't know why, but I'm, yeah. when was the last time the United States was attacked in this fashion? It was Pearl Harbor in 1941. Um, from the scene now, uh, there's obviously ma massive casualties. Uh, usually during these things, there's a, a little bit of a high pitch, but basic calm over the police radios uh, among the emergency workers. Um, I can hear them screaming, uh, signal 1013, uh, which is the police code for help, uh, calling for help at the triage center, where other people who are already injured have been injured more, um, confirming that the the building has collapsed, uh, dozens of officers, more civilians are injured, and we don't know, although I'd have to suggest, given the size of that building, what progress the evacuation was in um, of the tower that uh, collapsed. Peter. Yes, uh, Pierre, Pierre Thomas. Uh, one thing I might add is that in recent years, the U.S. government has been preparing for massive attacks, but it's been primarily focused on biological, often, often bombing attacks. One of the things I have not heard discussed at all in government circles is the notion that someone would hijack a plane and perhaps fly it into a building. So one of the questions that I'm sure that will come out of this, if this indeed is a terrorist attack, is what kind of defenses did the U.S. have in place to deal with an event like this? Well, we talked about that even, Pierre, just before you came and joined us, because at the Emergency Management Center, which is just literally in the same complex as the Trade Towers, uh, they talk at great length about their preparations for a biological, a chemical warfare attack, how they closed tunnel. I mean, they've been very efficient, taken it very seriously for many years. I'd be a little surprised if the notion of an airborne attack on a United States target had not been had not been discussed. But the notion of the intelligence services knowing absolutely nothing of what is going on today and saying openly right away they had no warnings whatsoever uh, is. And you say something very important. If this is a terrorist attack, we just keep saying that in a repeated basis. Um, not having any notion whatsoever of what's going on is to be reminded not only of the efficiency of terrorism but. Just a ride of the efficiency of terrorism. At it's, this point. Uh, it's ironic. There's a there's a chilling story. Uh, Lou Shalero of the FBI, um, who was part of the capture of Ramzi Youssef, who was the mastermind of the World last Trade. bombing of the World Trade Center, told me this story that he was flying over the World Trade Center in a helicopter with the suspect Ramzi Youssef next to him after he was captured in Pakistan. And as they passed over, Lou Shalero uh, nudged him and said to Ramzi Yosef, uh, you see, it's still standing. And Ramzi Yosef smiled and said to the FBI's assistant director, it wouldn't be if I'd had more money. Um, this was... In other words, more money to buy explosives, more money to run a more efficient operation than the one he ran from New Jersey in 93. Exactly. And I mean, we may have seen uh, the second coming of that plan. Uh, John McQuethy is on the phone at the Pentagon. Hold up, let me just, John McCarthy, we've now heard reports that three planes have been hijacked today. Can you confirm that? Jack McCarthy at the Pentagon. Okay, then let me go quickly to someone named Don Wright, who saw the plane crash into the Pentagon. Don, are you there in Washington? Yes, I am. Can you tell us what happened? Yes, it was about 9.35, and I was looking out our 12th floor windows at 1600 Wilson Boulevard in uh, Roslyn, Virginia, and I watched this, it looked like a commuter plane, two engine come down from the south, real low, 
uh, proceed right on and crash right into the uh, Pentagon. Went directly into the Pentagon? Uh, that is correct. Looked like a deliberate act? A deliberate act, sir. And can you tell me what direction it came from, Don? It came, it came from the south. Came from the south, up along the river, across the land? It came, it came from the south. Okay, and do you, do, did you happen to look at your watch? To, we thought it was just a little bit before 10 o'clock. Well, I was watching ABC News, watching the uh, Twin Tower, uh, and, about, and about the time I saw the plane, I watched it come in very low over the trees, and it just dipped down, came down right over 395, right into the Pentagon. And are you fairly sure that it was what we sometimes describe and recognize as a yes, small commuter plane? Uh, yes, it was. Good, Don. Thank you very much. Appreciate your help. You're Don Wright, an eyewitness to the crash at the Pentagon. Now, we have had, as I said, reports today. There are hundreds of reports flying around, and so we beg your indulgence on us saying as often as we do, these are reports. They're sometimes unconfirmed. They're sometimes confirmed. We'll try to make it absolutely clear what we absolutely know and what we're uncertain about. There are now reports around of three aircraft having been hijacked today. So we have at least, because we've now had eyewitnesses to three de apparently deliberate uh, aerial assaults involving the aircraft themselves, two on the Trade Towers in New York City and one on the Pentagon itself, just described by Don Wright as a small two-engine commuter plane which came up from the south. And we now believe that three planes were hijacked, two of them from Boston and one from somewhere else we are not yet sure. Uh, precisely what's happened. Um, John, you're listening. Uh, Just to uh, clarify for people, John, who's, uh, who's uh, our, one of our leading reporters on crime, uh, knows New York City probably better than anybody in, in many news divisions. Uh, I cannot tell you where that happens. That's either U.S. Uh, uh, Air Force or Navy aircraft, uh, fighter aircraft, uh, now on patrol in what we've described as the no-fly zone uh, over New York City today, lest there be one more attempt. John, go ahead. Uh, they've continued evacuations in the area now. They've are, they are evacuating Battery Park City, which is a large apartment complex uh, taking up many blocks across the street from the World Trade Center. And uh, they've evacuated the federal court buildings where the terrorism trials of Ramzi Youssef and others were held. Uh, anything that could be a symbolic target is now being emptied out in New York. New York is, is going into kind of a lockdown mode. I think you'll also see in Washington the same kind of air patrols have been uh, scrambled around uh, principal buildings there. Okay. We have on the phone one of those people who, who uh, makes his living analyzing terrorism. Um, Kyle Olson, do you hear me? Yes, I do. I, I, I wonder if on a day like this anybody wants to be thought of as an expert on terrorism. Um, be that as it may, and assuming that and knowing that much of the country is shocked at the uh, apparent breadth of this, are you? Well, you know, this is the, this is the, the kind of thing that, uh, that has fallen more into Tom Clancy novels than into, uh, into actual response planning. Um, having said that, we've been anticipating for a long time. We've wondered why it's been so relatively quiet. Uh, the, act, the suggestions of Osama bin Laden's involvement, what has he been doing since coal? Uh, other other groups out there with uh, with a, a real or imagined grudge against the United States. Uh, the nature of the event is shocking. The uh, the fact that it's happened is not. Thank you very much, Kyle. Really appreciate it, Kyle Olson. Yeah, one uh, one quick thing. Yeah, go ahead. One quick thing. The accus the suggestions that are floating around out there right now. There's apparently this claim from the uh, from the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine. Right. Um, very interesting to yes, know. If, if this is if this is legitimate, if this is, if this claim stands up, this appears to be okay. the first time this group has targeted Americans. This group has primarily steered away from the more extreme end of the of the violence scale. They focused less on suicide bombings, more on uh, more on on gun attacks and and that sort of thing in the territories against Israelis. Well, if, if it this is, holds it, up, this is a different this is a very different tactic. Well, point. if it is true, and of course the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine was very much involved in attacking aircraft in the 1970s. <laughs> which carried Americans. So certainly let's accept your notion that it is. The skies over Washington, D.C. We'll try to find out more about that explosion, but it was a low thud, and I'm now seeing that there is a great deal of activity over toward the direction of the Supreme Court. All right. Back to you, John. Britt Hume is with us. Britt? Uh, John, I'm looking now uh, on one of our remote uh, uh, cameras here at a picture of the scene at the Pentagon. This is a picture uh, looking down Interstate 395, which is 
you probably know, John, is a major thoroughfare in and out of Washington that is commuted, used for, by commuters every day in large numbers. And we're getting a sense that uh, from a reporter out there at the scene has just said that there's been another loud bang out there, whether that is an, a further explosion uh, initiated in an attack or whether it is simply a secondary uh, blast, the result of the continuing fire. But uh, the situation there at the Pentagon continues to evolve. We'll keep you posted. All right. Britt Hume in Washington. Thank you. Our Rick Leventhal is on the ground in lower Manhattan where these scenes of chaos and utter confusion are just mind-numbing. Rick, uh, go ahead. Rick is not able to hear me, but this is the scene in lower Manhattan right. where where the upper Again, floors of the World Trade Center, Center Tower 1 apparently have completely four collapsed. Five blocks from the World Trade Center. And, and we were standing here when, when there was some sort of collapse or explosion. And everyone started running in this direction. Police officers, pedestrians, EMTs, everybody came running this way. I saw a woman pushing a, a baby carriage, running for her life. And right behind them was a huge cloud a billowing smoke and ash and debris coming this way. Uh, the smoke is obviously cleared somewhat. Ma'am, she's with DCPI. Can you talk to us for just a second? Bring us up to speed. Obviously, people have their hands full out here. It's not easy getting anyone to talk. Yeah, tell me where you were. What happened? What did you okay. see? What did you hear? First, I went on Canal Street. I saw the fire. I saw the two buildings. I'm thinking it was, a, it was a bomb because it's two of them. Anyway, when I got there, I tried to save people because I'm a doctor. When I tried to say people, in the moment we heard a big explosion coming down. Everything just went black. Everything came down, glass are popping. People got hurt, stuff went on top of them. And it was a big explosion. Everything got dark, real dark, like snow. You can see behind me, oh, this is not snow. This is all from the building. It was a terrible nightmare. Where exactly were you standing when this happened? I was standing right in front of the World Trade Center. So you were down the block here? And right you came there, in the middle. Right, yeah. Everything Did you get hurt at all? No, not me. Did you see anyone around you getting caught up in it? Yeah, we was, I was with the firemen. We all we got hurt. We all went inside to this dark. We was inside the building where everything happened. But we came out alive. I Puertos de los Estados Unidos. Primera vez en la historia de los Estados Unidos que las autoridades cierran todos los aeropuertos. Si usted pensaba viajar en el día de hoy, ni siquiera vaya hacia el aeropuerto. Llame a su aerolínea con version of the jets which so many people in so many middle-sized American cities are now accustomed to seeing. In terms of the realm of terrorism, this is going to be a real uh, first test, uh, literally by fire, for the Bush administration. You recall, after the embassy bombings in East Africa, uh, the Clinton administration uh, waited about 10 days and launched a missile attack against the camps of Osama bin Laden, who they felt confident at that time they could say was responsible for it, and who's since been charged in it. Uh, in this case, I think this ratchets up. Uh, Excuse me. This is the Pentagon we're looking at now, according to my uh, according to my monitor. And again, it is hard to, to grasp what part of the building. We do not know if they're in the courtyard or outside, but you can see that a fairly considerable amount of damage has been done. We do not know whether these are offices or storage areas. The Pentagon is full of uh, many thousands of people. Uh, every day, the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, has been saying only yesterday and today that he wants to reduce the, uh, the bloatedness, as he put it, uh, as he alluded to it in the military and the bureaucracy. But this is the great home of the, of the military bureaucratic establishment. Um, John, before I come back, I can issue that some of the hospitals in New York are already at capacity, not accepting any new patients. There could be tens of thousands of injuries. Let's listen in to what uh, Rick Leventhal is learning down in Lower Manhattan. We're lying down, and then I looked up and I saw the and I saw this huge plume of smoke and the tower just crumbling, and it and it just turned into a huge plume of smoke. And next thing you know, there's smoke in one tower, and that's what we're seeing right here. So, and obviously there's plenty, uh, the people are worried about the, the press agents and everybody else that went the other way is so everybody wants to look this way. When you saw this collapse taking place, could you see if there were a lot of people on the ground near the building as it no, was happening? No, I was, I was further north than you were, but I was dead looking at 6th Avenue. The view you see of both towers as you right. come down 6th Avenue. Right. So, and right. most of this fallout stops about four blocks back. Give me a look down this way, Pat. Uh, you know, it does sort of look like beyond a few blocks down, it, it looks almost clear. But it's anything but. 
over here. I live in the 25 Lone Street, a couple of blocks from here. I'm all the time I hang out in the corner on the liquor store this morning. I saw the plane coming this way in the spot. It was factory directly to the building. Was this the was first plane or the second plane? This was the first plane. The second plane, this no second plane. It was a bomb. Bomb in the building, not second plane. That was a bomb. Right. Who said the second plane? That's what we're told, the second plane. No, we saw it on television. I saw everything. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Check it. Uh, this is. In case you're just joining us, uh, this is the aftermath of a horrific event that began unfolding about an hour and 20 minutes ago. A jet plane slammed into the side of uh, Tower 2 of the World Trade Center. Then a few minutes later, another jet slammed into Tower 1. The second ta Tower 1, I should say, the upper floors have collapsed. They're absolutely gone. I was in the restroom. There was a, a, a big shaking. Some of the ceilings collapsed. Looks like there was a fire in the elevator shafts. And um, uh, just they, they brought everyone down and started bringing everybody down the stairs. So you came down from the 77th floor? 77th floor, down you the came stairs. down the stairs? Yes. What, what was happening around you? Was people screaming? No, or? no, people were pretty calm. <clears throat> when we got down to sixth floor, there was like another shake or another explosion. Everyone started panicking, but everybody was really calm, and the police and firemen were very helpful. Which of the two towers were you in? One, we're Trade Center One. All right. And when you got to the ground, then what? Uh, it's just like it's like rubble and dust, like inches thick, and like paper, <clears throat> paper, <clears throat> paper everywhere, and they just moved us out. How many people do you think were in the building on the floors that were affected? What I, do you I think? Say, I mean, I'm one fl one office out of 20 on that floor, so I have no idea. How how far above you or below you was the uh, impact? I think it was up us above us. I don't know how many floors. We saw it on TV, uh, but I don't know. I don't know. What's the first thing you thought when you heard it? Had to had to call my wife. Did you? Were yes. you able to? Yeah, I, I got through a phone line. I called her. I'm talking to you because I'm hoping she's watching, so she knows I'm okay. What's your name? My name is Matthew right. Gard. Folks, clearly America is under attack. We can only hope that it's over, at least for now. Our David Schuster is in Washington where there has been collapsed on itself um, uh, not long ago. All of the federal office buildings in Washington have now been evacuated. All federal buildings in Washington have now been evacuated. All aircraft in the skies over the United States have been ordered to land at the nearest airport. Uh, all aircraft on the ground intending to go anywhere have been ordered not to take off uh, because the country, this is the Pentagon, because we've just seen a moment ago that at least one portion of one side or building at the Pentagon itself uh, has actually uh, collapsed. <clears throat> and as we warned you, the whole business of responsibility, claiming of and naming responsibility would be complicated. And now we've, uh, from, from the Middle East, a senior official from the, from the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine has denied any uh, involvement, any connection to a double plane crash on the World Trade Center. It was, in fact, earlier on an anonymous caller who had called Abu Dhabi Television <coughs> to say that the, uh, the DFLP was responsible. So for today, we'll put uh, aside as best we can the uh, trying to understand who did it, just knowing uh, somebody who did it. Now, uh, one of the planes that crashed into the World Trade Center was, uh, as, we, as we said some while ago, American Airlines Flight 11 from Boston, Boston to Los Angeles. Um, that has now been confirmed by the airline itself, um, or at least by their spokesperson, Lori Bassani. Um, it was a Boeing 767. It would, under normal circumstances, if it were full, carry about 160 passengers including two pilots, nine or ten crew, but we have no idea yet whether or not the plane was heavily loaded or not. Peter, uh, big concern now from the scene that the Northwest mm -hmm. Tower, the one remaining standing, is, is leaning low. and uh, buckling in the, uh, in the Northwest corner. Um, they're moving back the mobilization areas and they're cordoning off the area in a much wider zone now because obviously they are now concerned about the possibility mm -hmm. of a second collapse. I'm still desperately confused, John, about what may have caused the building to, to collapse. Um, 
As you watch the videotape, it appeared to buckle from the middle, from the point of impact and, um, and collapse, which uh, not, you know, with no background in architecture, I don't know about the structural vulnerability, but as you, as you see, debris starts to, to fall, away. then it cracks, and then it just goes straight down. And now uh, they say that the, the other tower is leaning. Um, if you look at some of the pictures, it appears to be on a slight angle uh, to the right. Yeah, they, uh, they say the fire is also spreading downward now through the tower. And I, I think there's a real decision to make there. I have not been able to, to hear whether they're keeping people in there to fight that fire or they're just leaving it empty to let the fire burn itself out because they're going to have a real problem with people in there if it's in jeopardy. At the same time, uh, New York firefighters have a reputation of staying until the very end. And if there are civilians in that building which need to be rescued, and clearly there are, then there's no way the emergency services, I can imagine, are going to, to uh, pull out at this point. Tom, and if the elevators are disabled uh, from that height, there's no fast way out. There are no more attacks coming. You, you just don't know. Um, now, to the more... He's got it in. Uh, to the... Um, markets the effect on the markets because we are after all a financial station and we don't in any way mean to downplay the the human the human aspect of this we our first and foremost concern is for all of the people. Mark, very quickly, uh, we're just getting word from the Associated Press that a car bomb has exploded outside the State Department. That is according to senior law enforcement officials. Uh, okay, well, I am sure that we have a crew on the way there, but that is just in from uh, the Associated Press. A car bomb has exploded outside the State Department in Washington. All right, there again, yet more evidence that it's, it's not... We, we will uh, we'll try and uh, make that connection again uh, in two cities now, and there are a lot of pieces of information floating around. We need to, uh, to try and button up some of this. Uh, we had a report earlier that we now, uh, uh, we believe we could tell you is not correct, that there was an explosion at the Capitol. Uh, there was none as we, we now believe. There was no explosion at the Capitol. There in Los Angeles. There were 90 passengers and crew on board. Um, and there was a second plane. Help me understand this not. So we believe that the two aircraft have flown into the trade towers. Both belonged to American Airlines. And they had both been hijacked. And there were 90 passengers and crew on the first plane and 60 passengers and crew on the second plane. That is the, if there's any doubt about that, someone please contradict me. But that is the report I am getting from our people who cover the Federal Aviation Administration and air travel in general, that there were two aircraft hijacked for this attack on the twin trade towers, now the single trade tower in New York City. And on the first, there were both flights to the west coast from Boston. And the first one had 90 people and a crew on board, and the second, had 60 passengers and crew on board. I beg your pardon. The second plane was not hijacked from Boston, but from American, from Dallas Airport, we're being told, which of course is outside Washington. And we do not know if that was the, let me just, I'm gonna make this absolutely clear because this reporting is muggy. We've, we've now reports of two planes from American Airlines, one from Boston, Flight 11 to Los Angeles, which we believe is one of the aircraft that went to the trade towers. We have a second plane, American Airlines Dulles to Los Angeles, with 60 passengers and crew. Coming off of the front tower and then a bit from the back, as you see, again, the crews working their way towards the, towards the tower themselves. It was 1993. Uh, that I suspect many of these same firefighters converged on these very same towers uh, after the bombing in the in the garage level. Uh, help me with this, but I'm pretty sure it was in the garage, in the garage when a level. right when a rider truck uh, came in and blew up in the garage. I'm not sure it was a rider truck, but a truck came in and uh, blew up in the garage, and that was in 1993. Senator, we heard a big bang, and then we saw smoke coming out, and everybody started running out, and we.
we saw the plane on the other side of the building and there was smoke everywhere and people are jumping out the windows over there they're jumping out the windows i guess because they're trying to see themselves i don't know and, and i don't know everybody just doesn't know where to go they won't let everything is blocked off you can't even they're telling us to get out but there's nowhere to go and then i heard that another plane hit and if you go over by there you can see the people jumping out the window they're jumping out the window right now oh my god all right ma'am thank you that is one of the witnesses to this extraordinary, these extraordinary events this morning here in New York. Um, again, uh, and I know that for many of you, you've heard this a lot, but I, I, I think it's important as people join us as they do in moments like this, they are coming in all the time, that there have been attacks in two American cities, New York and in Washington. The trade centers here in New York have been hit by airplanes. In Washington, there, has, there is a large fire at the Pentagon. The Pentagon has been evacuated. And there, as you can see, perhaps the second tower, the front tower, the top portion of which is collapsing. Good Lord. There are no words. You can see large pieces of the building falling. You can see the smoke rising. You can see a portion of the, the, the side of the building now just being covered on the right side as I look at it, covered in smoke. This is just a horrific scene and a horrific moment. The president who is in Florida today is en route back to the White House. He took off a short time ago. The White House itself has been evacuated on the basis of what the Secret Service says was a credible threat on the mansion itself. We believe now that we can say that both, that portions of both towers of the World Trade Center have collapsed. Whether there were second explosions, that is to say explosions other than the planes hitting them that caused this to happen, we cannot tell you. Rose Arce, one of our CNN producers, is on the phone. Rose, what yes. do you got? I'm about a block away, and there were several people that were hanging out the windows right below where the plane crashed, when suddenly you saw the top of the building start to shake, and people began leaping from the windows in the north side of the building. You saw two people at first plummet, and then a third one, and then the entire top of the building just blew up, and splinters of debris are falling on the street. Where I'm right now, there's a thick plume of smoke, and you can see crowds of people, including emergency service workers and police officers, running from the scene screaming and, and there's a there's a school nearby where there were kids in the schoolyard that has been emptied out and they're running up the street now too the, the whole sort of the neighborhood i'd say several blocks up is covered by this almost powdery smoke little tiny pieces of building you can see just floating in the in the wind around it it's almost as if like a huge cloud had had kind of enveloped that part of lower manhattan uh, it is just one of those awful moments that you need to look at for a minute or two to absorb exactly what has happened. Two of the most recognizable buildings in the city of New York have been attacked, and both of them appear to have collapsed, at least in part. The second of the two collapses taking place just a moment or so ago, perhaps two or three minutes ago. There are also apparently coordinated attacks that have taken place in Washington on the Pentagon. The State Department has been evacuated. Just a few moments ago, as we said, and perhaps 20 minutes after the first tower collapsed, we turned around and saw what looked like sparks falling and then a, the top part of tower number one collapsing. These are shots from the ground of that scene. There have been a frantic efforts to get people out of the tower. Now this was, again, this is tape, and you can see now whether that was an explosion or exactly what happened that caused that second tower to collapse. We cannot tell you. CNN's Kelly Wallace is on the phone with us. Kelly, where are you? What can you tell us? 
Aaron, I'm just about four blocks north of uh, the location of where the World Trade Center was standing. I was actually en route to the command center, uh, people really staring in disbelief. And then as you saw, of course, the pictures watching that tower come down, people just couldn't believe their eyes. Police then pushing people immediately, people turning around and starting running ways, blocks away from, from the site. There is black smoke and smoke is covering the air. You see people covering their mouths with some handkerchiefs and their coats and basically, uh, you know, it's an unbelievable scene. Most of the people have gone. The police are really pushing people away. There were a lot of people as I was making my way down here, Aaron. People, people are literally running through the streets. They are running from uh, Center Street in Lower Manhattan trying to get away from the smoke, which is absolutely uh, choking. It is difficult to breathe. There are people in front of me wearing gas masks. The cell phone service is virtually non-existent. There are lines of people to use the few pay phones that are available, and uh, people are literally hysterical there in the streets, worried about loved ones who were in these two buildings. Moments before the building collapsed, I was outside, and uh, after the first collapse, the authorities began to move people away from the perimeter. They feared that the second building would collapse. They warned people of that, and they began to push people away, including reporters, including myself. And uh, right now, there is nothing here but uh, shock on the streets of Lower Manhattan. John? All right, David Lee, stay safe. Uh, we are looking now at pictures, this of uh, the second of the two World Trade Center towers collapsing after that uh, awful, awful event. Let's, let's just recap what's happened so far today. Two planes, one of them at least, apparently hijacked an American Airlines plane, slammed into the side of the World Trade Center a little before 9 a.m. Uh, then, as we watch now this picture, a second plane slammed into the second tower of the World Trade Center. That tower collapsed first. It burned for a while and then collapsed. And you can see these pictures as that tower collapses. Um, not long ago, the second of the two towers collapsed. Now again, there are perhaps 50,000 people who work in these buildings on any given day. Not all of them would have been at work yet, uh, but, uh, but clearly um, a great and, and monumental loss of life. Also in Washington, the Pentagon has been under attack, at least one plane slammed into the Pentagon. David Schuster is an eyewitness to that and, uh, and is joining us now. David? John, the Pentagon is now uh, being evacuated. You may be able to hear some of the sirens that are going off in the Pentagon. There's smoke billowing down the hallway. Eyewitnesses describe a, a U.S. Air 737 plane uh, on what seemed to be headed towards National Airport at approximately 940 this morning when it then crashed into the south end of the Pentagon. The eyewitnesses describe a huge ball of fire, the plane apparently hitting by the helipad, which is near uh, Highway 110 and Highway 395, the main arteries into the city. Uh, there have been unconfirmed reports of second explosions here at the Pentagon. We have not confirmed that. But again, the uh, counterintelligence sources confirming that it was a commercial aircraft apparently hijacked that uh, crashed into the Pentagon. The building has been evacuated. There are uh, reports of, uh, of, of safety precautions being taken at the Central Intelligence Agency, at the National Security Agency. Capitol Hill has been evacuated. The White House has been evacuated. But here at the Pentagon, uh, I was actually uh, on in a taxi cab on Highway 110 when suddenly smoke started billowing out of the Pentagon. Very quickly, you heard ambulances and fire trucks headed that direction. Chris Wright, our producer at the Pentagon, who was on uh, the sort of the northern side of the Pentagon, says he could not hear the explosion or, or, or feel any aftershocks or anything. Obviously, the Pentagon, a very large building, meant to withstand uh, terrorist attacks or any sort of other attack. But again, eyewitnesses describing a U.S. Air 737 crashing into the Pentagon at approximately 940 this morning. The Pentagon, except for, uh, a, for some personnel, the Pentagon being evacuated and we can actually smell some of the smoke now in, in the hallways uh, here on the north side. John. David Schuster in Washington, thank you. Britt Hume is with us once again, our managing editor in Washington. Um, Britt, uh, chaos and pandemonium, but uh, how, how do we, how do we uh, measure the response here? Well, John, one thing worth noting is that you're going to hear all kinds of further warnings at a time like this and, and, uh, and precautions being taken. We've just learned, for example, that 
uh, police have been sent to Union Station. A bomb squad has been sent to Union Station, which, as you know, John, is located just a couple of blocks from the Capitol. In fact, it's uh, just adjacent to our Fox News uh, Bureau here in Washington. Um, one senses that there will be many uh, squads and many alerts and many more than there will be uh, things found, but nobody's taken any chances in this town at this hour after the astonishing events that have unfolded so far here today. And, of course, you've been seeing the pictures and hearing the reports from down there at the Pentagon. Who would have imagined such a thing? Um, it appears that the damage to the Pentagon is bad as it was. We don't have any sense of the, uh, whether there was loss of life or, or how extensive it was. It, that is an attack that looks like it could have been very much worse indeed had the airplane hit in a more central area of that, uh, of that building. So we're now watching, of course, the Capitol building with considerable urgency. It's uh, right out the window of our, of our bureau here. Uh, because, as Brian Wilson reported, police on Capitol Hill are evacuating the place, saying that there was aerpl an airplane 20 minutes away, apparently, or they be had reason to believe that it was headed this way. Now, we know their jets have been scrambled and have been in the air. It is hard to know whether a plane would ever be allowed to get close to Washington, D.C. in the air with all the uh, airports closed at the moment or not. But uh, that, obviously, is something we're watching with considerable uh, interest and worry here. All right. Uh, Britt, I just want to update you. While you've been talking, authorities at the Somerset County Airport confirm a large plane crash about 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. We're trying to deal with only facts today and not rumors because there are plenty of those swirling around, but we do have a confirmation of apparently another plane crash about 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. You've got to assume that it's related to all of these goings on, but uh, we don't know any more information than that. Rick Leventhal, we are glad uh, to know, is still with us uh, in Lower Manhattan. Rick? Yeah, John, um, we, just, we, we basically ran about five blocks down Church Street uh, north, away from the World Trade Center, uh, as that second tower was collapsing. Uh, a similar scene to the first one, where huge clouds of smoke began, began billowing down the street at us. Uh, and in fact, because of the location of the tower, it actually came down cross streets. So as we were running north on church, we were passing cross streets, and the, the black clouds of debris and smoke were, were coming towards us down the side streets as well. So we were about five blocks, uh, we were about Got five, that. six blocks north of where we were before. Things have settled down a bit now. The, the, the smoke is starting to clear. Um, we've seen more injured coming our way, and there's a lot of uh, police activity on the street. Um, but a similar scene to what we saw earlier as the first tower collapsed, uh, only this time uh, people were ready for it or more ready for it and uh, reacted swiftly. John? All right, uh, Rick Leventhal, thanks very much. Again, there is so much going on. It's difficult to update you, but... You're looking at the cloud of dust, debris, smoke, and probably uh, crumbled concrete over lower Manhattan. The twin towers of the World Trade Center are essentially gone, 110 stories each, more or less. They are gone now. All of this taking place within the last two hours after they were struck um, by uh, two airplanes. American Airlines is now confirming that its Flight 11 from Boston to Los Angeles was hijacked, and apparently one of that, uh, that plane was one of the two uh, that slammed into one of the World Trade Center towers. Uh, we don't know anything more about the loss of life, but it is going to be considerable. David Schuster is with us now, again, uh, not far from the Pentagon. David? Well, John, I'm actually inside the Pentagon in our office at the Outer Ring, and again, we can confirm for you that intelligence sources are telling us that it was a U.S. Air 737 uh, that crashed into the south end of the Pentagon at approximately 940 this morning. The Pentagon has been evacuated, but we do want to point out that at parts of the Pentagon, key personnel are still here, including the National uh, Military Command Center. This is in the basement of the Pentagon, and uh, sort of a bunker type of a facility that uh, is essentially designed to withstand direct uh, attacks on the Pentagon. And uh, we're told that officials there uh, are still in that particular part of the Pentagon are coordinating any possible U.S. response as well as trying to gather intelligence information, counterintelligence information, and essentially act as a clearinghouse from all the various intelligence agencies in Washington. Uh, there have been reports of uh, cautions, precautions being taken at the Central Intelligence Agency in McLean, Virginia, at the National Security Agency. But again, here at the Pentagon,
Pentagon, while most of the Pentagon and its uh, 23,000 employees have been evacuated, the National Military Command Center at the base of the Pentagon is still here. Uh, you can actually smell the smoke now in uh, virtually all of the hallways at the Pentagon uh, and uh, fire trucks and sirens going off on the south side. But where we are on the northern side of the Pentagon in one of the outer rings, uh, my producer Chris Wright says he could not feel any of the aftershocks of the Pentag of the explosion. There was no uh, uh, noise when the uh, uh, plane apparently crashed this morning at 9.40. Um, but again, uh, most of the Pentagon has been cleared out to smoke uh, pretty thick here in the halls. Um, but uh, some officials, of course, still at the Pentagon in the offices that are designed uh, for some of these uh, very uh, scenarios. John? All right, David Schuster at the Pentagon. Thanks very much. Uh, it appears, and we had the report from our Brian Wilson in Washington not too long ago, it appears Brian told us that, the, uh, that there was a report of a hijacked plane south of Washington, D.C. and headed toward the nation's capital. Now, it appears that that is the flight that went down about 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. We told you that there was a confirmation from the Somerset uh, County Airport. Uh, authorities are saying that uh, that may be the plane that Brian Wilson spoke of. Um, let's take you back again to New York and an absolutely horrific scene in lower Manhattan, the entire lower end of the island covered in smoke and, f and floating debris. And what's missing? The twin towers of the World Trade Center, 110 stories high. You are looking at the pictures uh, from, oh, the last half hour or so as the first tower simply collapsed on itself. This, and look at the debris raining down on other buildings. Imagine the horror. Uh, now, here comes the second tower. This is the one that had the TV antenna on top simply imploding on itself. 110 stories, the uh, workplace of some 50,000 people. America, the uh, loss of life here is going to be tremendous. Molly Falconer is at one of the New York area hospitals. Uh, Molly, it's got to be a scene of absolute chaos there. Uh, John, this is an area under siege. Uh, the police have blocked off a block radius around one of the main hospitals here in New York, and paramedics are coming out onto the street asking people in the crowd to give blood. I'm sorry, the phone lines are going in and out, but they're asking people in the crowd to give blood to the people who are coming into this hospital. There are stretchers out on the streets on dollies draped in white sheets waiting for the injured to come in. I've seen ambulance after ambulance ferrying people into this hospital. It is a scene of utter chaos. The police have locked down this block. They're trying to keep people away, but people are standing at the barricade trying to find out who's inside this hospital. Uh, as far as we know, most of the burn victims are going up to Cornell Hospital. Some are going to Bellevue, but the majority are going here to St. Vincent's Hospital because they have a trauma one level center here that is to take care of the worst of the victims who are coming in. Silence uh, just keep going the last and the calls are just getting heavier. Most of the people here can also see the World Trade Center, both of the towers. We heard the crowds watch them come down. People are in tears. They shouted watching the second tower come down, and now all we can see is way downtown billows of black and gray smoke while the sirens here just keep coming into the hospital. John, we'll keep you up to date. All right, Molly Falconer, thanks very much. And that is perhaps something that you can do if you are watching our coverage anywhere in America. Donating blood is going to be um, a very urgent today. Uh, the New York area hospitals are going to be swamped, and, and New York City itself may not be the place to try to do it. But anywhere in America, if you can donate blood, I think it will be helpful. Now, uh, we are once again trying to uh, find out exactly what happened in western Pennsylvania, where a plane went down, a large plane went down just north of the airport, the Somerset County Airport, about 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. These live pictures on your screen now show you the the scene in Lower Manhattan where the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center essentially are gone. We have uh, with us on the phone uh, another former Secretary of Defense, Casper Weinberger. Uh, Mr. Weinberger, it's, it's good of you to join us. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. How, how should, you know how Washington works. What should be happening right now? Well, what? I think probably what is happening, that is the city is virtually shutting down. You see police and little knots in all the corners and uh, all the police cars are out of the uh, police uh, stations 
and uh, every available fire engine is uh, moving toward the Pentagon, and I suppose there are going to be other targets where they'll have to uh, have to go to too. These rumors are floating all over the place, and it's uh, it's generally a real siege situation. It's uh, it's very much as if the whole city were under under attack, whereas probably it's a, it's the two or three principal targets. But uh, uh, the cumulative effect is that of a, of a city under siege. Have you ever planned for this kind of an attack in, well, in your experience at the Pentagon? The uh, the attempt is, is to plan for everything, and there were always uh, uh, various discussions of uh, uh, what form an attack could take. Uh, most likely one was, uh, was a, a suicide uh, car bomb uh, or a bus or some uh, heavy vehicle uh, being driven up to the uh, Pentagon, as happened in Beirut and in various other places. Uh, I think an aerial attack was considered uh, uh, not not one of the things you you, you heavily planned against. Uh, on the other hand, the the uh, city is ringed with uh, Air Force uh, bases and Navy bases, and uh, the uh, ability to get the defensive planes in the air is is very very high. And at the same time, you you would do what what is being done, and that is closing off the entire airspace so that you in in effect the whole Washington area is a no fly zone. So that any planes that are, can't identify themselves that get into that uh, are uh, to be shot down, and uh, those are the orders. That, 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 that was basically the response that was always uh, contemplated, but all, uh, nothing on this scale was ever contemplated. You know that there are going to be cries for revenge for a response. Oh, Can America course. respond immediately, and if so, how? Well, the the response has to be a response that is targeted at the people who did it. Uh, but there will undoubtedly be cries for revenge, and it's the slightest uh, uh, confirmation of uh, who did it or where it came from. Uh, there, the, these will be pursued. The, the, the loss of life has to be absolutely staggering because the, the two twin towers at the Trade Center, uh, there was not time to get them uh, evacuated, and uh, they're both down, and uh, the opportunities... Are, are tremendous now. Of course, they've evacuated the principal targets, the White House and the Capitol building, and and uh, various other points in the in the city. But uh, uh, certainly, there'd be calls for revenge, and and it's important that we that we identify the people who did it, and and that they be destroyed as quickly as possible. And that that's a proper response. All right. Secretary uh, Casper Weinberger, former Secretary of Defense, thanks very much for being with us. Just this word, one of our producers in Afghanistan has spoken with the Taliban, the titular government of Pakistan, of Afghanistan, I should say. The Taliban denies any responsibility. Now, that is not to say that the Taliban speaks for Osama bin Laden, but the Taliban, the government or would-be government, not recognized yet by the United States, as the government of Afghanistan is denying any complicity or any responsibility for these attacks. Well, clearly, uh, some terrorist experts that I've spoken to this morning say this has the signature of Osama bin Laden, that he has had uh, pilots, uh, although these apparently may be at least two hijackings, but he has had pilots on his payroll, three of the uh, of, of alleged conspirators who were involved in the East African bombing trial here in New York uh, had pilot's licenses. Not to say that that's what happened here, uh, but they seem to indicate that this would have that signature. And, John, I'm hearing of a figure of 10,000 uh, here in New York City, perhaps, for, uh, for casualties on the World Trade Center. And it could go higher than that. Britt Hume, our managing editor, is in Washington, D.C. Britt, what are you hearing there? Well, you're seeing, John, that uh, live picture from our station, WTTG, of the, of the smoke and uh, dust still uh, coming from the Pentagon. And what we now understand is the case is in the place where that plane hit, uh, we believe it now to have been a 737 commercial flight coming in. Uh, the walls of the build, the wall of the building, the outer wall of the building, and of course that building, as you know, is a series of concentric rings. So that uh, when you hit uh, the outer wall of the building, you're only affecting really that part of it. But that those walls are down, and you can see uh, the gutted areas inside, damage in that part, particular part of that very large building very extensive indeed. In, in addition, there was an earlier broadcast report here in Washington that there had been a car bomb outside the State Department. Uh, Terry Schultz, our reporter at the State Department, has talked to senior officials who say that that is not true. The State Department has, however, been evacuated, as has the Justice Department, uh, national monuments, and all other major public buildings in Washington in terms of absolutely non-essential personnel. So you see something approaching now here in Washington, the kind of lockdown that we have now already seen in New York. The, the, the worry for officials 
rules, obviously, is that while the airplanes have done the great damage so far, they can have no guarantee that that will be the only kind of attack that will be launched. So they have to take seriously uh, any warning, any suspicious package, anything else that they hear that might indicate a further attack of a different kind. All right, Britt Hume in Washington, thanks very much. We have a report that the plane that went down in, uh, the, uh, in western Pennsylvania is a uh, 767. That's, of course, a wide-bodied plane capable of carrying upwards of 350 people. Uh, so there is, uh, uh, an, there is a significant amount to the possibility of a significant amount of loss of life. However, it should be pointed out, uh, we are hearing reports that that crash near Pittsburgh may not be related to all of this. As you can imagine, the air traffic control system is, is overloaded, to say the least, at this point. Uh, nationwide, there is a lockdown on, on flights. No new flights have been allowed to take off nationwide for the last two hours. It is an air traffic controller's nightmare to, to keep those planes not only on the, on the ground, but also to get on the ground those planes that had been in the air. And again, you are looking at the pictures of lower Manhattan where the World Trade Center is gone. The Twin Towers slammed into today in a coordinated attack by jetliners. We're seeing one of them here on taped replay. This happened about 10 minutes after 9. A jetliner slamming into the World Trade Center after an earlier jetliner, apparently hijacked by Amer from American Airlines. Um, here is the, uh, the, the, the first of those towers coming down. This is the one that was actually hit by the second plane. It was hit lower. There was more weight on those steel girders that had been damaged. And here comes the second tower, the tower with the uh, signature television antenna on top, both of them simply imploding in on themselves. Our Shepard Smith has a view of uh, much of what's going on. He is on a rooftop in Manhattan. Shepard, what can you tell us? Shep Shepard Smith is with us. Shepard, we are uh, on 47th Street, high above the Fox News headquarters. 47th Street between 7th Avenue or Broadway and 6th Avenue on a spectacular day in Manhattan. And right over my right shoulder is the spot where the World Trade Center stood just a couple of hours ago. Uh, our engineer, Peter Blangerforti, was standing here on top of this building, uh, arranging to have this live broadcast set up when the World Trade Center just, just started to collapse. Uh, Peter, which side went first? Uh, the east side went first, the one closest to the Verizon building side, and that went about a little over a half hour ago, and the second one followed about 15 minutes later. Uh, what, what was going through your mind? Just all the people. It's all the people. It was just, it was un unreal. One of our staff with uh, personnel at the Norfolk Naval Base. Again, that is the largest naval base anywhere on the East Coast, if you will. It would be the Pearl Harbor of the East Coast of the United States. They're on situation uh, Sitcon Charlie, which is the third highest level uh, of uh, status for uh, terrorist attack. I can't help but believe it's probably gone even higher since that time. You know, we have to give you, things are hitting so fast. Uh, our news department has said there was no car bomb at the State Department, which we reported earlier, but they said it was a U.S. Air 737 at the Pentagon. That's, that, that, that would have collapsed part well, of the Pentagon, and th there are the pictures right now, uh, Lee. And uh, you talked about uh, Washington National Airport. U.S. Air is probably the largest airline at National Airport. Yeah, but, but look at the Pentagon. And, I mean, you see where, it, where it, it hit. They said it was a 737 that went into that. And again, we don't know the passengers, whether these were empty right. airplanes or what, what was on board. Uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan said we had nothing to do with it. Uh, so th th they're the first to deny responsibility. Uh, usually the crazies will try to, you know, gain uh, uh, responsibility so that they can get more money. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we intend to bring five minutes every hour from 12 noon on on various Christian networks. And uh, if you're watching some of the Christian networks, we'll be having that. And uh, we will be uh, with having a full report on Fox Family Channel at 11 p.m. tonight when we come back on that. We don't have any other network opportunities at this moment, but uh, uh, we brought you the best we can. This is the most tragic terrorist attack on the heartland of America that has ever happened in our history. 
We don't have an extent of all the casualties, but the property damage is uh, in the un undoubtedly hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, possibly billions. There again, lower Manhattan engulfed in smoke as those huge buildings are, are uh, both of the World Trade Towers have collapsed. You have an update there? Well, no, uh, but we're just, uh, we want to remind our viewers that uh, every hour for five minutes, we will be providing uh, coverage of this event from our perspective uh, on Family Net, uh, Christian Television Network, uh, which is Sky Angel, WACX Television in Orlando, Florida, World Harvest Television, as well as Cornerstone. Uh, I, I want to say again that the Lord doesn't do anything without warning his servants. And he warned me, told me, I knew it was going to happen. I told our staff and I told our audience before this happened. But uh, it's only the beginning because I think the radical uh, Islamic fundamentalists are going to take the lead and unwilling so-called moderates are going to be sucked along with them. And so you'll soon have uh, Egypt and Syria and, of course, Iraq and Iran are not, not anything but moderate, but they may well bring in people in Saudi Arabia and the Emirates and that whole uh, Gulf region with the billions and billions of dollars worth of oil. This world could be taken and, and plunged into chaos right now. Israel is going to have to protect itself and move more forcefully into the West Bank territory. When that happens, it's going to be a trigger for even worse things. We could expect biological warfare. We could expect chemical warfare. And uh, uh, this type of thing with the hijacking of civilian airlines was something that uh, no, nobody could fully have understood. Father, in Jesus' name, again, send revival to America and give us wisdom in these troubled days. In Jesus' name, amen. The preceding 90 minutes of programming were presented by CBN. Why is life so hard? Finding the right man takes forever. Finding the right shoes takes longer. At least getting HBO is fast. Just go to HBO.com and click on the HBO Express button. If you have cable, you can subscribe online. It's They'll come by their window. The entire Pentagon has been evacuated. More time after this attack, uh, there were urgent announcements made over the loudspeaker telling people uh, to quickly get away from the building because they had reports of a second plane heading this way just two minutes away. Um, F-16 jets were scrambled over the Pentagon. I saw several of them go by. Uh, but no second plane ever materialized, and uh, the building remained completely evacuated as firefighters continue to pour uh, columns of water on the uh, devastated side of the Pentagon, and rescue personnel continue to whisk victims away. We have no uh, report at this time of how many casualties. Clearly, uh, dozens and dozens of people have been hurt, and we presume that there have been some deaths as well. It's hard to imagine otherwise, considering extent damage at the side of the building and I can see just some of the windows uh, side of a stretch of the building perhaps about perhaps uh, 40 or 50 America, not just in some shadowy enclave in Afghanistan or somewhere in the Saab continent, but they've taken root in this country because it's so easy to get here. Let's talk a little bit more about Osama bin Laden because, as you say, he was associated with the 1993 uh, World Trade Center bombing. Um, why don't we talk about him? Good morning. I'm Jerry Brooks. September 11, 2001, a day unlike any other America has seen since the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Every 15 minutes, we will bring you news of local interest regarding the catastrophic events of the day. We will start with airports across the country, as you know not by now, have been closed. International flights have been diverted to Canada. In New Haven, police are at Tweed New Haven Airport, increasing security there. Police dogs, canines, state police dogs, have been released at Bradley International Airport to sniff out all of the buildings there. 
We have Brad Drazen live at Bradley International Airport with the very latest information in Windsor Locks. Brad. Jerry, at this point inside the airport, it's almost like a ghost town. When we arrived here about 45 minutes ago, there was a lot of activity, a lot of bustling, obviously a lot of emotion here as people were hearing what happened. But right now it is almost completely emptied out. That is a combination of people leaving because there are no flights leaving from Bradley. That is according to airport operations. There will be no flights leaving Bradley today, but also because we heard word through the airport they were evacuating the airport to make way for those state police dogs that are inside the airport as we speak. So right now, Bradley operations said there, it is unlikely that any flights will go out from Bradley the rest of the day, but they did tell me that there were no flights from New York. Originally, the three New York airports were the first airports to be closed. There were no flights diverted to Bradley and as far as they knew there were no flights that had taken off at Bradley that were turned around and landed back here at Bradley. When the freeze came, the flights stayed on the ground. No flights were diverted here. And right now, inside the terminal is a virtual ghost town. That's all from Windsor Locks. I'm Brad Drazen. Jerry, back to you. All right, Brad, thank you. We'll continue to update the situation from Bradley. We have just been advised that St. Raphael's Hospital in New Haven has been commissioned by the government to take the injured from New York City. What injured did they? Jump out of windows. It's, it's, it's horrific. I can't believe this is happening. Uh, anything else that you saw? Were you there for the second uh, hit yeah. by the plane? After, about 10 minutes later, the second building went off. Did you see it? Yes, I saw it. It just blew up. A big explosion. People started running. It was just chaos everywhere. Yes, I was right there. I was in the. I was down in the basement. Came down. All of a sudden, the elevator blew up. Smoke. I dragged the guy out. His skin was hanging off. And I dragged him out. And I helped him out of the out of, to the ambulance. Thank you. of the words of some of the witnesses here in Manhattan this morning and the pictures of what will I suspect before this is over go down as one of the most horrific days in our lifetime we're joined by our colleague CNN's Jeff Greenfield Aaron you know what in 1993 when terrorists bombed the World Trade Center their plan was to knock one of the towers into the other, bringing them both down. That disaster was averted, and bad as that was, in a sense, America was lucky. Another terrorist attack in the planning was interrupted to blow up the uh, Lincoln Tunnel and submerge dozens, maybe hundreds of people. At the eve of the millennium, a terrorist, a suspected terrorist, was intercepted, you remember, at the Canadian border the Canadian on, his Washington Washington border. Yeah. on his way to Seattle. On his way to Seattle. And I know that not so long ago, former President Clinton, in a private talk to a group, ruminated on how lucky the United States has been over the years to, with the combination of luck and the skill of anti-terrorist people, to avoid such things. What we are seeing now is nothing less than the worst nightmare that one could imagine come to life, probably worse than anyone could have imagined. You may remember that Tom Clancy wrote a novel that ends with a terrorist uh, hijacker crashing into the Capitol. The worst act of terrorist violence on American soil, the Oklahoma City bombing, killed fewer than 200 people. All we know today is that tens of thousands of people worked in that complex that has been destroyed. And I, I hate to say it this way, but this may be the day that America's luck ran out. Well, it, it is hard, isn't it? I mean, you look out here, and you see the Statue of Liberty to the right buildings off to the left, the attacks on Washington. We don't know a lot about who's behind this or what this is all about, but the symbolism of these attacks is extraordinary. It's extraordinary. Uh, CNN's David Ensor is in Washington and he joins us. David. Aaron, I'm talking to U.S. officials who are uh, obviously working on, on who is responsible for this. Uh, their working thesis is that this is overseas terrorism, not domestic. They say they cannot rule out additional attacks yet to come. In terms of claims of responsibility so far, uh, there is an Agence France press report uh, in which a group with the word Palestine in the name claims responsibility. And there is also a report uh, quoting uh, personnel close to uh, Osama bin Laden, the fugitive Saudi uh, accused terrorist, denying that that group was involved. But again, uh, uh, U.S. officials say they can't add, uh, shed any light on whether these uh, reports are correct or incorrect. Usually when this kind of attack occurs, you have claims of responsibility from all sorts of people who had nothing to do with it. So it's a very fluid situation at this point. But the uh, 
The Central Intelligence Agency of the United States has been evacuated from its headquarters in Langley, Virginia. There are some key personnel still in the headquarters, but uh, the operations center has been moved elsewhere. U.S. officials saying they don't want to talk about where exactly the headquarters uh, staff and operations staff has been moved to. But that staff is focusing now on trying to find any shred of information that could help the U.S. government figure out who is doing this and how to put a stop to it. Aaron? David, as a, you tell me if I'm right or wrong here, as a practical matter, there are not a whole lot of groups that the United States government knows about that are sophisticated enough, have the kind of money, the resources to pull off something like this. Fair enough? That's absolutely true. And obviously, uh, despite the denial, uh, attention will quickly turn to the bin Laden group because it has long tentacles. It has connections with all sorts of other groups. Uh, we saw. Uh, at the millennium, uh, a, a group of Algerians apparently involved in trying to uh, uh, arrange bombings in the United States, and now there is evidence being produced uh, in court uh, sessions that those Algerians were working for the bin Laden group. So that group certainly will come under immediate suspicion. There are very few others that could have pulled this off. Aaron. Right. I mean, just because of the enormity of it all and the sophistication required to stage these multiple attacks, this is not something some small cell can pull off. This is obviously a group or groups uh, well financed and extraordinarily well organized. Uh, that's, that's correct. Now, another thing you'll notice is that the uh, uh, you remember the attack on the USS Cole in the in the Yemen harbor. That was the first time that kind of an attack using small boats with bombs in them had been used against. Uh, an American warship. Uh, it worked once. Uh, now the U.S. Navy uh, has taken steps to make that much more difficult to do. Officials saying this may work once. Uh, they, they will now have to take measures to try to make sure that this kind of thing can't be done again. But these are apparently hijackings of civilian aircraft. So it was a sort of modus operandi that was dreamed up in some evil terrorist's mind and done on a massive scale here today, Aaron. Uh, David, thank you. CNN's David Ensor, uh, our national security correspondent, on what he is. On uh, West Broadway, on, uh, right, West now, Broadway uh, right now, uh, it's kind of hard to say, you know, West Broadway, Reed Street, but if you look down here, follow me down, you can see what it looks like finally, Chris. Down West Broadway, into that plume of smoke, that was where those World Trade Centers once stood. And you can see people milling all about. Emergency vehicles are trying to get through this area. Police are trying to wrangle people to clear the way so that they can get through. Just look at the ground. Look at all the debris everywhere. The dust, the mess. A lot of the uh, emergency vehicles that have been going through, this is a Fort Lee ambulance, so obviously they're calling in from every district surrounding the New York area. We've seen sheriff's vehicles, we've seen Port Authority acting as traffic supervisors and trying to wrangle people out of the way. But this is incredible because now sort of the sun has come out and it looks almost surreal in this area because right down there, if you can see into that plume of cloud, that's where we were when I did my first report with you on the cell phone about uh, 35 minutes ago when the first tower collapsed. We were hit with that plume of smoke. I don't know if you can even see from my clothing, but this is what a lot of the people looked like when they were coming out of that cell, out of that area, out of that plume of smoke. In fact, is it Mr. Borden? Yeah. Uh, you were in the area when this I, happened. I Tell me what happened. I was walking by the building and uh, yeah, early in the morning, and there was a large cracking noise. And all of a sudden, this guy looked up and screamed, and I thought he was joking. And, and I looked up, and all sorts of pieces of the building were coming off the building. And so we started running, and pieces of the building started falling, like in 20 foot in front of us, and there was nowhere to go in Did the hole. Did you hole. get hit with anything? No. Uh, we, we, uh, Did you I, run? Yeah, we ran and, and it fell under thing. And then we came back, and we were walking around the other side, and the other building uh, blew. And uh, I pulled a woman underneath a truck because all the debris was falling down then. And now they both collapsed. There's no more World Trade Centers. And what happened to you? Was there emergency uh, personnel who looked you over to help you out? Did no. you just escape the area? No, I just walked around and see if anybody else was okay because I was okay. This is where you work every day? Yeah. Down on okay. Wall Street. Yeah. I'm in shock. All right. Thank you. Just want to clear this area, please. Because obviously every time a vehicle goes through here, it's extremely dusty. This is this is about 10 to 10 to 15 blocks north of the trade center here, and uh, the ambulances personnel were handing out these 
uh, masks for people to wear, but they're obviously in very short supply. We tried to grab about 15 different ambulance workers at times and ask for masks, whether they were ambulance or whether they were police. There's just none available. We also saw some police officers coming down this street a little bit earlier on wearing full gas masks, almost like riot gear. They were heading into that area. What's so frightening at this time is that we've heard three explosions since both towers collapsed. I stopped another police officer. He was a New York City police officer who was working traffic in this area to ask him if he'd heard over his radio transmissions whether in fact those were car bombs as one officer had told me or whether he'd heard anything else he said he thought they were just residual collapse sounds and explosions that were just f from the original collapse but we haven't had confirmation on that um, the first officer that I did get the information from that that was a car bomb looked as though he was an inspector plain clothes of some sort he had a radio as well and, and a cell phone and was walking right past me down this area and uh, and I, I walked with him as he was talking on the cell phone I said what was it and he said car bomb and when I asked him to uh, elaborate he said no time no time and uh, he continued to walk forward the, the concern is that there are so many emergency so many emergency vehicles and emergency personnel that went down into that World Trade Center area, obviously cordoning it off and trying to keep people out of there. But clearly, they would have been right in that path of not only the falling debris, but also that incredible, powerful cloud that just engulfed us. And I think if you heard me earlier, I told you the only way for us to escape it at the time was to break down the, uh, the entrance to an apartment a, a building just off the street. We had to break through the glass and get into the second door to breathe. We were followed by a police officer as well who was struggling to breathe and then a security guard who worked in the uh in the World Trade Center as well, and he has he had been trying to walk northward away from that mess behind us. Could you just clear back so that the camera can take a view down there? Thanks. You can shoot down and you can see some of the activity while I'm reporting this to you. Um, we also had a, we, we also were able to uh, interview um, a security guard who was working on the uh, Concord in the plaza between the two. Uh, World Trade Centers, when the first explosion happened, when the first plane hit the, uh, the first tower, he said he was dispatched down to the concourse to, uh, to, to, to clear people away and to try to, to try to move people out of the World Trade Center. And then he said that's when the second explosion happened, which of course was the, the second tower. He said everything went pitch black. There was a cloud of smoke and a cloud of debris. When we uh, happened upon him, <coughs> it was extremely strange. He was. He was all dressed in his, in his black uh, security uniform, but he was fully covered from head to toe in gray and wandering aimlessly. He said he was Hold okay. On. Hold on. We asked him if he'd been Ashley, attended to. Can because Pat Dawson, who is not okay. far from you, is being asked to move. All right, Tom. We have just, Tom. We've just been told we're being evacuated. You can see all the emergency workers walking north on the West Side Highway in New York. We've been told by firefighters here that there is a report of a bomb in this building. This is a school, a high school, right here. And as you can see, they're moving everybody away from this building they've said that there's a bomb in the building they are evacuating us north now that is according to firefighters on the scene and we're going to move out of here right now just to keep ourselves safe so we're going to start walking north ourselves but that's what we're being told by new york city firefighters here that there were reports of a bomb in that high school right there it's called stuyvesant high school and so we are walking north to get out of the way you can see just to my left here these are the even the ambulances which were down there are being moved north the firefighters are being moved north everybody is being moved north we're being asked by the police now to go north and get out of the way uh, is it officer do you have any idea of what the problem There's a report is of a secondary device possibly in the area of this school so they're going to move everybody back as a precaution secondary device meaning a bomb possibly okay and where did that report come from was it, it called came, in it came came in over uh, over our radios and it's reported through our supervisors on down so we're pulling everybody back and that's in the Stuyvesant High School right there yes okay thank you very much officer McQuaid that's officer McQuaid of New York City Emergency Service I'm sorry, what's it? We are going to take it back here at CNBC, Bill Griffith, along with Sue Herrera. A few more uh, bits of information that we're getting. Obviously, we'll go back to MSNBC on the ground there in New York City as uh, as developments warrant it. Let me bring a couple things in. Sue, you have some things as well. I do. As a matter of fact, the FBI is now saying that the four hijacked planes were American Airlines flight number 11 and 77 and United Airlines flight number 175 and 93. And, and Scott, Scott Wapner, Wapner has, has more developments on one of those hijacked flights. Well, let's also look at some passenger counts from those planes. American Airlines Flight 11 was one of the ones believed to have crashed into the World Trade Center. We believe that was a Boeing 767 uh, with 81 passengers, nine flight attendants, and two pilots. Uh, American Airlines Flight 77 was believed uh, to be en route from Washington Dulles to Los Angeles, a Boeing 757 with 58 passengers, four flight attendants, and two pilots. 
pilots. Uh, United Flight 175, there is no information at this time as to how many passengers were on board. Uh, the other United plane involved, number 93, was believed to be en route from Newark to San Francisco. Uh, and this could be the plane, this is believed to be the plane that crashed outside of Pittsburgh. And we understand that about 9.58 uh, Eastern Time, this is re being reported by WPXI Television in Pittsburgh, uh, that a 911 center got a phone call from a cell phone from the plane uh, saying, in fact, that the plane was hijacked. Uh, there was an explosion, a cloud of white smoke, and, mm -hmm. and of course, uh, the phone then went dead. And Scott, before we go to Leslie LaRoche, our correspondent in London, U.S. officials are telling NBC News that the U.S. Army unit uh, have been placed on their highest state of alert. That would be ThreatCon Delta uh, for uh, protection purposes. This means armed troops and armored vehicles will be protecting U.S. bases and facilities throughout Europe, and we are going to get more on that as it develops, that from NBC News, from U.S. officials. Sue, let me bring, uh, mention that in about five minutes, uh, the Afghani ambassador representing the Taliban government is going to hold a news conference. Sources in Afghanistan say that they will deny any link or knowledge that known terrorist Osama bin Laden would be involved. And as far as they are concerned, he is banned from carrying out activities against anyone. Now, we should take this with a huge grain of salt because there are administration officials who are saying that the only, if we are to believe that this is a coordinated attack, and there really is no reason to believe it isn't, given the, uh, the timing of all of this today, that administration officials are saying that it should be considered a coordinated attack on the scale that uh, an organization put together by Osama bin Laden would be capable of carrying out if, in fact, that's what this is. American Airlines is now making a statement saying that it did officially lose two aircraft uh, carrying a total of 156 people. We updated you on those flight numbers earlier. We should also note that Manhattan is basically, entrance into Manhattan is basically shut down. All the bridges, all the tunnels, all, of, all the traditional ways that you would get into Manhattan, uh, you cannot do so today if you are in the tri-state area. Let's step back from New York for a moment, go to London, Leslie LaRoche there with uh, an update on uh, developments uh, across the pond there. Leslie? Thank you very much, Bill. Yeah, we are beginning to get some evacuations here in the city of London. Canary Wharf uh, is being evacuated. We know that London's Heathrow Airport is being closed. Sky News is reporting that. And uh, out of Germany, we understand that uh, transatlantic flights, European flights on their way to the U.S. have been suspended. Uh, trading has not been suspended in the markets, and we are seeing substantial, not surprisingly, substantial losses pretty much across the board. The, the DAX is down the deepest eight and a half percent right now. The CAC in Paris is down 7.2 percent. The FTSE still open for trade for just a short time now, down 5.6 percent. You were talking about some of the airliners, and if I may mention those, some of them are trading sharply lower. British Airways is down 21 percent right now. Lufthansa down 18 percent. There is, uh, has been a very sharp reaction also in the, in the oil markets, in the oil futures, and also in the oil sector. We have, uh, futures trade has been suspended, but it was suspended with the oil oil front month contract up about 10 percent. October and no November oil up three dollars on the day and there have been uh, subsequent and not surprising climbs in the oil sector. British Petroleum up six percent right now. Uh, Shell up two percent. Um, if I may also tell you we are um, getting some comment and some reaction out of uh, European leaders. Uh, Russian European well, world leaders really Russian President uh, Vladimir Putin has ex is expressing his condolence to the American people uh, reportedly called Calling these terrible tragedies. That's according to the Kremlin press service. Uh, over in France, President Jacques Chirac uh, gave a, a nationally televised address calling these attacks in the United States monstrous, expressing his solidarity with the American people. And uh, in Berlin, uh, foreign ministry officials are huddling in a crisis meeting there. We have heard from Tony Blair early on. He cut short uh, a meeting, is returning to London, calling uh, mass terrorism a new evil in our world and saying that democracies must come together to eradicate these evils. Uh, we'll leave it there f for now. We are also, um, it seems to be a small thing to say, but we are also seeing some reaction in the foreign exchange markets. And as I mentioned, I'm just being passed word that Heathrow Airport is being evacuated. We'll bring you up to date as we get more. Sue and Bill, back to you. In London uh, with the latest on that side of the Atlantic Ocean. We uh, on the phone have uh... reporting to you what we are learning from police from the federal government, from the CIA, from David Ensor, from our other correspondents. And I'm now told that uh, 
former U.S. Uh, Army Commander uh, General Wesley Clark is joining us on the telephone. Former commander of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, is joining us from, is it, from Little Rock, Arkansas. General Clark, uh, from your knowledge of the military, you know the Pentagon. What are you thinking right now? Well, good morning, Judy. Uh, first of all, we've got to try to assess what's really happening. And as all of the news reports indicate, this is, it's clearly a, a coordinated effort. It wasn't announced, and we, it hasn't been announced that it's over, and we don't know how it will finally conclude. So there's likely to be more trouble before, uh, before all of this concludes. So we've got to protect the American people first. We've got to look after those who are injured. We've got to take precautionary measures to deal with future incidents. And I think all of that's underway with a lot of responsible action by people everywhere. The damage at the Pentagon is unclear from all the news reports that I've seen. Uh, the one report that said it crashed into the Army side of the building, uh, there are command centers in various places of the Pentagon, and there are many other alternate command centers. So I don't think there's really any issue about the command and control of the United States Armed Forces. I'm sure that's very solid right now. General Clark, why do you say uh, there are likely to be, there's likely to be more trouble? Well, we're hearing still reports of, uh, of aircraft that are out there. There's no way of knowing when all of the possible incidents uh, have either taken place or, or been aborted by uh, whoever it is that's behind this. And so we, we, have to, we have to be ready for whatever might happen next. General, can you give us some sense of, uh, clearly the United States has never experienced anything of this magnitude, but what, is the, what are the leaders of our, of our military, uh, the, the Joint Chiefs, uh, the Secretary of Defense and others, what, what presumably are they doing right now in order to be on top of a situation where you have the Pentagon on fire, New York City in a state of chaos, and every federal building in Washington uh, evacuated? Well, first of all, we'll be trying to we'll be trying to assess what happened. We'll be making sure that the uh, protection posture of our bases worldwide and all of our units out there is raised so that uh, we're able to protect our forces and our family members. And then we'll be looking to provide assistance to uh, wherever such incidents might occur, whatever military capabilities there will be that could be of use will be certainly made available to the other agencies of state, local, and federal government who are involved in trying to deal with these tragedies right now. Then beyond that, we'll be waiting for the information to come in about uh, who may have been behind this, and we'll be looking at what measures can be taken to uh, strike and prevent further actions or in uh, punitive retaliation. Well, speaking of that, uh, General Clark, wouldn't you agree there are very few of the terrorist groups, at least that we're familiar with, who would have the capability to pull off something this coordinated on this scale? I think that's exactly right. I, there's, there's only one group that has ever indicated that it has this kind, kind of ability, and that's Osama bin Laden's. So obviously that'll be the first suspicion. Are you, uh, clearly we are all in a state of shock, General Clark, but is it fair to say that you, you're not truly surprised by this given what we've heard from, from that particular group? And again, we don't know who's behind this, but uh, given what we do know. Well, there have been many threats made against the United States and threats of terrorism, and we know that the World Trade Center has been a target. We know that aircraft have been hijacked, and we know that car bombings are used in many places in the world. And uh, there's no doubt that for a long time there have been groups who have tried to target the United States. Uh, normally, many times we've gotten indications, we've been able to take actions that the American public never knows about that have broken up these attempts. In this case, for whatever reason, we didn't have the information and we weren't able to take the actions to break it up. And General, what do you say to those Americans who are looking at these horrific pictures that they've been watching now for almost three hours on television who are thinking, will I ever feel safe again in an airplane, in a tall building in this country? I, I think that that will be one of the primary 
issues that has to be addressed by government leaders is how to restore ever a sense of normalcy to the country. Will it ever be the same? And that's a question everybody will be asking. But I think it's too soon to expect any answers to that. I think we've got to assess this. We've got to, to track this down. I, I think one thing that comes through very clearly now is if this is terrorism and international terrorism, then clearly there has to be a much greater degree of cooperation between nations to deal with this. Whoever did this lives somewhere. He's supported by someone, and people know him. And someone knew that these events were being planned. And if we didn't have that information, we should have. And I think that's one resolve that will come out of this from nations all over the world, that more has to be done collectively together. But in a, in a large sense, General Clark, uh, whoever was behind this has clearly succeeded in the most horrific and devastating way. Well, it's been a, a tragedy for America, there's no doubt about that. And for so many, so many people and their families, uh, our, our hearts go out to them. General, we're looking, uh, as I'm talking with General Wesley Clark, who is a former NATO commander, he's talking to us from Arkansas, we're looking at helicopters patrolling, I believe it's the area around the Pentagon, although I can't tell by the banner across the lower part of the screen. Um, we do know that President Bush was in Florida this morning. He abruptly uh, cut his trip short in order, we think, to fly back to Washington. And General Clark, while you are with us, what would the plans be for the president in this situation without giving away secure information? Uh, would the president necessarily return to Washington? Is, that, is there always a plan in place in these situations? Well, it, it, there, there would have to be a plan always in place to take the president to where he can best control what's going on and monitor it and, and make decisions, and also where he will be safe. And you can be sure that there are plans and backup plans and alternate plans to the backup plans. There, there'll be no shortage of efforts underway to assure his safety and his ability to maintain the continuity of government. And once again, uh, just finally, General Clark, as we look at these live pictures of the Pentagon, um, describe for us what you know of the section of the building that evidently was hit by the commercial jetliner. Well, that picture seems to be from the area of the bridges, the 14th Street Bridge, looking at the at the uh, corner of the Pentagon that uh, uh, is opposite from where the strike was. So it looks like the strike hit between the 4th, 5th, maybe 6th corridors of the Pentagon, uh, perhaps on the Army side of the building. There are a number of offices there, administrative offices, uh, where Army leaders and staff officers uh, work on a daily basis. They deal with things like uh, planning and logistics and congressional relations and public affairs in that area. And the Army leadership was probably uh, close to, to where that may have impacted. There are a number of other facilities below ground, some of which have been relocated, and it's impossible to see from that picture what the condition might be there. General Clark, any final word before we let you go? Well, I, I think that I think that we've known for some time that there were groups planning this, and I think the American people should know that the men and women in government and all the agencies have worked very hard and very diligently against this. Uh, obviously, we didn't do enough. We didn't either have the tools or the cooperation or somehow get the information that we needed to have prevented it. ...as he has taken us. And all I'm suggesting is that if we don't have a decisive response to convince observers that you cannot kill innocent Americans in peacetime without retaliation of severe proportions, that other groups and other people will decide that the most open society in the world is also the most vulnerable, and they'll exploit those vulnerabilities. I think this is as decisive a moment for our future as Pearl Harbor was in a different way. As I said earlier, this right. is a 21st century opponent, not uh, an obvious nation state, but in the Sudan, in Afghanistan, in a number of other places, uh, we know where bin Laden's assets are, 
uh, and, we'd, right. and, and we'd need to take the risk of going after them. Newt Gingrich, well spoken, thank you. Uh, let's go to Edie Donahue, who has uh, some information from our newsroom. Edie? Good morning, John. The target this morning is America, the enemy at this point unknown. But as we were doing our show this morning, Fox and Friends, very, at the very end of the show, the first uh, airplane crashed into one of the World Trade Center buildings, the North Tower. That apparently was American Airlines number 11 from Boston to L.A. It had been hijacked, apparently 92 people on board. Just minutes after that, within 10 minutes or so, the second World Trade Center tower was attacked. That the South Tower, that apparently was a 757, another American Airlines flight, they believe, from Dulles to Los Angeles. Uh, then about 45 minutes later, it was the Pentagon. Moving on down to the Washington, D.C. area, the Pentagon is the next place attacked as it continues. The south wall, there's now a 50-foot gaping hole there. Apparently another airplane that was hijacked uh, crashed into the wall that's near the helipod, helipad there, and that is where the, uh, the highest-ranking officials are able to take off in the helicopter. Uh, at 10 a.m. then, just about 15 minutes Mike, after Mike that, uh, a 757 from United, number 93, crashed about 80 miles southwest of Pittsburgh, and uh, that flight en route from Newark to San Francisco. Uh, area hospitals here in the New York City area are taking in all the wounded from the World Trade Center. As you know, those, uh, the, the towers are 110 stories tall. Uh, while we do know that some people were able to get down from the 92nd floor all the way to the ground and managed to escape safely, there have been untold untold injuries in this and untold deaths. Several area hospitals say they are already booked to capacity. They're asking people in the waiting rooms to start donating blood immediately because there is a desperate need for it right now. At this point nationwide, all U.S. commercial planes have been grounded. The planes that were already in the air were instructed to land at the nearest airport. Incoming international flights were diverted to Canada and uh, even Canada now, some airports in Canada su supposedly have been closed. As uh, you know, the president left Sarasota and he is trying to get control of the situation, but it is changing rapidly. We'll continue updating you on the latest. John, back to you. All right, A.D. Donahue in our newsroom, and we should uh, note that the Secret Service is not confirming the president's location. He is okay. He's aboard Air Force One, but exactly where he is, the Secret Service will not say. David Schuster is at the Pentagon where uh, there was that strike by that third aircraft earlier today. Uh, David, what's the latest? John, we can now report that the fire here at the Pentagon has spread from beyond the E ring, the outside ring of the south side, to at least two, maybe three of the inner rings. And looking at pictures now of the Pentagon, there is a gaping hole uh, at least 100 to 150 feet wide on the south side of the Pentagon where five floors of the Pentagon have collapsed. The fire officials, the firefighters are pouring water onto that side of the Pentagon, but we can literally see now that a fire uh, has spread and has broken out at least now about uh, 300 feet down away from where the firefighters uh, are working on the fire. And so now fire trucks are pulling up to this other side of the Pentagon. We believe this is all, of course, related to the one airline crash. And officials, again, uh, now saying that the, all of the U.S. air aircraft have been accounted for, that this was a silver jetliner, perhaps American, perhaps United, that hit the Pentagon. But again, the, the news from here is that the, the fire at the Pentagon is still out of control. Smoke is still billowing off of the roof from some of the inner rings now at the Pentagon, and the fire has also spread along some of the outer rings, spreading from the south side towards the north side. We, our office in the Pentagon is actually uh, in the north side on the E ring, and uh, we can now see smoke coming not only from uh, to our left down the hallways, but also to our right, and, and smoke still pretty thick. So this fire at the Pentagon still out of control, uh, and literally, when you remember the pictures of the Oklahoma City bom uh, bombing with the, the Murrow building completely sort of burrowed out uh, like a sort of a, like a horseshoe. That's what it looks like for a part of the Pentagon where literally there's a huge, uh, maybe 100 feet hole, uh, and you can actually see the offices carved out like a giant U on the side of the Pentagon. The Pentagon, of course, uh, the, uh, there's concentric rings where all the walls are connected, and now suddenly there's this giant hole and, and a fire that clearly has spread to some of the inner rings of the Pentagon. Uh, the Pentagon was evacuated at about 10 o'clock this morning. Some 23,000 employees cleared out. Uh, the reason that the, the fire uncontrolled might still be a problem is that the, the people who remain in the Pentagon, aside from a couple of journalists here, includes officials at the National Military Command Center. They have a bunker in the basement of the Pentagon in the center of the building. Uh, those are the officials that would coordinate the military response. Those are the officials that might coordinate the, uh, uh, the dispatch of some of the uh, fighter jets that uh, reporters have seen flying over New York.
American flying over Washington, it, it might at some point, I suppose, become a problem if the fire continues and they've got to start pouring water on the center of the Pentagon. That, that, that at that point, perhaps there may become uh, some potential uh, problem for the officials. That Let's are go here. to uh, David Schuster in Washington. Thank you. Let's go to Logan Airport in Washington. This is a security news conference. We've closed the airport to all arriving and all departing flights. We've increased our security measures. We've shut down all the construction sites within Logan Airport, both air side and land side. And we've shut down all security checkpoints and removed all passengers who had been previously screened out into the non-secure part of the airport. We've activated our Family Assistance Center at the Hilton Hotel based upon some reports that some of these flights may have originated from Boston. Uh, we're asking the, the uh, media's assistance to notify any family members uh, that may have had families flying on those flights that uh, we've had various reports on uh, to call these following numbers. American Airlines, 800-245. 0999. Uh, secondly, family members can call a math port number 617-568-3100. We're also uh, urging people not to come to the airport at this point in time. We've increased the shuttle buses from the terminals to the MBTA Blue Line stop, and the MBTA has increased the uh, frequency of um, subway uh, transportation. Uh, we are in close communication with the FAA, the FBI, state police, Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And that's all I have right now. Joe, you've got to tell us more about these planes that left this morning. What, what flights do you have reports on? The flights. Uh, I cannot confirm or deny any flight numbers because I have not received official notification on any flight numbers. So how can we get people to call, call these in? numbers? So be everybody who's, who's got a flight. Okay, I, I do believe uh, several of the media outlets are broadcasting several flight numbers. I believe uh, they're broadcast flight number 11, American Airlines. Is there a second flight out of Boston? Involved? Involved in this? I, I don't know at this point in time. Were the process hijacked? I cannot confirm that. Has the airport accounted for all outbound flights? Uh, that's uh, outside of the scope of the airport's responsibility. Uh, we're leaving it up to the FAA to conduct that activity. Okay, Joe, what is the code, Joe, what is the code Fort Knox? We have reports of employees screaming Fort Knox around the airport at the time that the planes went into the World Trade Center. That, I don't know what that means. Doesn't mean have any connotation here at Logan Airport. What about planes that are flying in here? Are they being rerouted somewhere else? Fly, uh, aircraft were flying into Logan Airport. Uh, we did take some arrivals, but now since the airport is shut down, uh, these flights will be diverted to uh, Canada. They're not taking flights either, will you? Are you screening passengers who were let off there? Remove them from another area, yes. They're being directed to seek either public transportation or their own transportation there out of the airport. The they Leaving the airport? Yeah. No. How long do you anticipate the, the airport to be closed? It's indefinite at this time. Um, we're just, uh, we'll be meeting with the FAA. We'll be conducting an uh, analysis of our intelligence that we have. We'll make a determination later on this afternoon. Pardon me? All right, that is the situation at Logan Airport in Boston. Uh, one of the... ...concern the federal office buildings, the courthouses, is it going to be a minute-by-minute minute thing? Or? It's going to be an hour-by-hour. Hour. We need to continue to monitor. We've had some uh, isolated uh, bomb threats that have been made to buildings in Connecticut. We don't know whether those are pranks or... At this point, obviously, we're taking every threat and every phone call quite seriously, which is why I made the decision several hours ago to, to close the state offices, to send employees home, and to hopefully project to employers uh, the, the importance of, of being cautious and, and, frankly, just taking care of everyone. Were those bomb threats the trigger for closing down state buildings? Well, as we were making a determination of um, what precautions to take, we did receive some isolated phone calls 
And again, as soon as I receive those, um, as you know, in these terrible, devastating moments, there are people that like to mimic. Uh, and so we, we really can't make a determination whether those are mimicked calls or serious. So uh, to be secure and to be safe, we decided that we'll, we'll send them place. Were they against state buildings? Were they against state buildings? Or they were. There were, I believe, two or three against state buildings. Was it after the initial explosion? That's in correct. Were there uh, are federal buildings closed all through Connecticut? Federal buildings are closed at this point. I, well, all courts are closed, and I think all federal buildings are closed as well. Governor, what about the defense installations in Connecticut and places like Electric Boat and Pratt & Whitney? Have you been in touch with the uh, officials at those places? I've uh, not been in touch. Uh, we talked to our offices, talked to the utility companies. We're concerned about some of those facilities, as you know, in Northeast for the most cases, does not have ownership of the, those facilities. The sub-base has their own procedures. Um, we have sent um, our uh, personnel to obvious locations. Uh, we have our MPs here, all the other state armory buildings around the, around the city and around the state. Um, I know there were employers in Stanford, for example, that were concerned with tall buildings. They've taken adequate precautions. Frankly, it's hard to determine what possible targets they could be, so everyone should be on alert. And of course, we're not trying to, to scare people, but um, clearly the most devastate, devastating moment that uh, we will all face in our lives. Governor, did you said that command aircraft was sending was some Command aircraft, aircraft is called, and I've made contact with them. We have uh, three of their helicopters available. Uh, for heavy, ma heavy, heavy machinery movement, um, we also have our. Over. We have about eight of our guard helicopters that are also being sent to New York. Uh, some will help with uh, putting out the fire. Others will be on, on backup for uh, moving uh, equipment. And of course, we have more than 100 military uh, medical personnel that we are prepared to send to New York as well. I believe that our best utilization is to help New York City. Uh, based on our locations, right. and obviously if we can help in Washington or anywhere else, we will, but our, our guard capabilities are quite significant for heavy machinery, medical personnel, helicopter capacity. Command has sent uh, three of their helicopters, which we'll be sending down there. And of course, the unfortunate part for New York is that, you know, they have to make sure that everything going into New York is secure as well, right. so they are in a, a very difficult situation. Do you or, or Commissioner Sullivan have a recent estimate of the number of Connecticut residents who commute into Manhattan? 28,000 is the number that we estimate people leaving the state of Connecticut that commute into New York on a daily basis. That's trains and automobiles and buses. Trains, I think it's just That's trains. That's, That's just, just trains. trains. 28,000 people commute so it's by train from Connecticut into New York City. Uh, obviously um, this tragedy occurred after the rush hour, so a lot of our Connecticut residents were already there. We did stop the trains from going in after the tragedy occurred, and those were in the hundreds, and we've been able to try to get those people back home. And for the viewers who may be just joining us, the trains and buses will be leaving Manhattan, coming back to Connecticut till 8 p.m. tonight. We are hopeful tonight. that uh, over the last 20 minutes, trains have been able to leave New York, heading back into Connecticut, and we hope that um, Connecticut residents can make their way back home. Uh, and we'll have some buses down there, uh, but I suspect that uh, family members will be involved in picking Governor, up is there residents any, as well. Is there any time limit on, on the trains coming, the trains and buses coming back from New York? Or it's our understanding at this point is that they're going to use as many trains as they can to get people out of the city. You have two things happening. You have obviously Connecticut residents returning home. You probably have an awful lot of people in New York that are trying to get out of the city as well. So I suspect you're going to have thousands of people leaving the city. Uh, probably quite panicked, and um, so we're going to have emergency personnel, medical personnel, buses, and all that we can do to accommodate these people as they leave the city. But is there any time the limit in terms of when those trains or buses will stop coming out of New York? They have not given a time limit uh, at this point. Uh, they'll be making an hour-by-hour -hour decision. Just to clarify, Governor, just to clarify, um, you mean the buses will be taking people from the train stations in Connecticut or uh, or do you mean that the buses will actually be leaving New York City? No, buses aren't going to get into New York City. Nothing's getting in New York City or, right or now. Out. So we're going to have buses at certain locations where we can accommodate people leaving, or at the very least to uh, to be able to move them from one in, station to another. In Connecticut. In the buses Connecticut. are not themselves leaving New York to bring people. That's just, correct. Just trains. Just trains. And the trains. If, you if there are buses that New York in. people are using to get out of the city, that's an issue. We cannot get Connecticut buses into New York at this point. We're going to keep this thing up.
how long, or do you have any idea? Well, they're certainly going to be closed for the rest of the day, and we're going to have to uh, make a decision uh, uh, later today about what we're going to do tomorrow. Again, this is all precaution. We have no reason to believe that um, any buildings uh, are a target here in Connecticut. Again, the, the most important thing to recognize and realize is that this has been obviously a well-orchestrated uh, terrorist attack, very sophisticated with the incredible damage that they've done in New York City and in Washington. And it's better to be safe um, at this moment with Connecticut buildings and keep our fingers crossed and the hope that this horrific act is concluded. I don't know that at this moment. Yeah, Governor Rowland live in Hartford on this uh, now infamous day talking about the happenings in Connecticut locking down and trying to be safe. We're going to rejoin that, ABC uh, network program. Perhaps now. Greenwich and Stanford would, would be uh, avail themselves. Canada. And, and several, it seems like it's not very long ago, it's only been three hours uh, almost to the minute since this actually happened. And, and early on, uh, we made the observation that in some respects, this was, this was not in some respects, this is the most serious attack on the U.S. mainland um, uh, since Pearl Harbor. And I notice now that uh, at least one senator in Washington, Senator Chuck Hagel of Nebraska, um, referring to that attack 60 years ago, which so surprised the nation, has now called this the second Pearl Harbor. And um, so much, of course, is, is different in, in, in the world, and, and yet one should not be surprised if this comes to be referred to that um, in the days and, and in the weeks ahead. We've managed to uh, put together a couple of, of pieces, a couple of uh, pieces of information on tape, um, and one of them is, I believe, a quick comment and a quick comment only from Mayor Giuliani of New York. Can we just roll that, please? Mayor, what's the situation right now? The situation is that two airplanes have attacked apparently. You can't go to sea. Why? You should not go to sea. All right, well then let's get let's go, let's go north then. You know basically what happened to airplanes? Stop it. To, come with us. Come with us. Well, let's talk a little later, okay? Okay. Right. City Hall. Okay. You could never, under, never, ever, ever underestimate how important the political leaders are in their respective communities are to the country at this moment. Uh, uh, Mayor Giuliani, uh, who's coming to the end of his term in office, uh, down there, very characteristic fashion of him, John Miller, to go immediately to the scene. Some, ma some mayors have not, and it has cost them politically, but, but uh, you, you see in that early picture, uh, maybe that's an hour or so ago, in which he's just caught above as much guard as... Uh, Yes. Anybody else. And he's, he's covered with dust. Uh, he's walking with uh, his principal bodyguards. The other man wearing the mask uh, who stopped him from speaking, obviously for security reasons, wanting to get him further out of the area, was his police commissioner, Bernard Carrick, who, uh, as the mayor was about to stop and give a briefing, said, no, we have to go further out, um, concerned uh, for, you know, uh, other damage and, and his safety. Okay. Um, Senator Schumer of New York uh, is, I believe, on the phone. Senator, are you there? And can I ask where you are? Yeah, I am in Washington, Peter. Good. I, obviously, you, sir, have something to say, and here's well, the space. Well, I just, you know, I mean, we're all just totally shocked here. I mean, probably there are two mil there are millions of New Yorkers who are in my position. My wife works. I'm in Washington, but mm -hmm. my wife works a quarter of a mile from the World Trade Center. My daughter goes to high school within the shadow of the World Trade Center. Have you spoken to them both? I did speak finally to my daughter. I spoke to my wife earlier this morning, and I spoke to my daughter uh, about a half hour ago. Both were obviously extremely mm -hmm. shaken by what's happened. Here. Senator, you know as you know precisely that 50,000 people work in the World Trade Center. There are 155 businesses in there, and 80,000 people visit the World Trade Center every day. How okay. can you give us some? Sense of your feeling about the magnitude of this, your knowledge of the magnitude of this? It, it leaves you almost speechless. I was going through each floor, and I know people on almost every other floor, and I'm sure that's true of so many people here. This is such a dastardly act uh, aimed Show at me. the heart of America and the heart of New York, and it is there. You Sorry. don't even know what to think. It, it is just so awful. Senator, uh, I apologize for We're going to have to redouble our efforts uh, because terrorism 
leaves nobody. Senator, out. I apologize for interrupting you. I really do. But this is an American Airlines news conference, which we do want to have. We'll come back here. Not that I'm aware of. We've been in business here 26 years. I get, have we ever done this? Close the air side to all the terminal buildings? This is unprecedented. Yes, sir. We have, we have not done it. It is this this level of uh, uh, security has not happened before. We hear from the aviation community that uh, there is a rumor that military jets are escorting a commercial aircraft to this airport right now. Can any of you comment about that? I have no earthly idea, sir. Mr. Jim, do you know anything about that? Uh, I would assume that since all of the aircraft that are due uh, into DFW have landed, uh, there are no military escorts. Now, whether there was a military escort provided to them or not, uh, we're unaware of that. We can take about two more questions, and we're going to have to. Uh, Whether you're going to carry okay. on that? Uh, we have uh, canceled the implosion uh, party set for this Saturday, and we will uh, look at where we go from here. Well, the flights that were diverted, where did they go? Well, they, they could have gone a variety of places. We don't have all that specific information. Uh, it typically, when a plane is diverted, it's diverted to the Category X airport, the largest airport that is closest to where they're going, but we don't have specific information. The planes on the ground right now uh, that are sitting there on the runway. Any indication that perhaps a terrorist would be in one of those planes? have no idea whatsoever. And when you say shutting down the air site, can you just articulate that a little more? Certainly. Is this the... Go, just tell it's us certainly what you mean by that. Right. Uh, what that means is, is uh, any when you go through your security checkpoint for those customers who are used to going to the airport, anything on the opposite side of that is called that secure side of the airport. And those are the areas uh, that are being closed to the public. Um, they are still keeping open those areas in front of that. They call that the ATO area, or, or where you can check your bags, that sort of thing, to accommodate any customers' questions and things that might find their way to the airport. So all folks who are stranded are being moved out, essentially? Indeed, and being accommodated, uh, those uh, based upon what the plans are by their respective air carriers, uh, be accommodated in local hotels and things of that nature. That's all. I'm uh, sorry. One more question. We're going to have to get back to our business. I talked with passengers out the terminal. They said that uh, people were coming off the plane and having their bags searched for their luggage. Comes up, comes up scary. That's possible. That is possible on the part of the air carrier. Okay, thank you. We'll be back to you. I think the most important thing to take away is that there is no specific threat to this airport, and rest assured that our DPS folks uh, will keep you alerted if anything else uh, is to occur. Thank Kevin, you. what time should we expect another? Well, there you hear uh, the comments from two officials. I have to be perfectly honest, not sure who they are, whether they work for American Airlines or they work for the airport in Dallas, but they were in, 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 in Dallas today, and they say at the end of that news conference there is no specific threat to that airport. Uh, which will be a reassuring to people who are around the airport, but anybody who's wanting to fly anywhere in the country at the moment is unable to do so anyway. But the conditions in the country are of such a confusing nature at the moment that stuff just comes in all the time. We've had authorities in Lexington, Kentucky, uh, tell our affiliate there, WTVQ, just a short while ago, that as a plane is missing from radar in their airspace, and it is simply going to take time in order to... Uh, in order to to sort out whether or not we're looking or at an operation or somehow witnessing or being on the edges of an operation that is continuing to unfold in various parts of the country. We still indeed have a missing aircraft or a missing or not accounted for aircraft from United Airlines. Uh, we had a crash uh, near Pittsburgh here today about which we have only that Hi everybody, I'm Darren no Kramer, live in the News Channel 8 newsroom. We're going to keep ABC on the screen for you and bring you up to date briefly on what's happening in Connecticut. We heard from Governor Rowland just a few moments ago. Mark Davis is in Hartford uh, with the latest there. Mark? Good forces uh, as the afternoon goes on. I've been in touch with the mayor, I've been in touch with the White House, and everything that we can do and everything that can be done is being uh, done at this point. Um, uh, has anyone given you any idea of how many injured we are dealing with down it's in not the at this center. point uh, it, it, at this point the sole uh, goal is to try to help as many people as possible to get them to the emergency services to get them the care they need to help people who want to leave the area to leave in an orderly way and to make sure we do everything we can to provide security uh, throughout the city and throughout the state and governor Pataki are, can, can you tell me the degree to which the state's planning for these sorts of 
tragedies, and there's obviously a plan in place, and New York is, because of its place in the world, is obviously a, a, a place you have to consider a target. Whether that plan envisions something of the magnitude of what has taken place this morning. Well, you plan for any eventuality, but you never actually expect to see something of this magnitude. But uh, we have coordinated well with the city. We're going to continue to make sure we provide all the support we can. We do have emergency services and emergency transportation running. I know the reports have been inaccurate. We do have uh, limited uh, rail service out of Grand Central to the northern suburbs, limited rail service out of Brooklyn and Queens to Long Island. We're working to make sure that uh, bus service to the extent possible continues and we're trying to get subway service back on track it's not there yet but uh, the coordination has been uh, excellent it's have any idea how many people have been hospitalized or how many hospitals for all of the flights and you can imagine at any given moment during a, a, a normal day of business how many flights will be in the air around the United States exactly. uh, and indeed in North America so that as they try to account for each of those flights they are, uh, are scrambling to figure out where all of them are. And there is a brief recap of exactly what has happened so far today. As Bill mentioned, two planes crashed into the World Trade Center, one into the North Tower, one into the South Tower. Both of the Twin Towers in Lower Manhattan in the Financial District have collapsed. The Pentagon in Washington has been attacked. Parts of the Pentagon, according to the Associated Press, have collapsed as well. Alina, you have some late breaking news too. There's a live shot of Washington DC and the Pentagon. This is uh, as of about 20 minutes ago, uh, Sue, but I'm not sure if we pass this along. I don't want to alarm anyone, but at the same time, uh, NBC News uh, is reporting, according to a White House aide, that he has uh, tried to reach officials close to uh, President Bush and uh, White House signal operators said they were still trying to reach the president on Air Force One. Uh, you will recall if you've been watching along with us that uh, the president cut short a trip to Florida. He was there pushing his education plan. He learned uh, of this tragedy uh, while he was uh, reading to children at an elementary school in Sarasota. Uh, he promptly uh, left that uh, uh, a venue and uh, shortly thereafter made a statement uh, condemning the attacks, of course. And all uh, the federal buildings in Washington have been evacuated as well. Right, and so just to put this in uh, perspective, uh, just to compare, the worst terrorist attack ever before today was the Air India 747 bombing over the Irish Sea in 1985, which killed 329 people. Uh, we are not getting clear numbers uh, and, and may not for uh, some Nor time will for a while, uh, for a while uh, on these uh, tragedies in Washington and New York. Uh, just so you know, on any given day, according to a local city official in New York, uh, the World Trade Center on a work day, uh, uh, both buildings might hold around 10,000 people. Uh, the capacity is about 50,000. Uh, you can only imagine. Uh, the type of news we're going to be hearing in the coming days. It is going to be very difficult. Obviously. On the telephone, we have Neil Livingstone, who is the chairman and CEO of a, of a, a group called Global Options, which is a, a, a crisis management uh, uh, organization uh, that uh, goes into action at times like this. Mr. Livingstone, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, some perspective from your point of view. You've been in this business an awfully long time. No one has seen anything like quite like this. Well, this is the nightmare that we have exercised against and, uh, and worried about for literally uh, two decades, and it's finally come to pass. But our, our, our major fear was a multiplicity of attacks against a multiplicity of targets in, a, in uh, multiple cities, that would t and, uh, and particularly if they were very high consequence or symbolic uh, targets, and that's exactly what we've seen today. We don't want to be speculative too soon, but uh, this uh, obviously had to be a very, very well-coordinated uh, attack. Very well-coordinated and very expensive. And uh, we, can, we also have to presume that uh, even the pilots uh, of those aircraft, if they had a gun to their head, still probably would not have uh, flown those aircraft into the World Trade Center. They would have done something else. And so we have to presume that uh, probably they even had uh, trained pilots flying those aircraft at this point after they had seized them. So this is, this is a, a, a very highly uh, skilled and coordinated attack. Uh, there are only a small number of groups or countries in the world that probably could carry out such attacks. And uh, obviously U.S. intelligence is mobilized right now and law enforcement authorities to uh, uh, turn over every rock in the world and uh, look at every source trying to uh, uh, figure 
figure out if we can identify those culprits. Uh, intelligence uh, groups uh, here in the U.S. that must feel very, very upset uh, and, and devastated uh, by this uh, and not having seen it coming. Well, we've had so many threats in recent years. We had one last week against our uh, embassy and our military posts in uh, Japan and, and Korea, and uh, nothing, of course, happened. Uh, we have so many warnings these days that they've blended into the background noise. Our problem is, and we've always, we've always believed this for many years, is that you cannot stop these attacks at the water's edge. Uh, you have to go to where the terrorists live and to the governments that sponsor them or give them safe haven. And that's uh, the only way that you're going to be able to deal with this because we live in an open society, and unfortunately uh, an open society is a very vulnerable society. Neil, if no one claims responsibility for this particular attack, and given the fact that, that obviously it has taken the United States unawares, are we going to be able to find out who did this? I think we're going to be able to find out. I, I suspect that uh, we may already have strong indications who carried it out. Uh, a lot of time, our problem with intelligence material is, is assessing it in real time. Sometimes when we know what to look for, we can go back and look at it and see if it makes more sense. We have a lot of culprits in this case. Uh, we'll be able to look at the manifests of the aircraft. We'll be able to look at uh, when they entered the country and on what passports and so on, presuming that they are, are foreign nationals as opposed to domestic nationals. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, all of those things may uh, start pointing in, in several directions uh, very conclusively. Neil, I understand that, that your wife either works at the Pentagon or was, was at the Pentagon this morning? My wife is undersecretary of the Navy. She was at the Pentagon. Uh, uh, she, she was, is all right? Uh, she's all right. She called from the parking lot. Uh, on, she has an office on the E-ring, which is the outer ring of the Pentagon where the windows are. And obviously we know that the plane went into the side. Uh, but fortunately she was in the bowels of the Pentagon giving a speech at that time. Did she tell you what it was like? Did she just... No, I've, I've not talked to her directly. Uh, uh, c cellular phone traffic was totally out of uh, commission in Washington, and she spoke with my office as I... Uh, was caught in traffic at the time that this occurred and uh, uh, simply indicated that she was all right and uh, would be back in touch with me when she could. David Faber, you have a question. Yeah, Neil, uh, it's not uh, a stretch to say that the magnitude of these attacks are past that of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, it, it, how do you respond to something like this, which certainly would be an act of war if, in fact, another nation were committing it? Well, it's even an act of war if, if, uh, if a group has uh, carried out this attack and has some sponsorship by a country. I mean, you have to remember that we, we don't know that this is Osama bin Laden, but he's protected by the Taliban government in Afghanistan and has already carried out other attacks against us. And, um, and we've done nothing or precious little to try to deal with that problem. Uh, this is probably of greater consequence to the United States in some ways than Pearl Harbor, in other ways not. But I think every American, just as my parents' generation remembered where they were when they heard the news of Pearl Harbor, I think this is going to traumatize the American public the same way, and it calls for a very drastic response by the United States. What happens to intelligence services here in the United States, indeed security services here in the United States? We had another securities expert earlier who said, you know, in a free society there is only so much you can do and still maintain a free society. Well, it depends, I think, right now on whether there are further attacks and um, as to how far we go in, in, in basically taking extraordinary steps to protect the security of Americans on a temporary basis. But obviously, Americans all over, all over the world are feeling threatened right now. Our bases and our military is on the highest stage of alert. Um, um, after all, the, the very heart of our military, the Pentagon, has been attacked. And so as a consequence, we're on a wartime footing now already. And nothing would surprise me, given the gravity of the situation. Uh, it isn't to say that we want to see civil liberties suspended or anything, but you can bet that extraordinary steps will be taken by law enforcement agencies, by the intelligence community, by the military, and by our political leadership right now. Neil, thank you.
Neil Livingstone, uh, the uh, CEO of Global Options, a uh, uh, terrorist uh, uh, crisis management group there based in Washington. Bill, in fact, uh, uh, as you might expect, world reaction is coming in, local reaction. Uh, you know, David Faber referred to this uh, being similar to Pearl Harbor. In fact, Senator Chuck Hagel, Republican from Nebraska, called it the second Pearl Harbor. Canadian Prime Minister Jean Chrétien uh, said the attacks on the U.S. were both cowardly and evil. We also want to mention that uh, there are several government houses uh, that, uh, gov government offices rather, that were housed in the World Trade Center, among them the U.S. Customs Office, the New York Secret Service, the U.S. Treasury Department, U.S. Secret Service, uh, U.S. Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition, of course, uh, as Mark uh, Haynes had mentioned earlier uh, this morning, uh, all of the uh, rescue personnel who were in there, firefighters, police officers, and the people who work there uh, from, from and we should note that in the World Trade Center, some of the, uh, the Wall Street offices that are located there include Morgan Stanley, Credit Suisse, First Boston Group, uh, Commerce Bank, and Deutsche Bank, among others. Maria Bartiromo, I think we're going to... Back to the New York Stock Exchange, where, just a reminder, it goes without saying, there is no trading today, either there or anywhere in the United States, as far as the financial markets go. Uh, Maria? Yes, thank you, uh, Bill. And Sue, you know, I would only remind you, because you, you guys have been comparing this to Pearl Harbor, and it's funny because we were talking about this earlier uh, with some people down here, and, you know, one, one comment that I keep getting from people is the fact that in Pearl Harbor, that was a military base that was uh, attacked, whereas this is a civilian uh, area. So many uh, civilians uh, were impacted. So this is uh, being looked at as much worse than the Pearl Harbor uh, uh, attack. So I just would, would uh, point that out to you. Uh, here, the scene on Wall Street clearly is somber. I walked outside a little while ago. There are uh, 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 dust, white dust, this thick on the floor of debris and uh, smoke just uh, settling after the explosions. I mentioned to you earlier in the, uh, in the coverage that I myself witnessed two of the explosions. The first uh, one that I witnessed was when the uh, second plane went into the second tank Hour. And, and truly, it was out of uh, a movie, this plane going right in, putting a hole into the second tower. The second thing that I myself witnessed was the, the uh, further collapse of one of the towers, and there was a huge bang down on Wall Street. Everyone ran for their lives. Outside, the scene right now is quiet. There is no one around. People uh, uh, have looked for uh, places for security, places to hide away from this. Uh, the the uh, the uh, mood down here, we're waiting to find out any fatalities. Clearly, so many people who work uh, in the downtown area have friends and family uh, in the uh, two towers. I'm told that there were uh, 13,000 people in, in each tower. We're still waiting on the actual count. So again, I'm, uh, I'm here on Wall Street and uh, people are, are mulling about no trading today, obviously. Uh, we're waiting to find out more news and as we wait, uh, people are just uh, uh, sort of outside mulling about, but uh, there's not a lot of people outside. It's dark, the clouds continue to move above us. Thank you very much. Cal, what do you see? Well, this is uh, absolutely devastating. Uh, an incident like this will uh, will uh, tax every bit of resource in New York City, um, uh, particularly since so many of the uh, police officers and fire uh, firefighters on the scene were uh, injured. Um, let me let me let me stop you for a second. I want to talk specifically about what you suspect is happening, but I want to go to L.A. first. Frank Buckley is in Los Angeles with us. Frank, what can you tell us about what's going on there? Aaron, we just saw what appeared to be uh, the worst possible situation. The, the last thing that we want to show you, in fact, people arriving here at the airport, appear, apparently friends or family members of some of the uh, victims of at least one of the flights. Three flights were bound for Los Angeles, and uh, they are not arriving here, obviously. Now friends and family are beginning, beginning to trickle in. We haven't seen any until this moment, two people just arriving here at the airport. We can tell you that just within the last uh, 15 15 minutes also uh, this terminal has they have begun a process of evacuating this terminal and in fact all of uh, Los Angeles uh, Airport is being evacuated now we are told by uh, airport police who we just uh, spoke to uh, just a few minutes ago I'd like to, to let you hear from Lieutenant Howard Whitehead of the Los Angeles Airport Police as to the status here at uh, LAX 
and because we work with other agencies who are conducting uh, closures outside of the airport, I can't get information right now. Three flights were bound for Los Angeles that appear to have been involved today. What accommodations are being made for the friends and family of passengers? That's being handled by the uh, airlines. Uh, they're having a meeting now concerning that, so that information has to get from the airlines. So officially, Thanks very what much. are you starting at this point? In We're starting a, a total evacuation of the, of the airport. Will that include both uh, workers and passengers? Only key employees will remain at the airport. This is the entire airport that will be evacuated? Yes, ma'am. Why well, the evacuation? Because the evacuation has been ordered. Uh, I can't tell you why, but that's what it's, that's is how it stands now. Is there a threat to the airport? Uh, it's precautionary at this point. Have you ever seen anything like this before in Los Angeles? Not to my knowledge, no. And what is it, what is your, going to be your role, the police department's role in this? What are you doing? We're protecting the public. That's that's what our job is. Will roads in and out of the airport be uh, closed as well? Will people be able to get into the airport? Um, right now, this thing is fluid. We're, we're working as as we go with the changes. So I couldn't give you a definite on anything right now. How many that's, police officers more or less thanks are very much. here in the airport on a regular day? Uh, uh, other agencies involved, I couldn't give you an exact figure. Right now, there are other agencies. Yes, ma'am. That's all. Event ever a reoccurrence of, uh, of a tragedy and a crime of this enormity. Senator, we're seeing we've been seeing just a, for the last couple of minutes some uh, live pictures of uh, injured people arriving at uh, at a hospital in New York for treatment. There, obviously, it would appear based on what we know that the loss of life is going to be very great indeed. Um, your sense from knowing the Pentagon and knowing the area or where that. Uh, where that uh, airplane hit, um, fire still going over there. Do you have any, any, what can you tell us about that part of the building, number of people work there, that kind of thing? Well, as you know, the Pentagon is a very large building in which may work uh, to our benefit uh, here as opposed to the trade towers. Um, I, I can't make an estimate, but fortunately, the Pentagon is a very large building, so let's pray that the that the extent of the casualties has been uh, limited by that. Obviously, there's casualties, but uh, what staggers the imagination, as I heard you talking, is the uh, 50,000 people at work at the Trade Towers. It, this is, we, we pray for them and their families, and uh, it, it's a tragedy that, again, words have become inadequate very quickly when describing something of this nature. But I'm, I'm sure the president will lead us. I am sure that the president will, uh, will reassure the American people, and uh, all of us, all Americans, will commit ourselves to making sure that those who committed it uh, pay the heaviest price, whether they be governments or individuals, including governments that may have harbored groups that, uh, that were responsible for this. And uh, we will make sure that there's never a reoccurrence. And that's, I know that's no consolation to the grieving families, but I don't think we can, uh, we can do more, except uh, I am confident the President of the United States will lead and the American people can have bestow their confidence upon his leadership. Senator, what you're saying suggests, as others may have mentioned, that life in the United States will not again be the same anytime soon. Would you agree with that? Uh, I, t I totally, uh, I totally agree with that. And uh, and uh, again, um, it, it's it's incomprehensible and reprehensible, and nothing, none of us that I know of ever imagined something this enormity and well orchestrated, obviously. S Senator, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thanks, Brett. We now have uh, Brian Wilson, I believe, able to report to us on what he's been hearing. He's up on Capitol Hill. Brian, what are you hearing, buddy? Well, I'm hearing a lot of things, Britt. One of the things that we're hearing in the last few minutes uh, is from Senator Richard Shelby, who is a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, who told us there has been no advance warning. Uh, and they call this very well organized. And, uh, and he says that uh, they had no advance warning that it was coming at all. And usually they do have some indication uh, from the intelligence community. So. Uh, very surprised. They say, of course, they know about what happened at the Pentagon. They know about what happened at the World Trade Center. They're still trying to figure out exactly what happened in western Pennsylvania. But members of Congress are coming out and expressing uh, in the strongest terms that the intelligence community failed uh, to give them any advance warning and any kind of information about this, that it caught them completely off guard. One member of Congress, uh, Congressman Kurt Weldon of Pennsylvania, said, uh, the government has failed the people of this country, and that's an indictment on both parties. Rip? Uh, Brian, it, do, it does certainly seem that uh, these members of Congress uh, not only had no advance warning or that the government had no advance warning, they don't seem to know very much about what actually happened, do they? No, the, and, and Senator Shelby said we're still getting briefings, but uh, information is very sketchy and communications are scrambled. 
an indication that uh, they're not getting a good flow of information uh, and an overall sense that perhaps more will have to be done to shore up uh, the intelligence budgets in the days ahead, but also, uh, you know, just complete outrage, Britt, that, uh, that somehow uh, the millions and billions of dollars that we spend on intelligence in this country somehow let this one slip through the cracks. All right, Brian Wilson, thank you very much. John Scott, uh, that's it from here for the moment. One last note. Uh, we learned uh, a few minutes ago that uh, Secret Service agents had sprinted up the street from the White House uh, and cleared people away from a bag uh, that was sitting in the middle of the street there up in okay. uh, the corner of Connecticut Avenue and I Street right by the Army Navy Club there in Washington. It turns out apparently that uh, the bag has been found to be harmless. So um, one more of these uh, false alarms of which there have been a number and doubtless will be many more uh, has been put to rest. John. All right. Britt Hume in Washington. Thank you very much. Uh, you are looking uh, at the pictures of what is uh, left of the World Trade Center in lower Manhattan. Really not much. Uh, these, pictures, um, these pictures coming to you now live. We're going to show you uh, what happened earlier this morning, 9 o'clock Eastern Time. Uh, you can see there are people uh, who are leaning out the windows. At that point, they were hoping for some kind of rescue. There was smoke throughout the building. And they couldn't breathe inside, so they were uh, breaking out the windows of that building and hoping for some kind of rescue. Ultimately, a number of these people simply decided to end their misery and, and jumped. Uh, we are, we are um, going to get a, a, some late information now from Fox producer Dan Cohen, who uh, saw much of this going on. Uh, Dan, this is an awful, awful day. What can you add to what we've already seen? Well, uh, I got here, uh, as you were just saying, and the people jumping out of the buildings, that's about when I arrived. And uh, I'm also uh, an emergency medical technician, so I came down to see if I could help. Uh, I identified myself to uh, some of the people that were setting up the medical command posts. We had gotten everything set up. They were doing an amazing job of uh, instantly just having everything organized. As soon as we got the medical command post uh, set up, and I uh, was with a team of other uh, fire department EMTs who were about to go uh, off and treat uh, some people we had been assigned to treat. All of a sudden we looked up, heard, uh, before we looked up we heard uh, what sounded like basically a jet airliner landing right on top of our heads, looked up and the building was just coming down. We, uh, The entire command post that I was at ran, uh, just started running, uh, the wall of smoke came up behind us. and. I think most of us came out of it. Um, I lost the crew that I was with. They started setting up another command post, and then sure enough, about five minutes later, uh, well, we were treating some of the people that had gotten trapped the first time. Um, someone said that the tower's leaning, the tower's leaning. We all started running, and, and that's when the, the tower came down completely. Uh, I managed to get out, but a lot of the people uh, did not and were, were trapped back under the debris. Um, once the, the dust started to clear a little, we went in, took some firemen out. Uh, a lot of the firemen had already been in the building at that point. Um, we put as many as we could on some ferries uh, as we were by the water at this point, sent them over to Jersey City for treatment. Um, and from that point on, it's uh, pretty much been chaos. I mean, the, uh, the New York City Emergency Service has been doing an amazing job of, of trying to control the chaos, but every time... Uh, things get set up. Uh, there's either more explosions or more debris or more people come out of the rubble. All right. Dan Cohen, uh, a Fox News producer, also an emer emergency medical technician who has been in lower Manhattan trying to help the wounded on this catastrophic day. We can't overstate uh, the level of damage that's been inflicted here. It, it, it bears repeating, folks, that America is still standing. We are united. We are strong. And we will find out who did this. But for now, uh, there are, are thousands, probably, of casualties in uh, not only in lower Manhattan, but also in Washington, D.C. Let's uh, get the latest now from our Edie Donahue in the Fox Newsroom. Edie? Well, John, America may be standing, but we are certainly in shock. Uh, the Pentagon still in flames. Our own correspondent, David Schuster, there. Uh, an update now on exactly what happened this morning. The first shock came just about 8.50 Eastern time. That was when the first plane, an American Airlines plane that had been hijacked en route from Boston to L.A. with 92 people on board, slammed into the World Trade Center. We were just finishing up our morning show. We watched that 
and started speculating what was happening. Within 10 minutes, 15 minutes, the second plane had hit the second World Trade Center. That was the South Tower. That apparently, although it is not confirmed, United Airlines says it is missing Flight 175, which was uh, en route from Boston to Los Angeles. Witnesses later say that they saw people from the top floors on fire jumping to their death. At 9.45, the Pentagon was hit the south wall that apparently by American Airlines Flight 77 en route from Dulles, Washington, that is, to Los Angeles. That uh, is a 757 plane. It was carrying 64 people. That uh, ripped a 100 to 150-foot hole into the south uh, ring, the south wall there, the outermost ring of the Pentagon. Um, that, as we said, the, the fire sirens still wailing there. The Pentagon still on fire. At about 10 o'clock, uh, 80 miles southwest of Pittsburgh, this uh, United Airlines Flight 93 from Newark to San Francisco crashed. That's a 757 with 90 people on board. Now, what's interesting is that crashed just after the FAA ordered all United States commercial airliners to land at the closest uh, possible place. Right after that order was issued, that plane crashed. Later on, the South Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed. The North Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed. We do know that some people, even as high as the 90 92nd floor were able to be evacuated safely. In the U.S., for the first time in history, all United States commercial aircraft have been grounded. We know that some internationally inbound flights landed at uh, in Canada, but now Canadian airlines and airports have been shut down as well. All federal buildings and many, most, state buildings across America have been closed, and most major landmarks in the U.S. are closed. In New York City, bridges, tunnels, subways all shut down. At St. Vincent's Hospital, where many of the first victims of the World Trade Center uh, crash were taken, we have paramedics out on the street donating, soliciting blood from any donors they can find. They say the, the need is that great right now. Uh, as we say, right now, America seems to be in a quandary. We have had these attacks this morning. The president apparently is safe, but we do not know where he is. He has not made a statement since the official one this morning saying that this was a, a criminal act and that he would do everything to find out who had committed it. Uh, the enemy, though, at this point, unknown. No one has officially claimed responsibility. John, that's the latest. Back to you. All right, Edie Donahue in the Fox Newsroom. Thank you very much. It's not surprising that we haven't heard from the president yet. He took off from Florida, where his uh, scheduled events have been canceled for the day. He took off from Florida probably around 9.30 this morning. And uh, flying time to Washington being what it is, if, in fact, he is headed to Washington, uh, we wouldn't expect to hear from him for some few minutes now. Let's get the latest on that from our Britt Hume, our Washington managing editor. Yeah, we, John, thank you. We are uh, waiting to hear when the president will land and exactly where and when uh, he might have something to say about all of this. Um, a couple of things worth noting. Brian Wilson has just called to say that uh, he was co talking to Congressman Jim Moran, a Democrat of Virginia, who has received a briefing on Capitol Hill, and that uh, Moran says that what they know about that uh, plane crash near Pittsburgh uh, was they believe that was related to an attempted attack on Camp David. Of course, you know where there was an earlier f uh, f uh, uh, incorrect report that Camp David had in fact been attacked. All officials are now, all officials now are saying that is not the case. So we have a little bit more from what the intelligence community is apparently uh, telling members of Congress. Uh, it appears also that uh, fighter jets are now escorting Air Force One, which would be a standard precaution under a circumstance like this. The last time I can recall, uh, in my own experience, this happening was when President Bush the first uh, flew down to a drug summit in the nation of Colombia, where, of course, terrorism is a constant threat. Um, we are um, we're waiting, as we noted, for. Um, for further word from uh, from the White House, uh, where communications are obviously a problem because everybody's been evacuated as to where and when the president will land. So uh, that is basically the latest we have from here. I might call your attention to a quote. This is from Chris Yates, an aviation expert at Jane's Transport in London. Jane's, of course, is a company that publishes a number of defense-related related and uh, aviation and uh, maritime-related uh, publications, military-related publications. He called it the most auda audacious terrorist attack ever taken place in the world. There you go. That cannot and, uh, be Rita over. Cosby, by the way, is, uh, is, uh, has something to report as well. Rita's been uh, staying in touch with us by telephone. She's in our air. Rita, what do you know?
Well, Brett, I'm told by the FAA that at this point, 22 international flights have been diverted to Canada, and there are 50 flights over the United States. Remember, we're in a full-fledged ground stop right now. This is the first time in U.S. history that they have done such a ground stop, but we are told that there are 50 flights still in the air trying to reach their locations here in the United States in order to land immediately. There are also two international flights from Europe in which the pilots have not responded, and that is drawing concern from U.S. These are flights that were en route to the United States from Europe, and the pilots have not responded to the FAA, so they're trying to find out if those two planes may be in trouble. Also, law enforcement uh, sources are telling us, and this is interesting, that there was word put out through an Arab newspaper about three weeks ago that bin Laden himself, the mastermind behind the East African bombings, the uh, embassy bombings there in East Africa, that he apparently did put out word about three weeks ago saying that he was planning an unprecedented attack against U.S. interests. Since that time, they got other information that there may be some sort of attack against U.S. possibly governmental facilities. And then, as we know, on Friday, the State Department did put out a worldwide caution uh, basically telling U.S. Uh, citizens and also particularly government and military officials that they should be in a heightened state of alert. But I will tell you from talking to law enforcement sources, I talked to them minutes after the uh, two planes rammed into the World Trade Center building this morning, the Twin Towers, that they were very stunned, that they said, look, we had gotten word that there may be some sort of attack, but we had no idea it was going to be on U.S. soil, no idea that it was going to involve airliners and so forth. I will tell you also law enforcement sources do know that uh, Osama bin Laden, right now they believe he's sort of the prime suspect. They have no idea who's behind this, but they are looking at him because they do say that he and his men did a lot of training, in fact, where they did practice hijackings, where they did have pilots who were on their staff. And in fact, we've reported earlier that three people involved in the East African bombings were actually pilots, and that's sort of part of their training. And they get some of that in Afghanistan, also Iran, and a number of other countries. So this is sort of part of their training to prepare for something like this. But law enforcement sources are telling me, and these are intelligence officials, that they were really stunned by today's development. All right, Rita, thank you very much. Um, it's worth uh, perhaps also adding to this, uh, John Scott, that the North American Air Defense Command, NORAD, is uh, controlling the U.S. aircraft that are in the air, including those that are, uh, that are escorting Air Force One. So, so um, you, give an, you get an idea from that just how seriously this threat is being taken by the U.S. military. Back to you in New York, John Scott. All right, Britt Hume, thanks very much. This was supposed to be an election day in New York. Primary elections were scheduled for mayor here and other offices. Uh, those elections have been canceled. A couple of other more mundane matters considering all that's gone on. Ma Major League Baseball has canceled its scheduled games for tonight. All those games are canceled. Uh, let's listen to one of the witnesses from Lower Manhattan now recount what he saw. This is unedited tape. All right, we're having a little trouble hearing the audio there. Uh, as you can see, this is very important at the moment. And again, I don't mean to say this in melodramatic terms. Where is the President of the United States? Yeah, the President of the United States led, I know we don't know where he is, but pretty soon the country needs to know where he is. And it seems to, I think, for me anyway, I apologize, uh, the President needs to talk to us. He left Florida a couple of hours ago. Um, and our people in Washington are clearly listening and, and checking this as, as best they can. But one of the important factors at the moment is that the political leadership in the country um, be present as Governor Pataki was. Governor uh, Mayor Giuliani of New York you know, made an appearance on the street and was caught on where is like everybody else, but Governor Pataki came out and, and basically told the citizenry of New York in a variety of different ways, I assume, just exactly what they're trying to do. Now, here's a, here's a bulletin about the President's whereabouts. The, Bush, the President is about to make a statement at Barksdale Air Force Base shortly. Barksdale Air Force Base is in Louisiana. So, if this is accurate, and we'll check with Claire Shipman and our other reporters at the White House and John Cochran, if he can, in, in Florida at the moment, who's with the president today. The president's not coming back to Washington at the moment. We'll leave that for just a second. We'll talk a little more about this business of the aircraft and the fuel. We're trying to figure out why, or why would a plane going from Newark to San Francisco, Boston, Los Angeles be involved in this? It could have been any plane, though, right? It could have been, but when you consider the advantage to a terrorist, here you have a transnational flight. It's going to be a larger aircraft in each case, but 
and this is the key, because we had speculated earlier, was there some additional explosives laden in these planes to, to cause these incredibly large explosions? It appears who's ever planned this has picked cross-country flights that would have the maximum amount of fuel you could carry on a domestic flight. Flights going from one end of the country to the other. The kind of jet that if you slammed into a building would ensure the maximum uh, fire and explosion possible from any flight that you could have chosen. Again, Newark to San Francisco, Boston to LA, Dulles to Los Angeles, uh, Washington to LA, Boston to LA. Um, the planes that are being looked at in this, uh, in this attack today mm -hmm. were apparently, or you could speculate, chosen for, to give the terrorists the very biggest bang uh, for their effort. Mm -hmm. And it's a very interesting point you make because again, our assumptions tend to go when we see huge explosions like this none of us understanding visually the power of explosive that that there were explosives on board and so you're quite right they may indeed have it may indeed have been the aircraft explosion. I mean John Nance could help us with this but when you hear the the amount of fuel um, very flammable uh, aeronautical fuel that's loaded onto a plane for a 3,000 mile trip or something um, that's going to give you quite an explosion. Uh, flight 800, which was an international flight, uh, okay. to those who saw it, was an incredible explosion. And John, if you'd sit, sit at your station for a second, I'm just going to go and try to check one piece of information, and in, the, in that period of time, we're going to try to give you a little better sense of, of, uh, of what's... Of the, of, the, of the disaster at the Trade Towers today. Here, here's something we've compiled, and we compile it as we go along. I was standing next to One World Trade Center and then all of a sudden I heard rumbling and we all started running away from it. The glass like blew out and threw me onto the sidewalk and I, I couldn't see for like 20 seconds. And then I started seeing vaguely the street and I, I just started walking and I started, my eyesight came back. I see you're, you're bloody, you have dust all over you. Yeah, it was bad. It was like a dust storm or something, like I couldn't see anything. How badly are you hurt? I have no idea. As soon as he got hit, I was thrown to a window. So I was very lucky to get out. There's a lot of people that didn't get out. There's a lot of people coming down the stairs, burnt up. It's, it's, it's bad. So we just come out of Tower 1. We're walking towards Broadway. They're saying, move along, move along, move along. I looked up as soon as we got across the street. I looked up. I saw the building start, the tower start to buckle. I just turned and ran, ducked down, put a jacket over my head. Three or four of us huddled together, and uh, it was... Uh, just black everywhere. Were you covered? Were you hit with debris? No, 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 no. But I mean, I was ducked behind a subway cover. So I put it, you know, with the jacket over, the three of us, you know, all of us huddled together. There was, you know, dust and whatnot everywhere, but it was. The second building has just come down. The second, everyone's being asked to get down. Come down. Can't even look at it because all I can see are people. I don't see a building, I see people. People hurt. Children without mothers and fathers tonight. <laughs> if you're just joining us, you probably already know the World Trade Center towers, the Twin Towers, the New York landmarks have collapsed and are gone. The Pentagon has been hit by a, a airplane, a series of hijackings apparently today um, at the root of this. What we know is Hundreds, if not thousands, are injured, uh, no count on the deceased yet, and that the investigation, a massive investigation, is just beginning to unfold. But John, uh, the re I stepped aside there, uh, among other things, the moment to try to get some sort of sense from people who talk to, because as soon as this happens, people begin to think about a response. We don't expect a response to come in, in the immediate future by any means, but I was just talking to Charlie Gibson. Uh, from Good Morning America, and and he'd been thinking about the same thing, that the response to this from the United States is going to have to be massive, have to accomplish something in some way, because so much of the response to terrorism before by a large nation such as this, which is not impotent, but very limited in, in its capacity to operate at this kind of level. You were mentioning earlier the attacks against Osama bin Laden's training camps in Afghanistan. In retrospect, they spent, as you pointed out, more than a million dollars per cruise missile. I forgot how many they sent. They didn't get anything. They didn't get anything. They didn't do anything. So it's a very, it's an enormous challenge for for a powerful nation to uh, to to respond in a, in an effective way. And the Pentagon is still burning. And today, the World Trade Center towers have gone. Uh, Diane Sawyer.
is, is down uh, in Times Square at the moment, and among other things, I think has been trying to get some grasp of the number of casualties involved. It must be very difficult, Diane. It's impossible, Peter, no matter how many people you call. And of course, no matter what the facts we get now, one can only imagine what the facts will be later. I want to give you a sense of what it's like here in Times Square right now. Because if you look outside, we have hundreds upon Roger. hundreds upon hundreds of people standing outside, just stopping still, a kind of respectful witness, looking up at the screens where we're broadcasting the pictures. They can't hear the sound. They are simply looking at the wordless horror and standing to show, in a way, respect. And I want to show you something else because people have been sent home from Times Square and across the way the construction workers who were building the Toys R Us building next door to us just hung their signs outside. God bless America and pray for families and victims. And we can only, of course, add to that that as crisply as we try to report what's happening here today, we join them. And this is not just another story, even for reporters who have been trained to do this for so long. A few things to add since this morning. We were on the air, of course, live when suddenly we get word of that first explosion at the World Trade Center, the first building. And initially, of course, we didn't know if it was an accident. We didn't know what had happened. And then we were on the air live when the second plane came in and the second plane hit. And I want to show you now. This is what we were seeing live on the air. And as you've expressed before, Peter, the combination of disbelief and horror and simple prayer for somebody to save the people who were inside that building is all anybody can do as an entire network is broadcasting live something so unimaginable. I have talked, as you all have, and as George Stephanopoulos reported, to the people who were inside as these scenes were taking place. We now see the first collapse, which of course took place about 10 a.m. Eastern time. And then it would be about 28 minutes later that we would see the second collapse of the second building. And while we're watching the scene, each person desperate, desperate to stop this tape and go and do something. All we can do is relive the horror each time we see it. I have talked to people who are inside the building, one of them Fran Martin, who is the aunt of someone who works here at ABC, and she was saying that the first experience inside the building was that earthquake-like feeling a number of people have mentioned. And then something else, in an eerie, silent, uh, kind of mournful foliage, you saw paper just wafting out in all directions. And it was so mysterious to everyone. They couldn't imagine what had happened. The paper was scattering. And we've now read some three miles out, way across the river, the paper from those floors. As they came down the stairs, we're told that people were remarkably calm, were remarkably respectful of each other as they were making their way down, even though a number of them had lived through that bombing eight years ago. A number of them remembered what it was when the bomb went off in the basement of the World Trade Center. And of course, as we now know, if the cyanide gas had not vaporized in those bombs, that it would have been a cataclysm even beyond what was experienced then, so they could all relive it as they were making their way down. Now we're watching the scenes as the building is collapsing and people are running from it. People are covered with this kind of spectral suit from the building's collapse itself. I want to point out again, and you've talked about it too, Peter, all the firefighters were immediately called on duty. All the firefighters immediately raced in from wherever they were to help out all the emergency medical service personnel. This was a great display of human concern and human consideration. And you've mentioned before, we have this report that 200 firefighters are now missing, and yet they have done everything they can. Every hospital is open, every hand is on deck, every doctor is standing by in the city of New York with um, 
all this courage and struggle and still heartbreak out there in the streets right now. So that's it from Times Square, Peter. Thank you very much, Dan. I remember uh, working uh, with Diane on the Millennium broadcast on New Year's Eve 2000. Diane had such a joyful time in, in Times Square. It is. Uh, whatever you think of New York in general, it is a place where people from around the world gather to express themselves. And so we'll go back there on, on occasion to, to get, some, you really get some sense of the world in Times Square. And President Bush has been on the phone uh, today to a variety of world leaders, um, uh, clearly discussing this with them at the highest possible level. And perhaps they're all as confused as the rest of us are as to what has happened, who perpetrated these acts of terrorism in the United States, and what is to be done in response. Though this is perhaps, we're only four hours since this actually happened, and perhaps it is not quite the time to begin to think about the precision of a response, but a response will be required of some magnitude that will mean something from the United States if one is able to, ever able to pin that down exactly who the perpetrators were. Uh, we told you that the president was in Florida this morning where he'd intended to talk about education today and was coming back to Washington. Um, he's made it as far as Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana where he landed um, about an hour and a bit ago um, just before noon Eastern time where he's made a statement to the cameras which we haven't got our hands on yet but the president uh, said that the president uh, said that freedom had been attacked but freedom will be defended and the president is in touch with his national security team and Compton ABC's Ann Compton who covers the White House for us for many years from us tells us that jet fighters that uh, jet fighters accompanied Air Force One and that as best we can tell uh, the Air, Air Force One was flying at a particularly high altitude. There are no planes taking off or landing in, or taking off in the United States at the moment with the, with the exception of Air, Swan, Air Force One, though the Federal Aviation Administration says at the moment that 50 known aircraft, this is actually a few minutes old, 50 known aircraft are all in the sky uh, within approximately 50 miles of their destination. So you can feel across the country that aircraft that were in flight are beginning to settle down. They were ordered to settle down by the FAA and to land at the nearest possible airport. And so that has begun to work out. Now in, in Washington, I think Claire Shipman uh, at, the, at the White House or near it has some further information about the president. Yes, Claire. Well, that's right, Peter. What, essentially, what we've learned is what he told the pool cameras a few minutes ago, and we're hopefully going to see in just a few minutes, but he said that the he and this government have taken steps to ensure the functioning of the United States government, that the U.S. military is on high alert at home and abroad. He said he has taken all appropriate security measures to protect Americans. He says freedom itself has been attacked and freedom will be protected. And finally, he also said he will hunt down and punish those responsible for this. Again, we're hoping to see him in person, but as you mentioned, it looks as though this may be the secure place that they've decided on for, um, for the president, at least temporarily, Barksdale Air Force Base in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. I'd be really curious, Claire, and I realize how difficult it is at the moment, whether or not there's not pressure, political pressure in Washington from the members of the president's own staff and cabinet for him to, to, to show up soon. Uh, in front of the country and assure them beyond his statement that freedom has been attacked and freedom will be defended, of course, because it wasn't defended this morning, well, I think whether or not the president will be seen in command in a more vigorous way. I think you're absolutely right, and I'm sure it's a delicate balance right now between the Secret Service and those who are trying to protect the president, keeping him out of sight and someplace secure, and, and his political advisors who would clearly like to see him make a statement. You saw how quickly he did it this morning, as brief as it was, and certainly a piece of tape that we're going to see in a, in a few minutes, we hope, um, is, not, is not what they would like to see the president uh, doing right now. They would like to see him making something of a more formal statement. But again, it could be a number of hours before the president is back in Washington and prepared to, to talk to us from that forum. Okay, thanks very much, Claire. We'll come back to you anytime you, anytime you want. And again, none of us should be surprised at what's happening. First of all, Secret Service is a huge, powerful, authoritative organization which takes these, the uh, president's safety and other members of the senior political leadership with deep and profound seriousness, but they have enormous power. And so if you're talking between a senior political official, the president, a secret service official of equal stature at the moment, who's going to win that argument at the moment? And this is particularly true in a situation which continues to unfold because while the devastation, the, 
the uh, the perhaps the grand the greatest devastation has occurred in New York City tomorrow morning. It's this morning. It's also occurred in outside Washington at the at the Pentagon, and and the the tension is there all across the country because not only were the United Nations and various government buildings evacuated here in New York City, but the Sears Tower in Chicago, the tallest skyscrapers in Boston and Cleveland and Minneapolis, and the Space Needle in Seattle. So the, uh, the psychological effect on people in the country is huge. It may indeed be settling down after several hours, but the president and his response to this is also part of the psychological package because the country looks to the president on occasions like this to be reassuring to the nation. Some presidents do it well, and some presidents don't. But ABC's Ann Compton is with the president at the moment, and we have her on the telephone. Annie. Peter, it has been a frightening couple of hours for President Bush. We took off in Air Force One from Florida, where he first got word of this. And we literally, Peter, have been flying at well over 40,000 feet uh, west. The White House unable to tell us where we were headed or how long it would take. There were jet fighters off the wing just out of our sight until we landed. And the president has spent the time on board the aircraft talking not only to world leaders but to the vice president, uh, to his cabinet. He even checked in with Mrs. Bush uh, trying to get more information. We were high enough so that the Air Force was actually able to get some television signal. Uh, we don't know much about what's gone on on the ground, but he has been able to see some of it on a very fuzzy uh, television picture. We landed here at Barksdale Air Force Base. This is near Shreveport, Louisiana at about 11.45 Eastern Time. We were not allowed to use cell phones or give you any indication of where we were until local people noticed the plane on the ground. The president has just made a statement, Peter, a very emotional one, saying that freedom has been attacked, but freedom will be defended, saying that America's military is on its highest state of alert. World leaders have been uh, assured that the U.S. will do whatever it takes to protect America and Americans. Frankly, Peter, I thought the president not only looked grim, very solemn, but his eyes looked somewhat red. Annie, let me ask you a couple of questions, if I, if I may. First of all, the president was on a, on a education trip, ostensibly, in Florida today. How much of the national security team was with him? Uh, this is actually a skeleton team with him on a short, uh, it was a trip that lasted only about 24 hours. He was just making his last appearance before returning to Washington. And Carl Rove, one of his senior counselors, is with him. Uh, and his press secretary, Ari Fleischer, but none of the national security apparatus, such as Condoleezza Rice, who would ordinarily travel with the president on a more substantive trip. But on Air Force One, of course, he has the full resources of communications, uh, but he does not have the full team with him. Well, let's talk about this for a second, because when the president took off from Florida and went immediately to 40,000 feet, and I believe actually got a fighter escort for part of the way, it reminds one a little bit of what it was like in the Cold War, because the Cold War, there was always a provision that the senior members of the government, president included, could in fact run the country from a command center in the sky. Is Ab that basically what's happening this morning? Absolutely. In fact, the U.S. used to have five aircraft, now Air Force One. Let me know if we're being taken out of here. Uh, we may be scrambled out of here. Okay. Are we leaving? Okay. Peter, the, we are leaving. And Where I are you going, Annie? Peter, I have no idea. They have not told us. They have kept us. Uh, uh, we don't even know whether we'll be able to see the president or travel with him, but we are told that he's been traveling. He will continue. They are still quite worried about his own security. Off you go, and Anne, thanks very much for Thank a you. very, very full report on on the state of, and, and perhaps even a little bit of the, of the uh, mental condition of the president at, at the moment, and we cannot state it often enough. Uh, the country looks to him, and so he may have stopped at Barksdale Air Force Base in, in, in Louisiana, which is just where Arkansas and Texas and Louisiana all, all come together uh, at an Air Force Base uh, out of the way, and he may be safe at 40,000 feet in, in, in Air Force One, but before long uh, the country is going to expect him to be back in Washington to send, if not only a message, not just a message to those of us in the nation, who look to the president for some sense of political national stability, but also to the other parts of the world where these enemies of the United States, with whom we've, whom we've talked quite a lot about today, at the moment must surely think they have the United States on the run to some extent. 
And while the Taliban, the political leadership, military, pol political, military, religious leadership in, in Afghanistan said this morning that, uh, that they condemned this and had nothing to do with it, and it could not have been Osama bin Laden because he wasn't sophisticated enough to do it. It had to be a country or a government, certainly. And while the chairman of the Palestinian Authority, Yasser Arafat, came out and put as much distance as they could between th them and, and the Palestinian people, this active in the Palestinian people, the president needs to be on station to talk it. As does the mayor of New York, and Mayor Giuliani is with us at the moment. Mr. Mayor, can you hear me? I can, Peter. Mr. Mayor, I saw you several times on the street today, and it, it looked like you were deeply sharing the horror that all of us feel. But I'd really appreciate, aside from on top of uh, your sentiments about all this, give us some sense of what's going on. What, what is going on now is a massive uh, rescue effort. We have thousands of police officers and firefighters in all of Manhattan trying to rescue as many people as we possibly can. Uh, there are still a lot of people there that are injured, hurt, dazed, and we're trying to get them out. And we're mobilizing all of our fire, police, and emergency resources to do that. The governor has alerted the National Guard, and they're being deployed. And good afternoon. I'm Keith Coons, along with Darren Kramer from News Channel 8. We want to keep you updated on this uh, terrible day of uh, terror and tragedy in America. I uh, want to tell you about what's happening locally here in Connecticut, and there is a, a good deal going on at this hour. Bradley Airport, like the other airports in America, shut down right now. They've got bomb-sniffing dogs there. State government shut down, and we are all watching this bizarre day unfold. Absolutely. N yeah, News Channel 8's Alan Cohn is in New York City in Manhattan right now, uh, watching the view from there. He's on the telephone. Alan, what can you see? Yeah, and I can tell you I'm on uh, Broadway at West 170th Street as a constant crowd of people walk north away from the chaos of downtown Manhattan. They are trying to escape this, uh, this island anywhere they can, going north to all the, the bridges. And we could tell you at the uh, bridges and roads leading uh, out of Manhattan, it is a chaotic scene that you could imagine the traffic and the number of people trying to leave the city. But there are also a lot of people trying to get into the island uh, in Manhattan. And for the most part, police have closed down all the bridges uh, into the borough of Manhattan. All they are letting in, for the most part, are emergency vehicles, police, fire, doctors, and nurses, because as we are hearing and seeing, there could be tens of thousands of people who are uh, injured or dead from uh, this morning's uh, terrorist attack on the, uh, on the World Trade Center. As I look to the south on Broadway, all I could see is white smoke rising into the air uh, where the World Trade Center used to be, and uh, all I could tell you is a native New Yorker, someone who has um, grown up in this city and, and in the suburbs, uh, looking down to the south and all, not seeing the World Trade Center is, uh, is uh, surreal, it's terrible, and it's uh, just an incredible scene here as people try to leave uh, Manhattan. It's almost unimaginable. Uh, Alan, thank you. We want to go uh, now live to Aaron Cox. And you talked about the uh, the Metro North situation and how many people are leaving Manhattan, trying to get out of Manhattan at, at this hour. And Aaron is live at the uh, the train station in Stanford. And Aaron, uh, what is the scene uh, uh, there right now? Keith, we just had a train pull in from New York City. Not that many folks got off it, but I want to show you the latest development. Sean's going to pan over. Look behind me. They've got ambulance crews here, EMS technicians, all ready for folks who may be getting off the train. Maybe their injuries weren't serious enough to warrant treatment in New York City, which is under siege with critically injured people. But they are ready here to help anyone who gets off the train who may have difficulty breathing, perhaps high blood pressure or whatever. But they're here and they're ready. We've also seen two priests come down to the train station, Roman Catholic priests. I've also seen two nuns come here. Let's show you some pictures from earlier this morning when the last train to get out of New York City, the 937, arrived here in Stanford at about 10. 40 this morning people just trying to hug each other they got off they were very relieved to be here um, they're trying to use their cell phones that they were unable to use in New York City to let people know they're okay many people said it was scary getting out of Grand Central people were trying to cram themselves into trains here what some of those folks had to say about getting out of the city today I was on the phone I heard what sounded like a jetliner going down then I heard a crash I thought I assumed the jetliner had gone down in the river, uh, which is the flight pattern. I looked out the window, I didn't see anything. And then I looked below and I saw people around the World Financial Center 
or looking up at the tower. I looked at the tower, I saw the uh, south tower number two was all uh, in flames. You could see where the first plane hit and the smoke coming out. And then um, I was standing there, we were just, we were like in shock, and I was just standing there and I saw the second plane come in from the right. You know, it was just, it was just like, it was weird, it was just surreal. I was in New York on Fifth Avenue and it was, it was just crazy. I mean, we could see it from the street, just clouds and smoke coming from the building. It was horrible. So all these poor people. Now, right now, there is no set schedule of the trains running here from Stamford north to New Haven. That is the only direction they are running, but it's no set schedule. It's a little bit confusing. Folks going from one track to the other, then back to one. And Metro North also trying to grapple with getting folks home. As you know, Metro North's communications building had to be evacuated. So Keith and Darren will send it back to you. But at this point here at Stanford train station, they're bracing for folks to come in and hoping that they can get them home from this harrowing day in New York City today. Back to you. All right, Aaron. Been a, a very long day for a lot of people people and uh, only just beginning for many people as well. Yeah, just over an hour ago now, Governor Rowland uh, talked to the media and the people of Connecticut right. uh, from the State Armory and uh, News Channel 8's Mark Davis is there with that. Mark? Good afternoon, Darren. Good afternoon, everyone. The governor uh, told us uh, that the highest priority is to help Connecticut residents leave Manhattan. And to that, uh, Transportation Commissioner James Sullivan announced that uh, although train service had been suspended for a while, uh, full service had resumed by about 11.30 a.m. this morning, leaving Grand Central Station, uh, coming back to uh, Stamford uh, and New Haven and that that service uh, has resumed and will continue to resume until at least 8 o'clock tonight. In addition to that, the State Department of Transportation has said that it is adding additional buses from the train stations in Connecticut uh, to help Connecticut residents uh, leave. Now, the approximate number of people who commute on the train alone from Connecticut to Manhattan is about 28,000. Of course, thousands and thousands more commute on the road. Uh, and there's no way to get to Manhattan now because the bridges are closed, but of course the road is open and extra troopers are on the highway. All road construction has been canceled to expedite any exit from Manhattan on Interstate 95 back here into New England. Uh, the governor also uh, announced uh, that several planes uh, from New York airspace had been diverted to Bradley and will be parked there on the tarmac. We don't have any official number, uh, but uh, Transportation Commissioner Sullivan said a number of planes uh, were brought there. The governor closed down all state office buildings and federal buildings uh, were ordered evacuated also. Uh, that happened uh, between about 9.30 and 10 o'clock this morning. The state armory here uh, was activated and the National Guard activated at approximately 20 minutes after 9, about 10 or 15 minutes after the second airplane hit the second tower at the World Trade Center in Manhattan. Uh, we are also told that the eight Huey Air National Guard helicopters uh, of the Connecticut Air National Guard have been dispatched and are available to New York uh, for any service required. Command aircraft in Bloomfield apparently has offered three of their uh, famous Skyhook uh, aircraft uh, for Manhattan for uh, evacuations and for removal of debris and things like that. Uh, also, the Department of Children and Families, we understand, is sending uh, crisis team experts to the hospitals in southwestern Connecticut uh, to deal with the anticipated um, feelings uh, that families will have uh, about the possibility of injury or loss of a loved one. Uh, it may be quite some time before we know for sure, of course, uh, how many people have been injured or killed uh, from Connecticut. It may, in fact, even take days because of the devastation. But because of that, uh, the state is dispatching people from the Department of Family and Children uh, to the southwestern corner of the state. And uh, Darren and Keith, uh, I believe those are the most details I can give you from here at the State Armory right. as of this hour. All right, Mark Davis, live in Hartford. Thank you, Mark. All right, we have this uh, statement just in from uh, Connecticut's uh, senior U.S. Senator Chris Dodd, and it reads, quote, this is a tragedy of catastrophic and unimaginable proportions and an unparalleled, heinous, cowardly attack. My heart and prayers go out to the victims and their families at this most difficult and terrible time. Again, that's statement just released from U.S. Senator Christopher Dodd. All right, and the primary elections in Connecticut are still on today. They canceled them in New York State, but the primary elections are still on. And as you heard, hospitals all over the state are on standby, kind of self-imposed right. standby, because they don't know how many wounded will be coming Right, in. and they include, among others, you New Haven, the hospital of uh, St. Raphael's in New Haven, the Red Cross in Connecticut also on standby. Uh, anticipating what could be a, a flood of injuries and casualties from New York. And we are going to be watching uh, what's happening here in Connecticut. We're going to rejoin ABC now uh, to continue watching developments on the national scale.
We're still uncertain. There's still an unknown number of aircraft uh, who've been ordered to land that haven't managed to get down to the ground. We're not absolutely certain that there are any aircraft on, on, on missions, if you will, uh, which are unaccounted for, despite the fact there was a report some time ago that the aircraft outside, which crashed outside Pittsburgh, may have been on its way to Camp David. I emphasize that that's reporting um, of which we're absolutely not very sure at all. But ABC's Barry Serafin is at the Capitol at the moment, and we've been told for some time that the Senate leadership there was going to be sent to a secure location. Do you have a current status report, Barry? Well, Peter, we're not sure exactly what we're seeing here, but a few minutes ago, about 10 minutes ago, a military helicopter landed here behind me on the west lawn of the White House. And then a large group of people were seen to walk out to it, get on board, and fly right above us, over the mall in the direction of the Pentagon, perhaps. Uh, my guess, and it's only a guess at this point, is that these were members of the Senate leadership and the House leadership, and perhaps members of the intelligence committees, on their way to a briefing to try to figure out what in the world is going on today. Uh, is there, uh, were you able to walk up around the hill? No, Peter. Uh, we, like everybody else, have been kind of pushed off of the hill. They've got a cordon for blocks now around the Capitol. In effect, they've sanitized that area. So we're about uh, four blocks from the foot of the hill here. And, and do you have any sense of, uh, of an, was there a sense of anticipation there? People sort of waiting for something to happen at the Capitol? Well, uh, there is. Every time uh, any kind of aircraft shows itself, and there haven't been many, there have been a few government helicopters moving around. All eyes turn to the sky, as you might imagine. Precisely, Barry. Thanks very much. Barry Serafin, who's up at the, up at the Capitol. Um, one, of the things that, one of the things that is absolutely certain at the moment, which is to say that the chain of command in the country is very much in place. So you can just imagine yourself in some other country at the moment, anticipating, trying to anticipate, maybe even exhilarating at what's happening in the United States uh, at the moment and trying to, having some belief that you've disrupted everything. President's at 40,000 feet, just about to take off from Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana. We don't know where he's going, but I have to assume he's gonna go to Washington. Cannot have the president being seen to be running around the country. By the way, the baseball games have all been uh, postponed today. The entire Major League Baseball schedule has been postponed uh, for today as much as a mark of mourning and sadness for what happened in a variety of locations today. U.S. Uh, earlier on evacuated uh, embassies around the world. They're all quite familiar with that because uh, on any number of occasions in the course of a year you hear us say on the news that the State Department of the Pentagon has ordered a worldwide alert because something is going to happen or potentially going to happen to some kind of terrorist attack that's going to occur in some part of the world. The most recent uh, terrorist alert ironically was in Asia uh, over last weekend. Uh, in Japan and in South Korea, American embassies were put on alert because somebody somewhere in the military, uh, sorry, in the intelligence establishment believed there was some potential for an attack. And it's something government has to do. It's something government has to do. Government has no choice, it argues. A lot of times you'll hear people saying, well, they've put up a state of alert again and, and nothing happened. And so they just do it all the time. And it's very hard on Americans traveling overseas to be somewhere where there's a state of alert. But as John McCarthy, our uh, who covers the military establishment for us points out is something government is obliged to do, lest something ever happen and and there had not been an alert. Jack, John, are you there? John McKenzie? John McCarthy? John, Mc John McCarthy's here. Yeah, here. John, I'm sorry, it was you I was obviously talking about, not, uh, not John McKenzie. Um, this is, this, this is uh, I guess, what one notices more than else today. This was a place where there was no terrorism alert. Nobody, I gather, that you've talked today seemed to know anything. One of the things that they have been studying so scrupulously over the last several months is how Osama bin Laden and other terrorist groups operate, Peter. They felt that they had some ability to monitor critical communications from these groups. Um, I think it's going to be proved that the groups have learned some very important and deadly lessons uh, from past terrorist events and the way the U.S. has been able to monitor them. 
it seems quite clear in this instance uh, that they bypassed the normal methods of communicating and were able to organize this very complex operation in a way that basically escaped American detection. But John, I, I'm sorry, but I think a lot of Americans will hear you talking and, and, and be reminded that how often the government tells us how much more sophisticated it is and how much better able they are to monitor all this. They are able to better monitor it, Peter, but every time, and you and I know this because we have had conversations with high-ranking government officials about how much detail we put on the air. Uh, every time the news media puts on these details, it helps the terrorists to understand the way that our government goes about monitoring their communications. Uh, oftentimes, those communications intercepts are very sophisticated, but the terrorists are clearly adjusting. John, I wonder, by the way, on a, you know, on a slightly different subject in terms of today's disaster, whether you picked up reports of U.S. aircraft carriers being sent to New York Harbor to help in some way, maybe even to be floating platforms. Uh, I have not picked that up, Peter, but basically I'm standing on a highway at this yeah, point, I, I, so that, I'm, I'm not exactly plugged in. I, I appreciate that, John, and we benefit tremendously from your knowledge, so thanks very much. Come back at us when you... When you, when you think of something else you'd like to, to contribute. Um, we talk about, you know, the United States and Canada cooperated today in closing down the airports. A reminder to us that all Canadian airports, or most Canadian airports, at least major Canadian airports, are very close to the U.S. border. Uh, we learned just a short while ago that Israel today, the United States and Israeli relationships, so very close, um, closed all of its airspace to foreign aircraft today and evacuated many of its embassies and missions overseas. <coughs> In, in terms of the war against terrorism, the United States and Israel are seen by the terrorists and the potential terrorists and the people who would do one harm as partners in this. And so it's perfectly natural for the Israelis to be doubly and trebly on a state of alert today. We've now managed to get the tape of President Bush speaking at Barksdale Air Force in Louisiana on his way from Florida to, as you heard Ann Compton say, somewhere. We assume Washington. And here's what the president had to say when he was in Louisiana. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward, Earth. and freedom will be defended. Earth. I want to reassure the American people that full, the full resources of the federal government are working to assist local authorities to save lives and to help the victims of these attacks. Make no mistake. The United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. I've been in regular contact with the Vice President, Secretary of Defense, the National Security Team, and my Cabinet. We have taken all appropriate, appropriate security precautions to protect the American people. Our military at home and around the world is on high alert status. And we have taken the necessary security precautions to continue the functions of your government. We have been in touch with the leaders of Congress and with world leaders to assure them that we will do what is, whatever is necessary to protect America and Americans. I ask the American people to join me in saying a thanks for all the folks who have been fighting hard to rescue our fellow citizens, and to join me in saying a prayer for the victims and their families. The resolve of our great nation is being tested. But make no mistake, we will show the world that we will pass this test. God bless. Well, the president could not have spoken more accurately in that final remark there. A great nation is being tested. And the president reassures the nation and anybody else in the world who will hear this that the nation will pass the test. And there is no doubt about that, I think, in the United States of America. As horrible as this, these incidents are, and as tragic as Oklahoma City was, um, 
the great strength of the nation, you know, is always there. I, I recognize that's one man's opinion and doesn't, uh, doesn't account for the individual shock of individual families or, the, or intelligence or military establishments which have all suffered a grievous blow today in, in one way or the other. But it does say, I think, what people in most parts of the world believe, that as horrible as this is for the United States and its citizens, uh, the United States continues to be unquestionably the leadership of the world and the example in the world of freedom and democracy, uh, however much one may criticize it, ourselves included, on any given occasion or incident. It's interesting that in Oklahoma today, Governor Keating ordered all state office buildings closed, and the Oklahoma City Police created a one-block perimeter around the jail where Terry Nichols is housed. So again, you have an example of how people's minds work immediately. Was somebody going to try to spring Terry Nichols from jail or or was someone going to attack the jail in which Terry Nichols is housed, but in the wake of Oklahoma City and based on what's happened this morning, nobody should be surprised. Um, in, and the Associated Press has done a really good service here by checking with every state in the country so far. Gonna, as you watch this on the east coast of the United States, think about that in California, all airports were closed. Places like Knott's Berry Farm were closed today. The Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles was closed. The Library Tower, all closed. And the State Emergency, convened, State Emergency Committee convened, naturally, under Governor Davis to see that there was heightened security to all of the state buildings. In, in Florida, you know what happened. Walt Disney World was evacuated, closed its parks and shopping and entertainment complex. You're talking about the effect that this incident has all across the country. Airports were closed everywhere across the country, as we know, in, including in Georgia and Illinois, where the Sears Tower was also shut down in Chicago. And all state government buildings in Chicago and in, in Springfield, the Capitol, were closed down. Indiana, all the federal offices were put on alert. In Kentucky, where the southern governors were about to have their um, full scope of their annual fall conference, it was canceled. And obviously the governors of Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia, Louisiana, Mississippi all went home to their respective capitals because of this. In Louisiana, where the president has just left, the upper floors of the Capitol building were closed, the offshore oil port, uh, which handles the super tankers in the Gulf of Mexico, suspended operations. And we've said several times this morning that when you think about terrorism, you think about oil supplies. And so that was fairly natural. In Michigan, the tunnel between Detroit and Windsor, Ontario, was closed to car traffic. And we do know from other reporting that security was increased at all of the border crossings between US and Canada and between the US and Mexico. But in all the states where there are military bases, including North Carolina, um, all of the military bases prepared for a possible change in status, and you heard Governor Pataki of New York say a short while ago that uh, the National Guard from uh, various surrounding states will be brought in here to give some sense of, some sense of relief um, for the New York City Fire and Police Department who must just be going through a hellish experience at the moment. John Miller, first of, of all, you've been on the phone for a little while. Tell me what you got. Well, uh uh, as things have developed at the scene, there have been a number of things that have happened. First of all, nobody in city government can right now put a, a number, um, even a ballpark estimate on the number of injured and dead. What they've done uh, to try and deal with the large numbers they have is literally brought in students from NYU Medical School to help in the massive triage effort down there. The nearest hospital, uh, Beekman Downtown Hospital, uh, has lost steam power as a result of the explosion, which means they can't sterilize anything. So they've essentially become a mash center uh, and are feeding people out to other area hospitals. Another reason to get the National Guard in here quickly because they come equipped. Right. Um, another thing, uh, as New York City hospitals became overwhelmed, ferry boats began to shuttle victims across the river to New Jersey, to hospitals in New Jersey City and Bayonne. We saw, by the way, some ferry boats on the Hudson River a little while ago. So that was them ferrying casualties across the exactly. to New Jersey on the other side. Um, to I, I spoke to uh, some police officers that I know, police officers um, who used to work for me in the police department, who were at the scene, who gave the most incredible uh, descriptions 
first of all, police headquarters has been evacuated. There's a tiny skeleton Stone there. Shape. It's considered uh, a possible secondary target. They've moved police operations to another location, which we've been asked not to disclose, so that that doesn't become a possible target. Um, the police commissioner is there now trying to get together enough information uh, with the mayor and his people to, to actually brief us. Police precincts, and this is something eerie, Peter. We touched on this before about a, t a city, an American city in a free country going into lockdown. The 75 police precincts in New York have been sealed off in a one-block radius to traffic and pedestrians. Um, All of which, I have to tell you, is alarming but seems common sense. Yeah, it does. I mean, mm -hmm. on, on a day like today, uh, when nothing seems normal, such incredible things actually seem prudent. One of, the, uh, one of the officers I spoke to on the telephone who was there when the first building collapsed said he was standing across the street. He was assigned to find a, a senior FBI official um, to get a briefing for um, the top command and that the building fell. He said, I, I, I ducked behind a truck and I closed my eyes and hit the deck. He said, I waited 30 seconds thinking that was enough. Then I opened my eyes and it was night. It was complete blackness. He said, I began to crawl and crawl for more than a block. And then I picked myself up off the street, but I still couldn't see. He said, a kid who was outside um, the major dust actually saw him struggling for sight, went in there and pulled him out and brought him into the church at Barclay Street where he washed his eyes out with holy water to try and regain his vision. Um, he was covered with dust and soot. These the kind of human descriptions of the stories of, of people who were there at Ground Zero when the first building fell. Um, pressing for some kind of numbers, uh, they said, all we have is prelim preliminaries and they're too small. He said, uh, the Port Authority believes they may have between, between 10 and 20 cops involved in the building in the rescues that are unaccounted for. The fire department, and this may be a low ball number also, between 80 and 100 firefighters. Early, uh, an, earlier an earlier report said there were 200 firefighters unaccounted for. Unaccounted for uh, at this time, um, and between 12 and 20 New York City police officers. Again, soft numbers, um, but unfortunately, the estimates are that uh, rather than going down, they may go up. That's the fear. This is this is one of this is the occasion, not one of those occasions. This is the occasion when a member of the f police department, the fire department, or the military has got to respond only to the training. You just go into you just go into automatic, and you do what you're trained to be do. It was amazing to me uh, listening to the police radio traffic today, um, even as momentous disasters unfolded. I mean, the unspeakable. The collapsing of the Twin Towers, one after another, um, that while there was a high pitch to a lot of the voices and a little screaming and yelling, uh, the rapidity which, w with which calm was restored on the radio and they went back to uh, sending orders and continuing operations and acting in a logical manner, uh, you really do revert to your training as a second nature. As you look at this and you listen to John Miller and I thank you, John, for that. No one is better plugged into the police and firefighting apparatus in New York City than John Miller. He not only been a reporter for most of his adult life, but he worked, from, worked for the police department in New York for a while before he had the good sense to come back to journalism, and he is totally plugged in. But even, and, and when he talks about soft numbers here, it's because as you look at this disaster scene, and that's a live car picture, that is a live picture 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, four and a half hours after this actually occurred, and you're looking at the smoke and the dust still emerging from these, from the edges of these canyons in lower Manhattan, and the magnitude of trying to deal with these people, to deal with these people, extends to moving them across the Hudson River in ferry boats, the ubiquitous ferry boat in New York harbors, not as necessary as they were in the days of greater ship travel to the New Jersey side, and the Canadian Television Network, our partner, one of our partner television networks in Canada, is now reporting that American burn victims, victims from here, I'm not sure whether it's the Pentagon or here, but I suspect it's from here, are being transported as far away as Canada to Canadian hospitals there. And there you get some sense of how uh, difficult it is to get a real grasp of how enormous this is, other than to say as the mayor of New York and the governor of New York State both said to us a short while ago, I just don't want to touch the casualty figures as of now. Pierre Thomas, who's been with us for much of the morning, also reports from the FBI. And we may never know much more about 
one of the aircraft than this, that at least one of the planes this morning, we haven't got no more details on that, was able to communicate that it had been hijacked. In some cockpits, in some of the aircraft now being in Cuba's commercial service, there's a button you can hit that sends a code to your headquarters that says you've been, that says you've been hijacked, so you don't have to try to tell the hijacker that you're actually talking to headquarters. But that's as much as we know about one of the several aircraft today which were involved in attacks on the United States. Now, Diane Sawyer at Times Square um, has been trying, I know as best she can, to get some handle on casualties vis-a-vis -vis the people are pouring into hospitals. Diane? Right, Peter. Here's all I know, and it's kind of postscript to what John Miller was saying earlier. With Beekman Hospital, the closest hospital, as he said, has been relatively out of commission. But St. Vincent's Hospital, which is one of those in the next perimeter, 25 major hospitals in New York, this is one of the next closest, told us just minutes ago they had 184 <laughs> hospitalized two dead. Now again, we know that these figures are going to be changing almost minute by minute, so this is very early. But at this time, uh, and by now we're talking just minutes ago, 184 hospitalized, two dead. They said to us again, though, remember, remember that where the World Trade Centers used to be, there is now a mountain of rubble. We are talking 200,000 tons of steel. 425,000 cubic yards of concrete and 43,600 windows with all the glass in them now just lying on the ground. So the excavation has only begun, but 184 right now from St. Vincent's. Thanks, Diane, very much. And I, I must tell you, I feel a little embarrassed about trying to focus on casualties in numerical terms only because it will ultimately give us some sense of the magnitude of this attack on top of the buildings themselves being brought to the ground and similarly true at the Pentagon. So it, it, it we're not, nobody feels gruesome or uh, it's, not, it's not about the gruesomeness of the casualty figures, it is simply trying to get some sense of the magnitude in human terms rather than the physical terms which so much of us in the country saw just before our eyes. Before I talked to John and to Diane, we were I was just running there briefly through various different parts of the country where the ripple effect of these attacks uh, were felt in Las Vegas, for, for example. This is back to the Associated Press report, which they did a really good job pulling the country together. The security was increased at all of casinos on the Strip in Las Vegas, because if you think about it, for, for many for the enemies of the United States, uh, that kind of excess and is, uh, is seen as a symbol of the United States as well. The only place we could find all of the federal buildings open so far was in Vermont, where the federal buildings in Montpelier and Burlington were both open. And, you know, they have an atomic energy plant up there. And it was placed on a height, a uh, state of heightened security as well. Uh, whereas in Nebraska, uh, you'll see the first of probably many examples of this in the, in the hours and days ahead. State employees were asked if they would give blood because blood will be needed. There is a blood shortage in the United States, as we've heard time and again from the Red Cross. Um, it's almost at a, a state of crisis in terms of blood collection in the United States at the moment. And so on. A, and what do you need in a time like this? You need blood and you need plasma for all the people who have been, who have been hurt and damaged. And so that's important. And in Nebraska, uh, state employees were, were responding to requests for blood donations and at the Air Force bases out there, and then um, the security was heightened. And at churches all over the country, at churches all over the country, they're beginning to have these services, which will become part of the national fabric in the next couple of days as people pray for the victims and the hope, those we hope are survivors of this. Terry Moran is at the White House, which is his normal beat. He didn't go with the president to Florida today. It's often the case that if the president's doing a purely political trip. We ask him to stay home to give us a broader sense of things. Well, Terry, what's the state of the White House as of now? Well, Peter, the White House has pretty much been evacuated altogether. Just before it was evacuated, we are told that the national security team was taken to the secure situation room in there, but they are the only people in there. White House staff, most of the White House staff was told to go home. And the president, as you've heard, flew to Louisiana and is now en route. Uh, we don't know where. As he said, he is trying to make sure that the country knows that the government is still running. We've seen around town motorcades assembling outside the various 
cabinet departments, and we've just seen recently some traffic into the White House. So there is uh, some government activity, but uh, mm. without the president at the moment. Uh, Terry, there's a very small collection, very small collection of reporters and camera team, camera team on board. The president of Air Force One at the moment. I think the only reporter on board um, is Ann Compton, am I correct? Or certainly the only television reporter on board? Well, actually, Ann is in the radio seat today. The pool, as it's called, is flying with the president. Today, CBS News is the pool. It alternates every day. Right. Uh, this pool will travel with him wherever he goes, and he made that statement that we saw earlier to the pool. Uh, the rest of the press who was accompanying the president to Florida, we are told, is now on a bus because of the air traffic shutdown from Florida back to Washington. Uh, Terry, I wonder if from your perspective of our White House correspondent, whether you agree with me and certainly our political director, I think, who says that how the president now spends his time today, what he is seen to do is absolutely vital, not, not just to the country, but to him. Well, it's critical time for him. He said that the nation is being tested, the new president is being tested as well. But he has other restrictions on what he can do. That political mission he has to reassure the country and to show that he is leading it is actually secondary or even tertiary. The first thing is he has to keep himself safe. The Secret Service is going to insist that he be secured. And then second, he must remain in efficient strategic communication with United States forces around the world. That's undoubtedly why they took him to Barksdale Air Force Base in Shreveport. But you're absolutely right. The main thing he has to do for most Americans is communicate to them that he's in charge, that he intends to take control of this situation, and as he said, hunt down the people who are responsible for it and punish them. Terry, I know you want to go back to your reporting. Is there anything else you want to add at the moment? Well, Peter, it's just that this whole complex, which is usually a buzz with activity, which is uh, really a, uh, an office for hundreds of people, is now silent for the most part and an armed camp. And that is a very striking thing for all of us who go to work there every day. And, and what I notice is you're, you're to the south of the South Lawn. You're on the southern side of the White House. We very often see you broadcasting from the other side of the White House. Why are you way down where you are? Well, we've been cleared out of the North Lawn, which is where we normally broadcast from, and we are now, as you can see, south of the south ellipse of the White House. I can tell you that the evacuation of the White House itself, which has happened before with bomb threats and suspicious cars and packages, today did not proceed as orderly as it has. Uh, I was told by one of the White House staffers that their security official came in and said everybody should leave in an orderly fashion, and about a minute later an agent ran in and said, just run. Get out. Okay. Thanks very much, Terry. We'll come back to you. But uh, you get some sense from Terry Moran standing there, locked. Were trained pilots who hijacked these airliners. No, no question about it. Uh, uh, this is a very sophisticated operation. And uh, one would hope that there would be some clues and that our intelligence would pick them up. Uh, I will say again, though, that it's a, a very tough proposition to do. Admiral, how tough will it be then to formulate an appropriate response? We will be between a rock and a hard place here. We can go and bomb Osama bin Laden or somebody, as we did a few years ago after the bombings of our embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. But that really takes us on the other side of the law. It makes us terrorists if we don't really have solid evidence, which we did not in that case. On the other hand, if we pursue a law-abiding approach to this, it may take a number of years, uh, as it did with the World Trade Center previous attack, and which has resulted in the people who perpetrated that going to jail. Uh, the question is, will we be patient enough to do it by painstaking, sleuthing, legal means, or will we feel we've got to, to lash out? We've got to find a happy road in the middle here, uh, and I think be careful that we don't lash out too quickly without really solid evidence. Admiral, you know, there have been some people asking, is there any particular significance to why the attacks today? Is there anything about this date, September 12th, that should have uh, 
set off alarms. Do you know of any reason why today might have been the day? No, I don't. That uh, is a good thing to pr pursue, but I don't relate to September 12th in, in any way. Mm -hmm. Admiral, you didn't think you'd ever see anything like this in your lifetime, did you, sir? To see those towers uh, collapse is absolutely no. Uh, one almost wouldn't think it could be done to begin with. In the second place, uh, the probability of somebody being able to maneuver two airplanes into two of those towers was uh, in a short time of each other just is uh, almost beyond imagination. Sir, I thank you very much for your time. It's Thank you, Admiral. Truly. Uh, just getting information, a London-based Arabic newspaper, an editor of that newspaper, says he received a warning from associates of Osama bin Laden, but the editor said he didn't take them seriously. I'll get you more information on that in just a minute. Uh, the, uh, we just wanted to let you know, Rick, after the meeting with D.C. Mayor Tony Williams and top city and police officials, the district is now under a state of emergency officially, under a state of emergency, the nation's capital, the District of Columbia. Mayor says just wants to be ready in case of any other incidents. The state of Virginia is also under a state of emergency, which allows the governor to call up troops, and he has put the uh, Virginia National Guard on alert and has called up 300 Virginia Air National Guard they're on standby as well in the event, and especially uh, the governor was saying to cover ports along the East Coast to protect them in the event of still further attacks. Let's go back. Uh, it was just a short time ago that President Bush spoke to the nation from an Air Force base in Louisiana. Let's listen to that. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward. Earth. And freedom will be defended. Earth. I want to reassure the American people that full, the full resources of the federal government are working to assist local authorities to save lives and to help the victims of these attacks. Make no mistake. The United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. I've been in regular contact with the Vice President, Secretary of Defense, the National Security Team, and my Cabinet. We have taken all appropriate, appropriate security precautions to protect the American people. Our military at home and around the world is on high alert status. And we have taken the necessary security precautions to continue the functions of your government. We have been in touch with the leaders of Congress and with world leaders to assure them that we will do what is, whatever is necessary to protect America. And Americans. I ask the American people to join me in saying a thanks for all the folks who have been fighting hard to rescue our fellow citizens and to join me in saying a prayer for the victims and their families. The resolve of our great nation is being tested. But make no mistake, we will show the world that we will pass this test. God bless. That was President Bush speaking earlier today from Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana outside of Shreveport. Just wanted to bring you up to date on what havoc this terrorist attack has wreaked on our transportation system. Greyhound is announcing it's halted intercity bus service throughout much of the nation in the wake of the terrorist attacks against the U.S. All bus service has been canceled in the Northeast. All service canceled along the Northeast line from Cleveland to Columbus, Charleston, West Virginia, Richmond, Norfolk, and Virginia. And of course, Greyhound has been operating out of Union Station these last couple of days while their terminal is under reconstruction. And uh, Union Station, all rail traffic out of Union Station is halted.
The Virginia Hospital Center has been warned to expect more victims from today's terrorist attack on the Pentagon. A hospital spokesperson confirms 26 people are currently being treated for injuries. They range from cuts and bruises and burns to more serious conditions that require surgery. The spokesperson says the injured have been brought in by both ambulance and by personal cars. One woman says she jumped behind the wheel of someone else's car and drove an injured woman to the hospital because she knew the way. She says immediately after the incident, people began tending to the wounded in the inner center courtyard of the massive Pentagon complex. When word spread of a possible second attack on the way, the victims were carried through the building to the outside. Meanwhile, in Ova Alexandria Hospital, they report they have 10 patients, nine in fair condition, one critical. George Washington University, two patients, both in stable condition. Seven patients at the Washington Hospital Center. Leaders of the United States Congress, uh, both parties and both houses of Congress moved to an undisclosed location. Now to our correspondent at the Pentagon, Bob Franken, who is, I believe, at a safe distance there from what's been going on. Bob, please bring us up to date. Well, we're on the east side of the Pentagon, as you can see, Judy, and you can see over my shoulder that smoke continues to billow, uh, smoke that is sometimes thick, sometimes a little dissipated, but we're talking about about four and a half hours after a plane, it uh, is described as probably being uh, a jumbo jet size plane, crashed into the Pentagon about 9.20 this morning. We now want to show you what it looks like on the west side. Uh, this is video that was shot by Vito Maggiolo, who is an assignment editor and producer for CNN, who was able to get video. You can see that firefighters there are fighting in an area, rings four, five, and six, on the west side of the Pentagon. Uh, Vito says that it was an area, in his estimation, that was about 30 yards wide and about 10 yards deep into the building. Uh, the uh, firefighting was hampered, he says, because inside the building, sprinklers, standpipes, other forms of hydrants were damaged. Uh, there's an estimate that several hundred firefighters and emergency workers are there at the Pentagon. We're also told, of course, that there have been evacuation efforts throughout the day. We can see those. We do not have an estimate in the number of casualties. I can tell you that from our vantage point, we have seen a constant parade of casualty units, military casualty units, civilian ambulances, fire engines, and the like going to the Pentagon. There of course have been casualties but as I said we don't have any sort of estimate about that now. Now we do also have somebody to talk with us who was an eyewitness to the actual crash. He was watching from Arlington, Virginia which is a suburb over his name is Tim Timmerman. Mr. Timmerman are you with us right now? I sure am. You're a pilot. Tell us what you saw. Well I was looking out the window. I live on the 16th floor overlooking the Pentagon in the, the corner apartment so I have quite a panorama. And being next to National Airport, I hear jets all the time, but this jet engine I heard was way too loud. I looked out to the south, to the southwest, and it came right down 395, right over Columbia Pike. And as it went by the Sheraton Hotel, the pilot added power to the engines. I heard it spool up a little more. And then I lost it behind a building, and then it came out, and I saw it hit right in front of it. It didn't crash, it didn't appear to crash into the building. Most of the energy was dissipated in hitting the ground but I saw the nose break up, I saw the wings fly forward, and then the conflagration took, you know, just engulfed everything in flames. It was horrible. What can you, what can you tell us about the plane itself? It was a Boeing uh, 757 American Airlines, no question. Uh, you say that it was a Boeing, and you say it was a 757 or 767. Seven, it's seven, hard. Five, 757. 757, yeah, which American of course Airlines. is one of American Airlines, one yes, of the um, new generation of jets, and of right. course, it, uh, it, it was not. It was so close to me. I could. It was like looking out my window and looking at the helicopter. It was just right there. We were so, told that it was. Uh, we were told that it was flying so low that it clipped off a couple of light poles on its way in. That might have happened behind the apartments that occluded my view, and uh, when it reappeared, it was right before impact. And like I said, I saw the airplane disintegrate and then just blow up into a huge ball of flames. So there was, a, there was a fireball that you saw? Absolutely. And the building shook, and it was, you know, quite a, quite a tremendous explosion. What did you see after that? Nothing but the flames. And I, I sat here, and I took a few pictures out my window, and uh, I noticed the fire trucks, and the response was just a wonderful. Fire trucks were there quickly. Um, I saw the, the area. The building didn't look very damaged initially, um, but I do see now, looking out my window, there's, there's quite a chunk in it. But uh, I think 
the blessing here might have been that the airplane hit before it hit the building, hit the ground, and a lot of energy might have gone that way. That's what it appeared like. Well, there, there is, of course, uh, we've heard some discussion about the fact that it could have been worse had it actually gone a little bit higher and gone into what's called uh, the ring, the center the of the ring, Pentagon, exactly. which is a, exactly. a, this is a five-sided building. Right. As uh, you know, the, the rings are A, B, C, D, E, and it just caught the E ring on the outside, and that's why I felt it didn't look as damaged as it could be. It, it looked like on the helipad, which is on that side. Right. Uh, did you see any uh, any people being removed, any injured being removed, that type of thing? No, sir. I'm... Um, up at a, about a quarter of a mile, maybe a little bit closer. And um, at that point, I saw nothing like that. Tim Timmerman, thank you very much. And I witnessed, Judy, to the crash. We still have no idea about the number of casualties. We know that there is a gaping hole on the west side of the Pentagon. As you can see, the smoke continues to billow. Judy? All right, Bob Franken, and uh, of course our audience, uh, no surprise, hospitals in the Washington area dealing with casualties from the plane crash at the Pentagon. We were told a few hours ago there's a blood shortage in the Washington area. Hospitals wanting people to know if you are in a position to donate blood, it would very much be needed and appreciated. And I just want to quickly say here before we go to the site of the Pennsylvania crash that the D.C. National Guard was having difficulty getting through to people that it needs to mobilize. And this specifically, this is information uh, specific to the Washington, D.C. area. The D.C. Guard wants to alert the 372nd Military Police Battalion and its subordinate companies to report as soon as possible to the D.C. Armory. Now, we got this information just about half an hour ago, and there have been so many other uh, stories and pieces of information coming in. We haven't been able to get this out, but we want it. We do want to get it out now. Perhaps it will do some good. Uh, joining us now, I mentioned to you a moment ago that uh, we had uh, we have a correspondent uh, on the scene of the airplane crash into uh, uh, the, the ground. We believe I'm going to go to David Mattingly, CNN correspondent there uh, in Pennsylvania. This is near Shanksville. Somerset County in western Pennsylvania, about 80 miles outside of Pittsburgh. David Mattingly, are you with us now? Yes, Judy, I'm here. And we are outside of the town of Shanksville. And to give you some idea of what kind of countryside this is, to my left is a huge field of, field of corn. To my right is a rolling green pastoral hill here at the edge of the Allegheny Mountains. One of the last places you would probably expect to be touched by the violence of an act of terrible terrorism like we have seen today. But people here in the area have reported that they saw a uh, commercial airliner going overhead at about two to 3,000 feet with no landing gear down. They heard then a loud roar of an engine, at which point the jet climbed and then banked sharply to the left before going down straight mm -hmm. on a 45-degree angle. Now, it hit the ground at that 45-degree angle. People here at the scene say there are no large pieces of debris even left from the plane. No hope of, uh, at this point, it seems to be no hope of survivor. Um, there is just about every piece of emergency uh, personnel here from miles around. Uh, the mood is considerably calmer, as you might imagine, than what you might see in Washington or New York. But there is a great deal of concern. Uh, schools are being closed. Businesses are being closed up into Pittsburgh and other parts of Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, prayer vigils are being reported scheduled all across this part of Pennsylvania as far as away as Altoona has been reported. Also, um, at this point, uh, there has been an emergency staging area set up. We are a good ways away from the crash scene, and uh, we will see what transpires here. Judy. Uh, David Mattingly on the scene, as we're saying there, near Shanksville, a small town in Somerset County, about 80 miles south of Pittsburgh. This the site of one of the two United Airlines aircraft. This a Boeing 757 left Newark, New Jersey this morning on its way to San Francisco. This is the plane that we know crashed. And you just, uh, with David Mattingly's report, uh, looking at the site of where this plane came down. We don't know where, uh, we presume, terrorists behind this, what their destination was, what their target was. We can only presume, we can only guess, that they were short of the target, that they were headed someplace farther, uh, someplace else from where they landed. With me now here in the studio, Connecticut uh, Democratic Senator Christopher Dodd. Uh, Senator Dodd, a longtime member of not only the Senate, but of the Senate Foreign Relations <clears throat> Committee. 
Senator Dodd, um, first of all, what can you say to the American people listening who want to know about the security of the leaders of our country, the president, and everyone else? Well, I think they've taken the proper steps in uh, here, and you haven't heard as much from some of the leaders as you might like at this point, but I think uh, those responsible uh, for their security are doing exactly what they should be doing. I'm told that they're in very good shape, uh, that they've uh, are being isolated because we don't know the magnitude of this effort. It's, it's beyond our imagination already what has occurred. And if someone or organization clearly responsible for this, this sophisticated an effort, uh, the potential for them doing more damage is obviously obvious. And so making sure that our leaders are, uh, are secure uh, is uh, the right step. And, and for those who may be wondering abroad who are watching this program, uh, Judy, uh, I'm a Democrat, <laughs> as you know. <clears throat> We stand completely and totally behind our president. Uh, we may have our differences from here from time to time. Uh, but in a day like this, uh, which rivals, if not exceeds, uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor, almost 60 years ago, uh, three months from now, uh, we stand totally united behind our president and our government. Uh, they are taking the proper steps. We're pulling together as a people. Uh, and we will overcome this. Initially, obviously, our prayers and thoughts goes for those who have who've lost their lives, have been injured in this incredibly, uh, incredible attack. And, and then Senator, we will, uh, yes, I'm sorry. Senator, I'm just going to interrupt you now. We're told President Bush uh, just about to be wheels up from uh, Good. Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana. And now let's go back to Aaron Brown in Good. New York. Judy, thank you, Senator. Thank you both. Uh, I believe we have former Secretary Henry Kissinger on the phone. The Secretary is in Germany today and he joins us on the phone from there. Mr. Kissinger, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Uh, just uh, quickly, sir, your reactions to what has, uh, is unfolding in the United States today. Well, it's uh, obviously a shocking event. It was, uh, I was giving a speech when somebody came in and interrupted uh, the question period to make that announcement and nobody in the room believed it. They all thought it had to be a mistake. Well, it's obviously uh, it's an integrated attack and must be dealt with in an integrated way. Well, when you say an, an integrated attack and dealt with in an integrated way, tell me, tell me what that means, sir. Well, it is obviously it, any organization that can plan such a coordinated attack within a very brief period of time must have substantial resources and must have a very capable organization and must have a haven where it is planning these things. Uh, you can't do that in a back room. Uh, and, and when you talk about an integrated response... Well, the integrated response is, is obviously... First of all, I want to say... Okay. Like uh, every American right now, I'm behind the president. And this, uh, uh, the response right now has been exactly what is needed. And there's, uh, <clears throat> the first necessity has to be to go through the tragedy to help the, uh, to help the families and to clean up the uh, uh, immediate situation. Then the next step will have to be a uh, uh, program to attempt to eradicate the source of this and to uh, bring pressure and serious pressure on governments that harbor uh, this kind of organization and especially governments where we suspect that these organizations are located. Sir, for a long time there's been a, a kind of cat and mouse game and I, I don't I don't make light of this in any sense when I say game, uh, between the governments that harbor terrorists and our government, other Western governments. It's all changed today, hasn't it? I mean, the stakes have changed enormously. The response likely will change enormously. It's all different, isn't it? Uh, that's correct. When, when these terrorists dare to attack the territory of the United States, it then becomes a question of the functioning of our society and we have to protect ourselves and I'm sure we will and I think it is it must now it's not an isolated attack it's not just an attack on an embassy uh, which is bad enough <clears throat> and 
it can't be dealt with with one, with one retaliatory blow. It cannot be dealt with with one retaliatory blow? No. There has to be a systemic attack. Uh, I don't know what that means. Uh, I, I, I understand. Uh, and I, I'm not sitting here uh, with, with a great plan. I'm saying this is what I would think our government will want to work towards. And would you expect that we, the United States government, will find enormous international support for whatever actions the United States government chooses to take, or will there be those important governments that resist here? Well, first thing is we have to protect ourselves. We would, of course, like to get as much support as we can. And we will be able to judge our friends by the degree of support that we get. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, there will be some governments who say we have to understand the conditions that produce this. There will come a time to, pr to deal with its circumstances. But the immediate thing is these organizations have to be put on the run. If they have to uh, spend all their time trying to survive, they have less time for terrorism. And, Mr. Secretary, we heard, and I, I'm not sure you were able to, but a few moments ago, uh, uh, Chris Dodd, Senator Dodd of Connecticut, uh, compared this to the attack on Pearl Harbor. Can you give me any historical context for what has taken place today, or are we a bit too close to it all to understand it yet? Well, the attack on Pearl Harbor was, uh, uh, I guess, the first attack, was well, certainly the first attack from across the seas on the territory of the United States, but it was not yet the mainland. And I agree with Senator Dodd, this is comparable to an attack on uh, Pearl Harbor, and it must have the same response, and the people who did it must have the same end as the people who attacked Pearl Harbor. But it isn't just the people who did it, it's the people who make it possible. These are the governments that harbor those who carry out these attacks. That harbor or, or encourage them with their propaganda. Mr. Secretary, thank you. Former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, who joins us uh, from Germany, where he was attending a conference when he heard the news. He said it was silent, unbelievable. People simply could not believe what they were hearing. I think that's a term, a phrase you will hear a lot over uh, the days and weeks to come. What has happened here in New York and in Washington and in other parts of the country, unbelievable, a national tragedy. Judy? Aaron, uh, it's true. No one is able to grasp uh, the enormity of what, uh, what we're looking at and what we're dealing with here. Let's go now to the Pentagon, where Rear Admiral Quigley is briefing reporters. I believe we have that picture right now. Your broadcast to, to, to phone their families and loved ones immediately to let them know they're okay. And if they are among the injured, uh, or the casualties from this, then we will, we will work our way through to identifying them and, uh, and getting their names out to their loved ones. We will find a way. Where are the injured going? Where are the injured being taken? Uh, a variety of area hospitals. How many was the penetration of the plane itself, Admiral? How many rings at the building? I don't know. How wide would you say that gash is? 100 feet from the one we're looking at? I haven't been over there to see it up close. I don't know. I think that's all for now, ladies and gentlemen. We'll, we'll try to be back out and give you some more information as we can. Was the Marine Corps only, if you wanted to do that. That's Rear Admiral. We've been talking, you've been listening to Rear Admiral uh, Quigley, one of the uh, folks who works with reporters in the public information office there at the Pentagon. We basically were just listening to the first few minutes of that, of that uh, briefing, uh, getting the word out to people who have friends, family members, who work at the Pentagon, uh, telling them uh, if you have people who may be among the injured, we're going to try to find a way to get you that information to get to let uh, get the word out about which hospital they might be in. Of course, we are dealing with tragedies in untold numbers of families across the eastern, primarily the east coast of the United States. But no doubt, these people who work at the Pentagon are from everywhere. People who were on these airplanes uh, are from uh, commercial jets from everywhere in the United States. Aaron, back to you. Um, 
It is the enormity that's a little bit hard to get our arms around right now. Still, uh, some considerable number of hours since the first attack on the World Trade Center here in New York. Uh, and I want to show some pictures of the scene from the ground. But first, let me just, a piece of information. United Airlines has now canceled all flights, grounded all flights, until 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. This is the scene that started to play out. Uh, this would be a little after 9 when the first of the trade centers collapsed after they were hit. People gathering, watching. You can see this, the denseness, the denseness of the smoke. People leaving in a very orderly, calm way have been the reports all morning and afternoon long. One witness who was in the building talked about coming down the stairwell and that people were very quiet. There was no screaming, no crying. People shielding themselves against the smoke. that a number of New York City police and fire department personnel have been injured, perhaps some fatally, when the buildings collapsed. We know that hospitals here in New York are in desperate need of blood. We know that the National Guard will be coming into the city to help in support of the 40,000 members of the New York City Police Department. We know that subway service through in Manhattan has been shut down. People uh, evacuating streams of people through the streets. There are 50,000 people who go to work just in the Trade Center buildings, the two towers. How many of them were there at the time, we do not know. Thousands, tens of thousands more pass through, getting on and off trains, going to the retail shops and restaurants. Every one of those lives changed today, as perhaps in some way all of our lives have been changed today. began at 8.45 this morning, and behind us now, the smoke continues to pour out of the area where the Trade Center towers were. They are no more. They collapsed in the hour after the attack, but the smoke continues to pour through that area behind us about 30 blocks away in one of those scenes that none of us will ever forget. CNN correspondent Richard Roth has been on the streets here in Lower Manhattan. Richard? Yes, Aaron. Uh, it, not chaos here. It's almost eerily silent of the, the march of thousands of New Yorkers evacuating southern Manhattan, looking to go to New Jersey to get off this island. Dazed, stunned, people concerned about loved ones, cell phones not working. New Yorkers are used to coping with a lot of things here. There have been some bombings and hurricanes and calamities, but really nothing like this before. And of course, behind me are the clouds of where the World Trade Center stood, two towers built in 1970. A short time ago, a Port Authority police official, the Port Authority is the state unit that runs, in effect, the World Trade Center, uh, those buildings that formerly existed. And uh, one of the police officials there, uh, William Hall, said there is no search going on right now. He said, until the fires go out, until it is safe for his people and other rescue workers to go in 
they are not moving in there. He said on an average day, the two World Trade Center towers get 10,000 people each with 5,000 visitors. A New York City police official told us a short time ago that another triage center is going to be set up here on the west side of Manhattan, 33rd Street area in the Jacob Javits Convention Center. This to handle additional overflow from New York City hospitals, which New York City Mayor Rudolph Giuliani says have been doing their best and coping with it, but there have been calls for blood. People here walking by me, someone will point to someone and say, this person was in the World Trade Center, just got out. You can hear behind me, there is the roar of uh, military aircraft, the only aircraft you see in the sky. And usually, as New Yorkers will tell you, you can look up at any time and see a plane. Uh, they are up in the sky, concerned look from people who gaze upward, shield their eyes to see just what's going on, and an occasional police uh, helicopter. But here in New York City, there is no search going on. William Hall of the Port Authority said we're going to have to wait until we get things all accounted for before we can go in there. Aaron. Richard, thank you. Richard Roth in uh, Lower Manhattan. Again, just a quick recap for those of you who may just be getting home and hearing these events for the first time, 8.48 this morning, one of those moments that everyone will remember. The first plane, American Airlines Flight 11, Boston to Los Angeles, hijacked, crashed into the first Trade Center Tower. At 9.04, the second plane, the United Airlines Flight, United 175, Boston to Los Angeles, hit the second tower. About a half hour later, 9.38 Eastern Time, American Airlines Flight 77, Washington Dulles Airport to Los Angeles it crashed into the Pentagon hitting just short of the Pentagon itself and perhaps that was most fortunate and at 10:20 a.m. Eastern Time United Flight 93 Newark to San Francisco crashed about 80 miles outside of Pittsburgh those are the times and the events they don't begin to describe what has happened, what has happened is not simply a series of moments, but something much larger. Phil Zapetta is with the American Red Cross, and he is on the phone with us. Mr. Zapetta, this is Aaron Brown. Can you hear me okay? Sure can, Aaron. Tell me what sort of strain is on the Red Cross's resources right now. Well, the American Red Cross responded immediately um, to um, all areas of this disaster. Right now, our focus is really on um, disaster relief, providing blood assistance, and any disaster mental health assistance that we can provide around the country um, to both the, the survivors and the families who have uh, been involved in this tragedy. Phil, tell me, tell me what that means exactly. Uh, I understand the need for blood. Uh, are you setting, setting up shelters for people? Sure. We have, we have shelters um, both in New York City and in um, Washington, D.C. that are set up to help people. Um, there we have disaster mental health counselors that are, that are able to, to meet with people and to uh, register people uh, as they come in and uh, are trying to, to get away from the situation. Uh, we are set up in New York at Penn Station, at Grand Central Station, and in Washington, D.C. at Fort Belvere. Um, it is still chaos right now. We are in the process of ramping up our operations. While we did respond immediately, there's so much work to be done, and we're in the process of doing that right now. We have about 50,000 units of, um, of blood that are available for the affected areas, and the American Red Cross is looking at mobilizing that right now and putting that into place. And uh, Phil, as you were speaking, we well, were able to put up on the screen numbers that people can call uh, if they can help. Um, if you're sitting in Omaha, Nebraska today, is it helpful in this situation to be going to the, to the blood bank and giving blood, or is it too far away to be meaningful? The message that the American Red Cross is putting out right now is to donate blood. Call 1-800-GIVE-LIFE, G-I-V-E-L-I-F-E, or visit redcross.org for more information. But uh, giving blood is the, where the our emphasis is right now. No matter where you are in the country. Yes, well, no matter where you are in the country, or you can, you know, contact your local hospital if you're not in a Red Cross area, but 1-800-GIVE-LIFE is the best number to call. Okay, so even if you are far away from the events of today, uh, you can still be helpful, uh, as there is certainly in New York and in Washington, from what Judy said, a serious shortage of blood. Uh, the American Red Cross can be helpful. Your local hospital, your local blood bank uh, can be helpful. We suspect before the day is out, uh, fire stations around the country will be involved in these efforts. 
as well. Uh, Phil, thank you. Is there anything else, by the way, before I let you go, that you want to say uh, that would be helpful to our viewers or helpful to the Red Cross? Well, the Red Cross right now and our, our president, Dr. Bernadine Healy, extend our heartfelt sor sorrows to all families and everyone that's been affected by this. Um, we just urge people to donate blood. Um, thank you very much, Phil, with the American Red Cross. Phil Zapetta with the American Red Cross. Uh, CNN's Miles O'Brien has been tracking the flight paths of these four planes that were involved. Uh, Miles, are you able to hear me in Atlanta? Yes, I am, Aaron. And tell me what you've been able to figure out to this point. Well, as you probably know, Aaron, there are various commercial websites that allow you to track commercial aircraft. Now, if you go to many of them right now, you're not going to get very far because they're being overwhelmed by interest in people. Uh, but even if you could get some of the data, we have just learned from the Federal Aviation Administration that every domestic airliner that was in the air is now on the ground. This is unprecedented in aviation history in this country. There's not a plane flying right now. At any given moment, typically there are 4,000 aircraft. Now, let's take a look at what happened on American Airlines Flight 11. It began in Boston and it took off on time, 81 people aboard, nine crew members, uh, two, uh, nine flight attendants and two pilots. And let's sort of track what happened with this flight. As it went across uh, Massachusetts and went down into the uh, uh, Albany area, actually up in the Adirondacks, it took a sharp dog leg. What's interesting about this flight is everything seemed to be normal. Flight at a, it was altitude was about 29,000 feet, it's gaining speed at about uh, 450 knots. It took that sharp dog leg down across the Adirondacks straight for New York. Now, what will be interesting about this as this story unfolds will be, number one, listening to any air traffic control conversations to get a sense of what, if anything, uh, air traffic controllers were, were saying to this aircraft. Undoubtedly, this was spotted on the radar screens, of course. They had quite a bit of time to watch this plane as it went down toward New York. That's probably at least a 30-minute run there. And during the course of that time, those air traffic controllers and those radar installations, New York Center, as it is called, would have been uh, trying to contact American Airlines Flight 11 to indicate its intentions. Uh, it must have been a horrifying scene for them. They were probably trying to clear air traffic out of the area. Clearly, once those tapes become available, we'll have a little bit more knowledge. And if it is possible to locate any of the so-called black boxes, the flight data recorders, cockpit voice recorder, out of this particular aircraft, they'll obviously know more about what was going on on what must have been a very dramatic uh, flight indeed. Now, this is the first flight. This is the flight that uh, first impacted the first tower of the World Trade Center, and this is the first of four that we know about, of course, four air uh, hijackings, which led to uh, crashes and uh, obviously a tremendous amount of damage. I'm getting this information from a company called FlightExplorer.com. They are compiling their archival radar information from this morning, and as it becomes available, we'll be able to show you the flight paths of the other three aircraft that are suspected in all of this, and we'll bring those to you as soon as we get that. Aaron? Uh, just a quick practical question. These tapes of the cockpit tower communications. Do they exist on the ground? Yes. Are they recorded at, in control towers? And then there's a different set of tapes that exist on the plane. Exactly. It's, it's important to bring out there are two types of tapes in these incidents. The, the tapes on the ground are the ones that record the radio transmissions between the ground and the aircraft. And clearly, the flight controllers would have been calling this aircraft numerous times. And, and this would have been the case for the three others if they deviated from their courses, uh, indicate, trying to get some indication as to what was wrong, why the pilot was changing course so dramatically. Now, what will be interesting to hear is if there is some sort of response from these aircraft. Uh, this will uh, give us some clue as to who might have been in control of the plane at the time or if there might have been some sort of struggle aboard or if, it, if there was just a, a lack of a struggle. There's a lot of mystery here, obviously. Now, ultimately, uh, as they go through the, uh, the wreckage in these cases, uh, it's possible that uh, investigators, and there's a good chance because they have emergency locating uh, devices on them, they'll find these so-called black boxes. And on those black boxes, there might be much more information which might uh, give authorities some clues as to who might be responsible. Several different kinds of information. There's technical information in these black boxes, what the airplane was doing in a sense, but there's also communications between the cabin crew uh, that exist on those tapes, uh, what pilot was saying to co-pilot. Might, we might be able to hear, if these tapes are ever located, what the people who took control of these planes, and that's clearly what happened, seems clear that that's what happened, what they were saying, whether these tapes will ever be found, obviously we don't yet know but that is part of 
what will happen in the next days. On this day, what is happening in both Washington and New York and in a field outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, is a massive, massive rescue operation, a massive triage operation. Uh, thousands of people presumably have been hurt. Many people, we suspect, have died. Though many hours now since that first plane hit the Trade Center at uh, 8.48 Eastern Time, we have yet to hear from any official in the city uh, any estimate here in New York of the number of people who have been hurt. We just know that hospitals are inundated, that hospitals are running very low on blood, and they need help here. We know that uh, we know that the National Guard will be coming in here to New York to help in support of uh, the New York Police Department. Uh, we would add here that a number of members, and we don't know how many, but after the police and fire responded to these two planes hitting the Trade Center, uh, many police officers, many firefighters, many EMS personnel were in the area when the buildings collapsed. How many of them were hurt, we do not know. Uh, but we've been told now by two uh, officials or former officials with the city that, that any number of people, uh, police and fire officials, have been hurt as well. Uh, Judy in Washington. Judy Woodruff. Judy. And Aaron, uh, just picking up on your conversation with Miles O'Brien a moment ago, and, and perhaps you all referred to this, and I apologize if I'm repeating, the Associated Press reporting on a passenger that was on United Flight 93. Now, this is the plane that crashed in Pennsylvania. About 20 minutes before that plane crashed, a passenger with a cell phone locked in a bathroom actually called an emergency dispatcher and shouted into the cell phone, we are being hijacked, we're being hijacked. They apparently stayed on the phone with this passenger uh, up until the moment when the passenger heard some sort of a loud noise and then they lost they lost contact. That's just one more piece of the stories, the many, many, many stories that we are pulling together uh, as we watch these developments in Pennsylvania, here in Washington, and of course in New York City. And you just heard Aaron talking about uh, incomplete information about casualties, what hospitals are dealing with. Now these numbers I'm going to read you right now are, are only incomplete. We, we are just beginning to get this kind of information. We're told at Washington area hospitals right now, 53 injured, at least three more casualties on the way, although we have to believe that with uh, the commercial jetliner that crashed at the Pentagon or just in front of the Pentagon, and that was the uh, Boeing 757, and these are the these are the pictures of the Pentagon just outside the Pentagon, 58 passengers on board, four crew members and two pilots. It is impossible to believe that they did not all perish, and we don't know about others who work at the Pentagon who were in uh, the part of that building uh, that was most affected when that commercial plane uh, went down. We, we are, uh, we've been talking with uh, uh, a number of people involved in, in rescue, and uh, right now we want to go to the president's statement. This took place just about an hour and 15 minutes ago. The president was on his way back to Washington from Florida. His plane touched down at an Air Force base in Louisiana, Barksdale Air Force Base near Shreveport. We can now report that information because he's since left Barksdale. But here is what President George W. Bush had to say in this statement. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward. Earth. and freedom will be defended. Earth. I want to reassure the American people that full, the full resources of the federal government are working to assist local authorities to save lives and to help the victims of these attacks. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. I've been in regular contact with the Vice President, Secretary of Defense, the National Security Team, and my Cabinet. We have taken all appropriate, appropriate security precautions to protect the American people. Our military at home and around the world is on high alert status and we have taken the necessary security precautions 
to continue the functions of your government. We have been in touch with the leaders of Congress and with world leaders to assure them that we will do what is, whatever is necessary to protect America and Americans. I ask the American people to join me in saying a thanks for all the folks who have been fighting hard to rescue our fellow citizens and to join me in saying a prayer for the victims and their families. The resolve of our great nation is being tested, but make no mistake, we will show the world that we will pass this test. God bless. President Bush uh, made that statement just about an hour and 20 minutes ago at Barksdale Air Force Base near Shreveport, Louisiana. That was an unplanned stop that the president made at that place uh, in order to talk with reporters, meet with others. Since then, Air Force One has taken off, President Bush being flown to an undisclosed location. We're told also that Secretary of State Colin Powell, who had been on his way back to the United States from Peru, being taken to an undisclosed location. Outside the Pentagon, CNN's military military affairs correspondent Jamie McIntyre. And Jamie, you got very close to where that plane went down. That's right, Judy. A short, uh, a, a while ago, I walked right up to next to the building where uh, uh, firefighters were still trying to put out the blaze. The, the fire, by the way, is still burning in some parts of the Pentagon. And I took a look at the huge gaping hole that's in this side of the Pentagon in an area of the Pentagon that has been recently renovated, uh, part of a uh, multi-billion dollar renovation program here at the Pentagon. I could see parts of the airplane that crashed into the building, very small pieces of the plane on the heliport outside the, 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 uh, the building. The biggest piece I saw was about three feet uh, long. It was uh, silver and had been painted uh, green and red, but I could not see any identifying markings on the plane. I also saw a large piece of shattered glass. It appeared to be uh, a cockpit windshield or other window from the plane. Uh, when this uh, plane hit the Pentagon uh, this morning, according to the Pentagon spokesman uh, Craig Quigley, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld incredibly uh, is described as having run out of his office and down to ha actually help some of the victims onto stretchers until he was uh, ushered into the National Military Command Center, the secure uh, uh, nerve center or war room in, uh, deep inside the Pentagon, where he remains at this time. Pentagon officials say he'll stay there for the time being. That is a place where all of U.S. intelligence comes in, and he has complete uh, command uh, with his commanders around the world. At the same time, the Pentagon has dispatched several warships out of port in Norfolk, including the U.S., uh, the carriers uh, USS George Washington, and U.S. says uh, uh, Kennedy. Uh, the, the ostensible reason for that, uh, to uh, uh, the movement of those ships and their escort ships, is to move them from more vulnerable positions. But the Navy says they'll also head some of the aircraft carriers up toward New York with the idea that they may be able to render some kind of assistance there, given the magnitude uh, of the tragedy there. Uh, back here, uh, the fight goes on to put out the, the fire inside the Pentagon. The, the heat from that blaze was described as absolutely intense, and the number of casualties here has still not been released. Uh, dozens of people uh, were taken away in ambulances, and the Pentagon is still not releasing any figures on, uh, on deaths. But clearly people who had offices in that uh, what is now a huge gaping hole in, uh, in the side of the Pentagon, uh, clearly there were some people killed in this, uh, in this tragedy. Judy? Jamie, Aaron was talking uh, earlier, one, or one of our correspondents was talking earlier, I think it, actually it was Bob Franken, with an eyewitness who said it appeared that that Boeing 757, the American jet, American Airlines jet, landed short of the Pentagon. Can you give us any better idea of how much of the plane actually impacted the building? You know, it, it, it might have appeared that way, but from my close-up inspection, uh, there's no evidence of a plane having crashed anywhere near the Pentagon. The only site uh, is the actual uh, side of the building that's crashed in, and as I said, the only pieces left uh, that you can see are, are small enough that you could pick up in your hand. Uh, there are no large uh, tail sections, wing sections, uh, a fuselage, nothing like that anywhere around, which would indicate 
that the entire plane crashed into the side of the Pentagon uh, and then caused the side to collapse. Now, even though if you look at the pictures of the Pentagon, you see uh, that the floors have all collapsed. That didn't happen immediately. Uh, it wasn't until a, almost about 45 minutes later uh, that the structure was weakened enough that all of the floors collapsed. And Jamie, this happened. Uh, we're now we're now able to reconstruct about 9:38 this morning at that time jamie what are we talking about dozens hundreds of people at work in the building there are twenty four thousand people who work in this building and most of them are at work at that hour of the morning uh, they were all evacuated from the building uh, in my office which is um, uh, sort of halfway between where this took place and the other side of the building which is where the defense secretary's office is uh, eventually even the the corridor i was in began to fill up with smoke uh, just as i began to leave the building but um, there are this was uh, uh, the prime time for an attack however it's not the prime location uh, every time we've thought about what might happen if the Pentagon were subject to attack. We always assumed that the attack would come on the other side, the river entrance where the uh, where the brass are. But this uh, attack came on the side facing Arlington Cemetery. All right, Jamie McIntyre, military affairs correspondent. And just to underline what we're seeing at the Pentagon, nothing on the scale of of the devastation in New York City where you have two entire towers of the World Trade Center collapsing but still this is, has to be the supposedly the most secure of secure buildings in Washington DC and an airplane commercial airplane flew right into it so we are just uh, again uh, trying to get our minds around the magnitude of what these people have gotten away with Nick Robertson, uh, correspondent, uh, joining us now on the telephone. Nick, you are in Roger. Kabul, stand by, stand is that by. correct? Stand Nick, are you hearing me by. right now? That's correct, Judy, and we've just had... Yes, Judy, I hear you fine. We are hearing from Mullah Omar in the spiritual capital of, of Afghanistan, about 300 miles south of here. Mullah Omar is the spiritual leader of the Taliban here, and he's recently issued a short statement. In that statement, he criticizes the, what he called an act of terrorism, and he was very explicit. He said that Osama bin Laden was not responsible for it, and he said that all he wanted for his country was peace and peace for other countries in the world. And he went on to say that he believed Osama bin Laden could not have been responsible for such a complex act of terrorism. And he also said that if Afghanistan is a poor country, and therefore he believed there was no way that Afghanistan could be involved in such a complicated uh, act of terrorism. Judy? Nick, uh, help us understand who is more Omar, the gentleman you're quoting. He is the spiritual leader of the Taliban. The Taliban uh, run 95% of Afghanistan. They control the capital, Kabul. They control most of uh, Afghanistan, the south of Afghanistan. Mullah Omar lives in the south of Afghanistan in the spiritual capital, which is the ethnic area that he comes from, the Pashtun area around Kandahar. There are ministries of the Taliban here in Kabul. The foreign minister is here in Kabul at the moment. He is often based in Kandahar as well. And there are other ministry officials also based in Kabul. But the direction for Afghanistan, the direction for the ministries, the, the key decisions are all made in Kandahar, and Mullah Omar is the focal point of all those decisions. It is to him that a key group of ministers would go with a problem, with an issue, and it is he that would decide on any given issue. He is the final arbiter here of law and of justice. Judy? Nick, where is it believed that Osama bin Laden is in Afghanistan? That is a very difficult question to answer. Osama bin Laden, uh, his location is kept extremely secret. Uh, as foreign media traveling around Afghanistan, one is often watched uh, and an eye is kept on us by various ministries to ensure that we don't go searching around the country. Our movements around the country are generally restricted to main cities that are, are agreed in advance by the authorities. So it's very difficult to gauge where Osama bin Laden is. It is understood that he travels around at night. It's understood that he has operated out of various training camps that were built uh, to help train Mujahideen fighters to fight the Soviet occupation in the, in the 1980s. Those are based 
some of them towards the border with Pakistan in an area called Host. Those were the training camps that were hit, that were hit in the 1998 cruise missile attack on Afghanistan. It's also rumored that Osama bin Laden spends some time close to Kandahar, close to the spiritual leader of the Taliban, Mullah Omar. But to exactly put a fix on his location is a very, very difficult thing to do. He works by extreme secrecy. The very few journalists that are able have been able to meet with him over the last few years are always held at a location and taken a blindfold uh, to another location where they can interview him. So people generally, when they meet him, they don't know exactly where they are. They wait there, he arrives, he departs, then they're free to leave. He lives by extreme secrecy here. Uh, it, it's necessary. All right, CNN's yeah. Nick Robertson joining us, as you could see, from Kabul, Afghanistan, uh, the country uh, run by the religious group, the Taliban, the group that is, has been suspected, believed for some time, of harboring Osama bin Laden. Thank you very much, Nick. And again, we apologize for the delay in the audio there. It is because Nick is on uh, this video phone, which uh, is, a, is a new device that we're using, and uh, there is always a delay, it can, tends to be a delay in audio. I want to bring in now uh, our national security correspondent, David Ensor. You're looking at pictures as I do this from New York City in the moments following the worst of today's attacks on the World Trade Center in New York City, Lower Manhattan, where you can see people running in sheer terror away from either one of the two airplane crashes into the top of the World Trade Center, both towers of which collapsed later on to the utter horror of people watching both live and on television across the United States and around the world. For that matter, New York City, the subject of the worst terrorism ever to strike the United States. So while we certainly mourn uh, the loss here in Washington at the Pentagon, the airplane that crashed into the Pentagon, the other airplane that crashed near Pittsburgh, both of them commercial airliners with civilians on board, the loss of life in New York City is utterly unbelievable. And just picking up as we look at these pictures, picking up on what Nick Robertson was saying from Afghanistan, even as the leaders of the Taliban deny any role in this, an Arab, based, an Arab journalist based in London is quoted today to the Associated Press as saying that followers of Osama bin Laden warned three weeks ago they were going to carry out this sort of an attack. New York City Mayor Rudolph Giuliani joining us once again. Mayor, Mayor Giuliani. The tragedy that uh, we're all undergoing right now is something that we've had nightmares about but probably thought wouldn't happen. My heart goes out to all of the innocent victims of this horrible and vicious act of terrorism, acts of terrorism. And our focus now has to be on saving as many lives as possible. We have hundreds of police officers and firefighters who are engaging in rescue efforts in lower Manhattan. I want to thank Governor Pataghi for the incredible cooperation and coordination and uh, including uh, deploying the National Guard that will be available to relieve our police officers and firefighters and emergency workers in the next couple of hours. Uh, the governor and I just spoke to the President of the United States. The coordination with the federal government from the time of the first attack has been excellent, including closing off the airspace around Manhattan and doing everything that can possibly be done in the face of this barbaric act to make the city secure. And we will uh, strive now very hard to save as many people as possible and to send a message that the city of New York and the United States of America is much stronger than any group of barbaric terrorists, that our democracy, that our rule of law, that our strength and our willingness to defend ourselves will ultimately prevail. And I'd ask the people of New York City to do everything that they can to cooperate not to be frightened, to go about their lives as normal. Everything is safe right now in the city. And the people who are doing the relief effort needs all, need all the help they can get. And then, uh, Governor, thank you very, thank you very, very much. much for your assistance and your help and your support. Thank you.
Thank you, Mayor, for your leadership through this crisis. This is uh, a vicious attack upon New York. It's an attack upon America. It's an attack upon the whole concept of freedom and our way of life. Uh, and we cannot let these at attacks succeed. Uh, the first step has to be to make sure we do everything in our power to protect the people and to save the lives of those who, whose lives are still at risk and to help those who have been injured. And I want to commend the mayor. And I want to thank my colleagues from Connecticut, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and the federal government have all offered and made ready uh, support to help us uh, deal with this ongoing crisis. Uh, the people of New York are uh, not only the, the freest and most diverse people in the world, we're also, I believe, the most capable of rising to meet the challenges of this type of attack. And right now, we want New Yorkers to uh, remain calm, to go about their business, to appreciate the fact that everything to provide for their safety is being done, to appreciate that everything that can be done to provide for the health and the needs of the people who are still at risk is being done, and that we will continue to work to make sure that we get through this uh, as strongly and quickly as possible. I want to thank the uh, federal administration. Secretary Thompson has been on the phone with me a number of times, as well as the president, uh, for what they are offering and prepared to do. Uh, and we're just uh, confident that, uh, uh, well, this is a horrible attack, and one that uh, is despicable and uh, really unthinkable in its magnitude. We will get through this, uh, and we will continue to have a great and free country, state, and society. Do we know the number of casualties at this point, sir? I don't, I don't think we, we really want to speculate about that. The number of casualties will be more than any, any of us can bear, ultimately. And I don't think we want to speculate on the number of casualties. The effort now has to be to save as many people as possible. There are large numbers. I don't, think, I don't think we will know the answer to that until sometime tomorrow or the next Were day. Were there large numbers of firefighters? There are a large number of firefighters and police officers who are uh, in harm's way. And we don't know how, ma how many we've lost. But there's no doubt we've lost, we've lost some firefighters and police officers. Do you know anything about the cause of the explosions that brought the two buildings down yet? Was it caused by the planes or by something else? We, be we, second we, believe, we believe that it was caused by the after effects of the, of the planes hitting the, the, the buildings. We don't, we don't know of an additional explosion after that. We have no specific in information to that effect. Obviously, the city is now closed. The airspace around the city is closed, uh, and we are on heightened alert. But we have no specific information suggesting any further attack. Can you tell us where the planes came from? New York? I think to give the people of New York confidence to show that the federal government is standing with us and, and to uh, just to make certain that nothing further happens. This has been a very, very difficult and traumatic day for the people of the United States and the people of the city. And I think that it's, a, it's an act that shows that the federal government is going to do everything they can to support us and help us. Can you give an idea of the extent of the, um, the rescue effort that's going on right now along the scope of this thing, of this operation? There, there are over a thousand rescue workers probably about 2,000 that are deployed, trying to get into the buildings, trying to find people, trying to search for people. The governor and I spoke a couple of hours ago. It's untrue that in the past, over the last decade, there have been those occasions when the evidence pointed to certain states, and that for yes. one reason or another, neither the executive nor legislative branch of our U.S. government wanted to attend to that. It just, the decision was made to look the other way. I don't know if the intention, uh, if, if the action was to just look the other way, but I think there were indications whether there was conclusive proof or not was a judgment that was made by uh, our leaders, uh, both in the executive and legislative branch. Uh, I have felt that, that there's been involvement, but uh, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, uh, Dan, I never thought that a, an operation of this sophistication and size would take place. I, I just never did. Uh, but I don't think there's any doubt that there are countries, Iraq, Iran, Libya, North Korea, and others, who we know engage in proliferation of, uh, of capabilities and have from time to time involved themselves in state-sponsored terrorism. But never did we imagine on a scale such as this. Senator John McCain, thanks for being with us. Thanks, Dan. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.
The earliest the FAA says it would consider lifting ground stoppages, this has to do with air traffic in this country, will be 12 noon tomorrow. Again, as we have so often, we need to pause and absorb that. This has never happened in the history of the country. The FAA, early in the day, said it wanted all flights in the country stopped. They just shut it down, given the situation. Now the FAA says that it will consider lifting the ground stoppages at, at or about 12 noon tomorrow. Obviously, that could be subject to change, but that's what the FAA says at the moment. Sandra Hughes, CBS News correspondent, is at LAX, the Los Angeles International Airport, where some of the flights involved in the hijacked suicide missions, as it turned out today, Committee, thank you very much thank for you, being with us today. We'd like to be able to talk with you again if we can after that four o'clock briefing. I know you can't give away details, but thank if we can invite you back, Senator, we'd like to do that. Let's go to NBC's Campbell Brown now, who is covering the White House from outside the fence. Campbell? Well, Tom, we don't know where the president is right now, and that is, of course, deliberate given the security concerns. They are going to uh, great extremes to protect him at, at this moment. He started off the day in Florida, then flew to the Barksdale Air Force Base, which is in Louisiana, near Shreveport, North Louisiana. And it was there that he made a statement reacting to the attacks this morning. Let's listen to what he had to say. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward. Earth. And freedom will be defended. Earth. I want to reassure the American people that full, the full resources of the federal government are working to assist local authorities to save lives and to help the victims of these attacks. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. I've been in regular contact with the Vice President, Secretary of Defense, Now, Tom, we are told that the president took off from Barksdale Air Force Base for an unknown location. There are any number of places uh, that he could have been taken. The most likely is a, a series of command centers that are set up across the country, uh, all over the country, uh, that are essentially communication centers where the president could speak with the military, where he could have access to the latest intelligence information. And the military officer who travels with the president at all times, this is the military officer who carries the nuclear codes, he also has a database with him of all of these communication centers around the country. All of them, or most of them rather, underground, where the president can both be protected and uh, have that access, the most advanced electronics equipment that could give him access uh, to his entire team, whoever he needed to talk to. Uh, two in particular are worth noting here. One is Camp David. Underground at Camp David, there is a facility there, a, a special communication center, and of course Camp David is uh, in Maryland along the Pennsylvania-Maryland border. There is another place in that same location, Waynesboro, Pennsylvania, near the Pennsylvania-Maryland border, again called Raven Rock. And Raven Rock is the, the alternate National Military Command Center or communication center. If the Pentagon is the primary place where military operations are conducted from, Raven Rock is the backup location. Now, these two are worth noting, um, and we have no confirmation that they are in any way related to the plane crash near Pittsburgh, but they are in the vicinity of that plane crash in Pittsburgh and possibly could have been targets. Tom? Thank you very much, NBC's Campbell Brown. Is this... Uh as these stories begin to unfold throughout the day, we're still uh, operating really on two planes. It is surrealistic, but at the same time, it is one of the darkest days in America as we realize that this country has been attacked in an act of terrorist war in the heart of the nation's capital in Washington, D.C., and also in New York City, and then a plane that was driven into the ground outside of Pittsburgh. We believe that that is the end of the attacks for now, but no one is sure because we don't know who is responsible. Let's go to NBC's Jim Mikloszewski, who was in the Pentagon. When that plane was driven into the Pentagon today, he heard a small explosion. Don Rumsfeld wouldn't get out at first, but I gather he, too, has been taken to a secure location. Actually, Tom, what Don Rumsfeld did, according to uh, Pentagon officials, is he was in his office on the opposite side of the building from where you see where the plane impacted. And uh, he ran to the area where the, where the uh, uh, fire and the fireball 
was still engulfing much of the Pentagon. And according to Pentagon officials, he actually assisted in helping some of the injured leave the building before he then returned to his office and then went straight to the National Military Command Center, again on the opposite side of the Pentagon, to monitor events where he now remains. Tom, this, this airplane that ran into the Pentagon, it happened a, a, within the hour from the two planes that ran into the World Trade Center, but it took a full four hours before firefighters and rescue workers could actually contain the flames and fire inside so it was safe enough for them to enter the building. And that was about an hour ago when we were told that rescue workers did enter parts of the building where you can see where the plane sliced through the Pentagon. Now, it was actually uh, fortuitous that the, uh, the plane hit in this area, if that can be described as fortunate at all. As you see, Tom, uh, the plane sliced through the building. It came in at an angle, flipped over on its right side, and hit actually at about the first and second floors. The third, fourth, and fifth floors were still intact immediately after the blast, but then later collapsed upon themselves. But to the right of that devastated area, you see there's not much fire damage. That's because that part of the building had recently been renovated with reinforced blast walls to prevent a kind of bomb attack, not an airplane attack, of course, but to prevent a bomb attack and reinforce firewalls on the inside uh, after the bombing at Oklahoma City. When the remodeling of the Pentagon was begun, it was decided to do it with extra reinforcement after Oklahoma City. Now, this area to the left, where you see most of the fire damage, that area was due to be remodeled shortly. And fortunately, a large number of those offices had already been evacuated. Now, there are confirmed dead, uh, many injured. We don't know the exact number yet. And as rescue workers dig through that rubble, certainly the death toll here is going to climb. But really, it could have probably been much worse had this area on the right not been reinforced and the area on the left uh, not been uh, abandoned, really, to prevent, uh, to permit uh, the, uh, the redevelopment or reconstruction uh, work that was to uh, uh, go underway. Now, according to eyewitnesses, it was an American Airlines 757 that came sort of from the directional of National Airport, and it just cleared the uh, highway, which is adjacent, the highway ramps, which is adjacent to the Pentagon, but then it came in, and as it approached the Pentagon, almost at ground level, did a very hard right turn and actually flipped on its side and then sliced into the Pentagon uh, on the first and second floors we see there. Tom? Thank you very much, uh, NBC Jim Ekleshevsky. In both that flight and the first flight, the American Airlines flight that hit here in New York, had similar patterns. They were flying at very, very low altitude, a thousand feet, according to some New York witnesses. And Bob Kerr said earlier that over Lafayette Park, uh, just outside the White House, they saw a plane go over at a very low altitude that was out of the normal flight pattern for Washington, D.C. So obviously, this had been well thought out. That goes without saying. The question is, what happened in the cockpit? Did uh, the terrorists take the controls and drive those planes into the World Trade Center? as well as into the Pentagon. And where was that plane that went down in Pennsylvania headed? Why did it go down there? Well, these were all flights that were originally headed for California. Uh, we don't have the tapes, obviously. Uh, the black box may be able to tell us something. This is the second plane going that you can see entering from right to left there that hit the second uh, Trade Center uh, tower at the World Trade Center here in New York, causing that enormous fireball. That is the first tower to go down. It was hit a little bit lower. It went down first, and the second one went down as well. So there are so many unanswered questions here. All across America, we know that people are watching with horror and with, with a, a great deal of apprehension. There are lessons to be learned from past experiences. Oklahoma City comes immediately to mind. Assistant Fire Chief was John Hansen, who became a very familiar figure and a friend to a lot of us, who's been through all this. He's now retired from the department in Oklahoma City. John, first of all, this whole business of getting people out of the rubble in, in New York City and in the Pentagon, but the larger lessons about what we should learn about how we move on from here. What did you learn in Oklahoma City? 
You know, Tom, that we can, in fact, do that. We were, uh, you know, stung, we were wounded, but we're not going to be defeated, and we won't in this one. You've heard the President, Mayor Giuliani, the, the Governor of New York, all make the comments that we're going to stick together and get through this. We've got to be patient. We've got uh, an incredible rescue effort that's going to take possibly months. You know, our, our rescue effort in Oklahoma City took 17 days. This, with the widespread destruction, will probably go into the months. Uh, we've just got to be patient and pull together and, uh, and, and just, just take this head on. There's so much that we learn from Oklahoma City as well in terms of uh, rescue organization and, and, and uh, rescue techniques. You know, Tom, we had uh, a team from the great... great yes, those were his exact words. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're going to go to the telephone. Allison Gilbert, who is one of the producers here at News Channel 4, um, is in the hospital. She apparently suffered some slight wounds. Allison, can you tell us where you were and, and what happened? Well, this has been the most incredible day of my life. Um, I was on the way to the scene. Uh, I'm going to meet up with some reporters who are down there. And um, I saw the first tower collapse. And when that cleared, I was heading uh, further in towards the scene. Um, at that point, when we were still trying to make our date, if you will, trying to meet up with all the reporters down there, um, that's when the second tower began to um, tumble. And uh, we were running, and it was chaos, and it was horrendous, and uh, we were just running basically for our lives. My, you know, shoes came off. I was running barefoot over debris and rubble, and um, I'm sitting here now. Thankfully, I would say one of the lucky ones at Bellevue Hospital. How many people are there with you, around you, waiting treatment? Awaiting treatment, Allison. Um, I was in the emergency room uh, in triage for my first few hours here, um, and I must say it was like a war camp and how they distributed the patients and who went where. Um, right now, I've been taken to another floor where people are stable um, and still being uh, looked at and monitored, which is where I am right at the moment. Allison, how severe are your injuries? Um, it seems really insignificant to talk about what I've gone through um, when I've seen what I've seen here and what I've experienced. Um, I had major breathing issues when I came in. I was um, covered in rubble and debris for about five minutes before I was taken out by EMS. Um, and what I have is really insignificant. Are you telling us you were buried underneath some of the rubble? I couldn't see anything in front of my face for about five minutes. It was um, dark soot. It was black. I couldn't see my hands in front of my face. I didn't know whether or not I would see the sky again. I didn't know whether or not there was a building on top of me and I had two inches of breathing room or whether or not I would see the sky. It was the most horrendously nerve-wracking, scary, uh, five minutes um, I've ever experienced. And who, who got you out? Uh, I was with, uh, thankfully, some EMS folks who were in the same position as I was, because as you can imagine with the NYPD press credentials we have, I was fairly close to the scene, so I was near um, these men and women, and uh, it was a bunch of us who moved out together, and um, from that position, we were um, really brought in very rapidly into some sort of um, restaurant, deli, makeshift, triage um, place where we were really doused with water and, uh, you know, we were put on oxygen right away because we couldn't breathe. Well, Allison, we're looking at the plume right now that uh, presumably is, is the one that caught up with you. Yeah. We're certainly happy to hear your voice, I must say that, and uh, to know you came through this thing with only minor injuries. Thank you. Uh, Allison, yeah. what about some of the other people that are there with you? You keep saying that your injuries are so minor compared to theirs. Can you describe for us what you've seen? What I've seen, and I don't know whether you said this is fortunately or unfortunately yet, but I've seen people who are similar in condition um, to me. And what I mean by that is, unfortunately, a lot of the really horrific cases that we don't even know about yet, um, people are still back at that location. Um, I was extremely lucky. I wasn't in the building. I was outside. I was able to um, be brought to a series of uh, triage centers uh, there. 
uh, and before I was taken to an ambulance. The people here who are here now are people who are not, I don't think, having not been there since this all happened, the ones that are tragically injured and still buried. It's, um, it's beyond the scope of anything you could imagine, and all I could say is I've been incredibly impressed and lucky to have encountered all the professional people along the way, from the police to the EMS to the fire officials to the ambulance workers to the Bellevue Hospital doctors downstairs when I was first admitted. Um, it's been nothing but um, war triage, and uh, it's unbelievable, and we're only now going to understand the magnitude of it. We have sitting with us here, Allison, if you'll stay with us here, Omar Wasa, who was also in the area and uh, was running for his life at one point, uh, who also was telling us off camera a while ago how impressed he was with, with how um, helpful everybody was and how contrary to one of the questions we heard in the news conference was someone asked if there was any looting or lawlessness going on, uh, quite the opposite. It was everybody helping everybody, Omar. Yeah, at, uh, at a Duane Reed, the women who worked there were encouraging people to take water, take bandages. I saw one guy take a case of water but pay $20 so he could take it out into the street and give it to others. Um, when we got to the lobby of one of the major office buildings, there were volunteer nurses. And I mean, it was, it was uh, a very impressive and, and uh, inspiring kind of response by the, the, the New Yorkers who, who I encountered. I assume that the stories we're now beginning to hear are only going to be multiplied hundreds of times over um, before the end of this day and certainly by tomorrow and, and later. Um, you have talked many times about the professionalism of the law enforcement people and the firefighters, et cetera. Can you just tell us what? Uh, well, given that there wasn't much time between the initial uh, you know, hit of the planes to the building and, and the collapse, when I was walking around I saw lots of police guiding people there were um, you know everyone from the, the you know I, I saw lots of people from the New York uh, fire department coming in on motorcycles I mean it, it was clear that uh, this was sort of an all points bulletin and people had converged very quickly and were were trying to make a, a chaotic horrible situation more orderly and and uh, just at every point there were people there handing out water uh, making sure people had uh, food or you know I walked past a hospital they were handing out uh, masks for people to breathe so it was, it was really uh, a concerted effort to try and, and, and bring some stability and sanity to the situation. And Mayor Giuliani pointed out it's probably going to be tomorrow at the earliest before we know the extent of the casualties and uh, the deaths in this. Tomorrow at the earliest. Tomorrow but that beyond, sounds optimistic, certainly. doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, it does, because obviously they've got to get inside that rubble to see if there are people that are still inside that can be saved. And even people who are okay who may have gone somewhere to safety, getting through on cell phones has sure. been impossible or difficult, and getting through on regular telephone lines we've been finding out as we've been trying to check on loved ones and call schools and such. You get fast busy signals, so there are a lot of people who are wondering if everyone is okay in their, in their individual families. Sure, all you need is just that simple word, I'm okay, I'm alive, I'm fine. Speaking of which, uh, across the wires, there are thousands of workers in those two towers, tens of thousands in fact. One of the large employers is Blue Cross Blue Shield Health Insurance, uh, which employs roughly 4,000 people uh, in what was World Trade Center 1 between the 24th and the 30th floors. And this is an example of uh, an attempt to find a way to let people know that you are okay. Empire Blue Cross Blue Shield has set up a telephone number, and we're going to give it to you for employees to call in and let their company know that they are okay and relatives can also call and check on their whereabouts. This involves some 4,000 employees. And here's the phone number that's on the wires, 866-761-8265. I'll give it to you one more time, 866-761-8265. And that's for employees of Empire Blue Cross Blue Shield, where workers can call in and, and let the company know that, uh, that they're okay. Also, we got word, Chuck, just before you jump in there, at 3 o'clock we were supposed to be seeing the reopening outbound of the Lincoln and Holland Tunnels and the George Washington Bridge. All right. Good news. The left of three right now. Uh, our transmitter was on top of the World Trade Center, as uh, were the, uh, this, the transmitters for all the television stations in New York City virtually are on top of the, were on top of the World Trade Center. So our over-the-air broadcast was knocked out when the World Trade Centers uh, collapsed. We're being seen on cable but we're also being seen on a number of stations in our area, and let me tell you what they are so you can pass the word on to people who uh, can at least get this much information about what's going on. 
On Western Long Island, you can get this broadcast, WNBC out of New York, on Channel 21, which is WLIW. In New Jersey, we are being broadcast on WMBC, that's Channel 63 in New Jersey. And Long Island City, there is a low power Channel 26 television broadcast, and we are being uh, broadcast over Channel 26 in Long Island City. So again, uh, Western Long Island, Channel 21, New Jersey, Channel 63, Long Island City, Channel 26. You can pick up this broadcast. If you know people who uh, do not have cable and who are eager to find out what's going on, uh, you can guide them to uh, those three channels, and they'll see exactly what you're seeing right now. I would assume that, that, that one of the hardest things at this moment for people who, who do have loved ones or friends or fellow employees that were in one of those two buildings, the hardest thing right now is is not having heard from them. And in many instances, there's probably a good explanation for it. They may not have access to a telephone. They may be in the hospital. They may be at one of these triage centers. So um, again, um, all we can tell you is that there are some companies that are starting to create these numbers that you can call. We will bring them to you, and we also have all kinds of numbers on our, on our uh, website at WNBC.com, so there's a lot of emergency numbers there to look up and get information. At this hour of the day, we should uh, take note that a lot of youngsters are getting out of school, mm -hmm. uh, those who remain in school to try to have some semblance of normalcy, um, are now coming home, being picked up by their parents, and uh, Jane, you and I have talked about this. What do you tell your children? It's a, this is a tough subject, and, and how do you try to explain in any kind of rational way well, what's taking place and give them some sense of uh, security? It is not a rational act, and mm -hmm. so therefore you cannot begin to explain it. Um, and I know there will be many questions and probably many nightmares. Um, fortunately, the kids were in school, so they weren't watching any of this being broadcast live because um, I'm, we all found it most disconcerting and shocking and stunning and just imagine what they would have thought. Um, so um, it will take an effort with mm. the kids. Very much so. We have on the another tack here, James Donegan, a military expert, is on the phone with us now. And um, while we're focusing on the immediate carnage and how to deal with it, we're also uh, looking ahead at what the options this country might have uh, in finding the people who are responsible for this and, and preventing it from happening again and certainly prosecuting those who did this. Uh, James Donegan, what are the options? Well, first we have to find out who did it. It seems fairly conclusive that it was bin Laden. Uh, he had made a boast, as it were, a, uh, a pronouncement about uh, three weeks ago that in three weeks uh, he was going to sh make a mighty strike against American interests. Now, uh, nobody really took that seriously because he makes these pronouncements occasionally, but what most people don't know is that the FBI has quietly quashed a lot of his attempts. Now, the reason why you don't hear about that is because to release any details would compromise the FBI's ability to go after these people. Well, this is one that got away, and what you're going to hear about in the next few months is a lot about the Internet and encryption, because that's how they pulled it off. Well, you say you're pretty confident it was bin Laden, but there certainly are other suspects out there. Are there not other people who have an axe to grind with this country who have the capability of doing this sort of thing? There are very few people who really have the capability of doing something like this. This required, A, uh, a lot of heavy-duty recruiting. Now, we do know that bin Laden has the largest pool of trained people, motivated people. Uh, I wrote a thing on my strategy page.com just today, unfortunately, uh, discussing the problems that terrorists are having recruiting pilots. Well, obviously, they found at least four of them. Um, Tim Bin Laden has been known, is known, to be very active in recruiting people. He has money to pay them, to maintain them. Uh, something like this requires a lot of money and a lot of time and a fair amount of expertise. I mean, pulling off uh, operations like this is not for amateurs. Uh, and that's why I say it's fairly certain that it's probably Bin Laden. Uh, again, we won't know. I mean, the, the FBI has a lot of leads. I'm sure they're, they're chasing down right now. You're going to see a lot of arrests in the news over the next few days as people they've been watching are picked up for further questioning. The Taliban, of course, have said they had nothing to do with it. Uh, but we're going to see some stuff coming out of Congress about, well, maybe we'll let the military send some people in there to look around. Uh, it's going to get very strange in the next few weeks as people basically look for a reason and some way to add some, you know, finality to all this. It was easy when we had we got hit by the Japanese at Pearl Harbor. They declared war a few hours later. But here, somebody's waging war on us, killing more people, many more people than at Pearl Harbor and they aren't even announcing themselves. I mean, there's no planes with red markings on them. There's no declaration of war. It's, well, welcome to the 21st century. Mr. Dunnigan, assuming that they do find out 
it was bin Laden or some other identifiable terrorist, what do we do? Well, then it becomes even stranger. Uh, over the last 50 years, terrorism has only succeeded when it had a, a country to provide bases. Up until the end of the Cold War, and this came out after the Cold War was over, Russia was providing the training bases, the money, a lot of support, which of course they always denied, uh, but now it's ancient history. Uh, the only ones really doing that now big time are Afghanistan. Uh, I won't go into that. That gets fairly complicated. But the problem is, if you're going to invade Afghanistan, which somebody in Congress is going to bring up before too long, uh, it's going to get very complicated. On the east, you have Pakistan, the only major country that recognizes the Taliban. On the west, you have Iran, which still doesn't like us and is controlled by Islamic fundamentalists. Uh, basically, we're going to need the assistance of Russia, and I expect we're going to get it. President Putin has already condemned you know, the, the, uh, the attack in very strong terms, and we're already working with the Russians. We have been for over over a year now on the intelligence level uh, trying to keep an eye on you know uh, terrorist operations coming out of Afghanistan if it isn't the Taliban it's going to be somebody we can't declare war on I mean if it isn't uh, you know bin Laden it's going to be somebody we can't declare war on I doubt if there's a country involved here so this is Pearl Harbor without anybody to blame without anybody to attack uh, the Congress will probably uh, come out with uh, laws or, or measures to repeal uh, the restrictions on special operations will end up uh, being under a lot of pressure, uh, political pressure, or to uh, do what the Israelis do, send out assassination squads. I mean, even, you know, on the day of this horror, uh, that is very, uh, very unpleasant to a lot of Americans. Uh, but how do you stop it? There probably is no way. We don't even know how they took, carried out the uh, hijackings. The hijackings may have been carried out despite the best security. For example, you could put six people on each of those planes, every one of them, you know, traveling separately, and then on a signal, they get up and run for the cockpit, over, over, overpower the crew, use things like plastic knives. You know, there are plastic knives you can get that can get through any security, um, and basically take over an airplane. You may not be able to stop those kinds of hijackings. Remember, these people were willing to sacrifice their lives. That's very difficult to fight against. That's a very good point. That's probably the, you know, the bottom line of all of this. James Dunnigan, thank you very much. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Joining us now is Doug Kriegel, who is... Um, from KNBC out in Los Angeles, and you actually were out on Long Island and came back into the city and made it through a, a, a heck of a lot of security. Is that not true? That's right. We keep hearing on the radio that you can't get into Manhattan, and I was absolutely shocked that I drove in from Kutchog to the heart of Manhattan, 90 miles, through about 15 checkpoints, and was never actually stopped. I did show my uh, press credentials from mm -hmm. Channel 4 News in Los Angeles and my NBC credit card. It was looked at. And they said, well, go right on through. And we even got to the Queensboro Bridge, which we were told was absolutely shut down. We got through simply only traffic officers are there, not actual police officers. Mm -hmm. Simply a, a group of traffic officers stopping people, and we got through there. What time was this? This was about, well, I arrived here about 10 minutes ago. Okay. I, so, I think that, uh, in fairness, the level of security has been dropping steadily all day long. Uh, I think This morning has. you would have had a tougher time. I did. So oh, you, you, yeah. you had a yeah. few checkpoints, yes, right? Yes, I did. Uh, and I almost didn't make it in here. I, it took an awful lot of persuasion. Um, happily, some of the police officers and the, the, the ranking officials watch Channel 4 from time to time, so they, they so recognize that I wasn't was actually your... a threat. Yeah. But uh, the, as the day has worn on, certainly the level of, the level of, uh, of concern about uh, the, the, the bridges and tunnels uh, has dropped as we've seen uh, things quiet down a bit. Well, we were obviously concerned that there was going to be another attack on, and they, they mm -hmm. obviously seemed like prime targets, so nobody knew what was going on and everything was halted. Um, but uh, Well, the scene at the Queensboro Bridge was like France in World War II. Yeah. Hundreds of people just walking across the bridge into Queens. Coming out of the city to Right, coming Queens. out of the city and virtually nobody going into Manhattan except my sister driving me and myself. <sighs> it was just really refu quite refugees a scene. Refugees heading out. Refu foot. Like yeah. refugees mm -hmm. in well, France in World War II. They had no, um, you know, no ability to leave other than that because for a time everything was just shut down tight. We are, look at this. There's, this there's the scene. There it is still going yeah. on. And yep. you could see, I presume, the plume of smoke from far out. Well, Island. we could. As soon as we got into sort of Glen Cove, Long Island, you could begin to see that plume of smoke. And the line of trucks on the Long Island Expressway was several miles long with hundreds of angry, furious truck drivers, motorists, people who need to get into Manhattan, just backed up for miles, unable to get in. And actually, we just drove around following the police officers. And there's sort of a cavalcade of police officers riding in the left lane, letting them in. And... Actually, we did join them, and as you say, Chuck, in fairness, 
uh, they have made the security a little more lax as you come into the city. Well, we, have a, we have a tape that we're going to show you in just a minute, but first to, to kind of set the scene. Um, during the news conference you saw live with the mayor and the governor and the police commissioner, there was a question asked about was there a secondary explosion that caused the, exactly. the World Trade Centers to collapse? Was there another bomb? We've heard this on and off all day long, that this wasn't just after the planes hit, there was something else, some other device that must have gone off to cause the collapse. Uh, they said in the news conference that it was likely just the effects of the impact of the aircraft. And let's just, we'll take a look at this tape. You were speculating earlier that it seems that it would be structural damage from the actual impact from the aircraft that would have caused the structure to weaken. I think it's, it, it is likely to assume, if you look at it, if you look at them very carefully, you see that um, after the impact of the aircraft, there was a very hot jet fuel fire. And the heat of that fire would compromise the steel. It's the structure of the building in that area. It would weaken the steel to the point where finally, when the steel got hot enough, it would simply begin to sag. And once the top of the building began to sag down, uh, the inertia of that mass on top would take the entire building to the basement. I, I think that um, it certainly, although you can't rule anything out right now until they thoroughly investigate it, but it would seem logical that uh, the planes themselves did all the damage, including the ultimate collapse of the buildings. And there was discussion earlier about the fact that, that these planes were all headed for the West Coast, loaded fully with fuel, uh, only creating more havoc because of, of the fuel on board. So there was a, just a furious jet fuel fire, and that is extremely hot. Did you just notice at the end of that tape how it looked like darkness had set in? Mm -hmm. We've heard that described over and over and over again this morning, um, that, that when those, that those plumes of, snow, of smoke came, came blasting at people, it suddenly turned from, from day to night. And what is it? Uh, six hours later, there is still that gray smoke Mm -hmm. rising from lower Manhattan into the sky. With a little bit of white smoke, it seems, mm -hmm. around the bottom there, so uh, perhaps they are finally beginning to get in there and attack the heart of this thing. Uh, Brian Thompson standing by right now at Newark. Is he at Newark Airport? Yes, Brian Thompson at Newark Airport, uh, of course, uh, the source of, we think, of one of the aircraft that uh, took off and caused some of this damage. Brian? Yeah, that was United Flight 93 out to San Francisco that was uh, uh, crashed into uh, an area near Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh or in Pittsburgh. Uh, we have no details from here on that. However, there was a news conference just a few minutes ago, a briefing rather, by the general manager here for the Port Authority, Susan Baer, in which uh, she said that she has no guidance from the FAA, and she has been in contact with the Federal Aviation Administration uh, this afternoon, no guidance from them as to when the air system across the United States, and of course these airports that have been shut down, when the FAA will uh, uh, lift this uh, shutdown of the entire nationwide air travel system. Uh, I asked her, could it be two hours or two days? She says, I have simply no guidance whatsoever. And so for now, Newark Airport, as well as every other commercial airport in the United States, all airports for that matter, are shut down other than for military traffic. We have seen some military traffic around here, by the way, through the course of the afternoon, mostly helicopter gunships, we believe from Fort Dix. We don't have a confirmation on that, however. Uh, Susan Baer uh, talking about the security at this airport, again, where one of the hijacked planes was uh, uh, took off from, uh, could only say at this point that while we don't discuss uh, security in detail for obvious reasons, that there will have to be another look at security, uh, both uh, on the ground and, and uh, perhaps in the air, but certainly on the ground uh, for airports across this nation and, and on behalf of the Port Authority. The Port Authority, by the way, of course, is very worried. They had thousands of workers in the Twin Towers, uh, and they don't have full reports on uh, uh, possible casualties there. They have moved their operations over to Journal Square in Jersey City, uh, where they have a training center uh, and technical center. And uh, so that is now where the uh, Port Authority is based out of, and it is a definitely an ongoing operation. Uh, emergency uh, ambulances uh, did uh, go into the city from New Jersey to help out there. I talked to uh, one paramedic uh, for UMDNJ who told me that while they uh, have been trained for mass disasters like, like mustard gas attacks or plane crashes, he said never, never have they ever been trained for any kind of mass destruction along the lines that we've seen in lower Manhattan uh, earlier this morning. Now some uh, 
six plus hours ago, I guess. Uh, that is pretty much the situation here. Most of the, uh, all of the airport has been evacuated. There uh, are probably a few people left. Uh, we're not at the terminal right now. We're near the um, main administration building and tower. You can see the, the World Trade Center over my shoulder behind me, or what's left of it. Uh, but uh, there are probably still a few people left, according to Susan Baer, that they're trying to find accommodations for. Uh, needless to say, a lot of travel plans were disrupted. People coming into New York, uh, not able to get vehicles, people who were leaving, uh, who uh, no longer have hotel rooms. We understand most hotels are pretty full around here. It's going to be a very, very long night, even on this side of the Hudson River. Live at Newark Airport, I'm Brian Thompson. Back to you. Brian, thank you. And we should tell you also that if you're planning to travel anywhere, uh, we've gotten word that the airports across this nation are going to be closed until at least noon tomorrow, perhaps beyond. So uh, your travel plans are on hold. They are indeed. It's pretty eerie to see airports that empty and the roadways mm -hmm. this empty, is it not? Very. Yeah. Doug Kriegel, you live in Los Angeles. We assume that you're not going back anytime soon, certainly not uh, as soon as you would have, have hoped. Well, I was hoping to spend the week fishing and playing golf on the Guess what, the you're North working. <laughs> They're calling you from KNBC right now because you will be working. Um, but thank you so much. We appreciate you coming in and, and telling us what you experienced trying to get back into the city when everybody else was trying to leave. All right. Thanks, Doug. Thank you. Well, let's take a look at, uh, I'm sorry? We have a oh, we have another witness on the phone right now. What's, uh, who do we have? Hello, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name, but uh, I understand we have somebody else who is an eyewitness to the explosion on the phone. Uh, can you tell us who you are and what you saw? Uh, I'm not getting anything here, so. Okay. Uh, are Perhaps you there? Yes, we... I'm here. Oh, good, okay. Uh, Wh with whom are we speaking? Uh, Greg DeVerna. Greg? Yes, sir. Okay, Greg, where were you when the, uh, uh, when the, the disaster struck? The floor of the first World Trade Center building. Which floor again, I'm sorry? 25. 25th floor? Yeah, the tell, World Trade Center. Tell me what happened. Um, sitting in a meeting and there was uh, <clears throat> several shutters uh, that were rocked through the building. Um, three or four particular shutters that uh, sent the building rocking and reeling a little bit. And uh, at that point in time, just evacuation occurred through the stairwells and everything was very orderly. Uh, although there were some people extremely scared and nervous and some people needing of assistance to get down the stairwells. But from the 25th floor to the ground, prior to the second explosion, uh, everything was pretty uniform. So you think everybody, at least from your floor down, got out okay? I would think so. At that point in time, the uh, emergency service people and, and the port authority that were on site immediately uh, assisted everyone in a very orderly fashion. And at that point in time, from that point until they got to the street level, everything seemed relatively clear until the falling debris was an issue. Uh, getting outside the outside of the World Trade Center. Are you in Tower 1 or 2? Were you? At number 1 at that time. There were only about 18 minutes between the two crashes. Um, was that, that sounds like it was almost enough time to get a fair number of people who were in that building out. Well, I would, I would say it took us about 15 or so minutes to get from the 25th floor down to the ground level or street level. And then I would say it was probably about a minute or two from that time uh, before we saw or anyone that did see the impact of the second plane uh, crashing into the number two uh, number two building. Did you know right away when you felt the building shake that something dreadful had happened and you, you had to get out? Um, it, it was, the, the shutter was certainly pronounced enough that there was a lot of concern, people immediately scared, and then once we were in the stairwells is when some people said they saw falling debris and that it might have been from an aircraft, and not until that time, but once again from the time you uh, exited uh, the stairwells and, and went down 25 stories Everyone was pretty um, orderly and uh, more concerned about people that were struggling to get down those stairwells. I, I'm wondering, um, the, the kinds of warning, we had one uh, witness earlier who told us that they were kind of given the all clear and people started to go back up to their offices. Um, you didn't get anything from, of that sort? No, that, um, I had heard that actually from a phone conversation I had with a friend of mine's wife, because I know he worked in two World Trade Center and uh, she said that some people were given the all clear to go back into two World Trade Center, but uh, I'd be shocked and dismayed if that was the case. And do you know anything about your co-workers? Are they all pretty safe and um, sound from what you can tell? Unfortunately, uh, my colleagues and friends were on significantly higher floors from 102 through 105, mm. and I have not had any correspondence with any of those friends or colleagues at this time yet. With what company are you, sir, if we might ask? Um, well, I formerly worked for a company called Cantor Fitzgerald, which occupied on 101, 102, 103, 104, 105. When you got out onto the street, where did you go? How did you know what to do at that um, point? 
once again, uh, police personnel escorted us out from the Liberty Street exit, and most people then, I would say, made a direct line over towards and behind the World Financial, World Financial Center towards the uh, Hudson River. And at that point, that's when we saw the crash of the second airplane into the building. Hmm. What was the reaction among the people you were with when you saw that second airplane hit? <clears throat> um, you know, I was really kind of by myself at that point in time, and, and I think, once again, just uh, total shock uh, is what really was, was, you know, a lot of people were obviously very concerned, very hysterical at that point in time, uh, maybe realizing and having it finally sink in the severity of what was going on. But uh, until that point in time, people didn't know if it was a fire. If, you know, people just didn't know until, I think, that second airplane hit. And did you tell yourself then, uh, when, as your thoughts cleared, that, that this was a deliberate act, that you were under attack? Um, clearly, I think at that point in time, I saw for about 10 or 15 seconds the sound of the engines, and I actually saw the aircraft hit into the number two World Trade Center. That uh, that aircraft, un, un, uh, unaffected, went right into that building and, and never tried to veer off course. Mm -hmm. Were you anywhere near the towers when they began to collapse? No, I, fortunately, I think I, at that point in time, I was on the FDR Drive, almost to the Triborough Bridge, with a friend of mine who drove into Manhattan. And uh, we had heard on the radio that the buildings were collapsed. And when we came over the Triborough Bridge at that point in time in his car, we looked off to the south, to our right, and we saw what was left of the buildings. And, and at that point in time, was just in total, total shock of, uh, of you know, the severity of where we were and, and fortunate that we were, we were long gone. Well, we thank you very much for sharing your experience with us. And we are awfully glad that you got out of that building safely. Thank you. Thank you all. Katie McGee is standing by right now with shadow traffic. Let's check in with Katie and see what the situation is around the area. Katie? Chuck, I've got to tell you, the situation has literally been changing minute to minute since about 9 o'clock this morning. What we have for you are some of the latest updates. Now, if you take a look right now at our Panasonic Skycam, you get a nice shot here of the Cross Bronx heading into the GWB. For most of the day, trying to get outbound at the George Washington Bridge, everything was closed down. I'd say about half an hour, 40 minutes ago, they reopened the outbound upper level only of the George Washington Bridge. So the traffic you're seeing on the Cross Bronx right now, that's everybody that has been waiting all day long to get there. Now, you're still going to find inbound GW Bridge closed, inbound Lincoln and Holland Tunnels. They are closed down as well. Now, just to get to the latest at some of the other bridges, up at the Upper East River, Throgs Neck, Whitestone, Triborough Bridges open into Queens only. Further down the East River, the Queens Midtown Tunnel, the 59th Street Bridge, Queens bound traffic only. Lower East River, Brooklyn Bridge and the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel are closed in both directions. Williamsburg Bridge, Manhattan Bridge, those are going to be open, as you can see. This pedestrian traffic only heading into Brooklyn. And this has just been an amazing sight all afternoon as you just see everyone travel across the Manhattan Bridge heading back into the city this after day where we have seen so much destruction. Some other bridges to update you on. Verrazano open into Staten Island only. Other Staten Island bridge crossings, Bayonne, Outer Bridge, Gothels, New Jersey bound only. Transit updates, these are really going to help you if you have been in the city all day and need to get home. Metro North is first as of 3 o'clock. Metro North running a Saturday schedule on all outbound trains leaving Grand Central Station. Inbound service will be terminating in Yonkers on all three lines. If you need to take Long Island Railroad, limited service heading eastbound or that would be outbound from Penn Station. Passengers being lined up outside Penn Station allowed in small groups to enter and then you'll be put onto the small number of trains they have running. As far as Long Island ra uh, roadways, westbound LIE closed down Patchogue Holbrook Road. Westbound Northern State closed at the Queens Line. Westbound Southern State still closed down at Hempstead Avenue. New Jersey Transit, this is where we've really had a rough time today. No bus service for you in or out of Port Authority. Obviously, with the bridges and tunnels closed coming in and out, that's causing the biggest backup. Now, trains, we do have some good news for you. Limited service outbound. New Jersey Transit trains from Penn Station, New York, to Penn Station in Newark. From there, you're going to find limited service on the Northeast Carter, North Jersey coastline in Raritan Valley. What happened? to his six partners George, who had gone into the building and near the building. George, can I just interrupt you for a sec? I'll come right back to you. But Ann Compton, who's been with the president all day, is on, on the phone from Nebraska. And we don't want to lose her if we can have her. Annie, can you hear me? Yes, Peter, I can. What and are you doing I'm, in Nebraska? Well, uh, we didn't know where we were till we landed. President Bush is here at the home of the Strategic Command. This is the area, this is the base where those big doomsday aircraft are kept. And he has disappeared down the rabbit hole, Peter, uh, down through a red brick 
a small building, he and what skeleton staff are with him, uh, down into an underground bunker where Ari Fleischer tells me the president is going to chair a National Security Council meeting by teleconference. Uh, we're also told that the president has been on the phone several times with the vice president, who is able to work out of a command center uh, at the White House itself in one of the secure areas below in the White House. Annie, your description of the president going down the rabbit hole, going into a very secure uh, compound bunker in, in, in Nebraska at Offutt Air Force Base suggests that people in his entourage believe there has been a threat today or a potential threat to the highest political leadership in the country. Is that correct? Well, and I asked exactly that question. They say there was no hint of any warning of the attacks that came on the East Coast today. But as you know, they always take the precaution, especially once the Pentagon was hit, that the president might be a target as well. And uh, that is why he has come to as secure a place as he could, uh, where he is trying to marshal the forces. He's also talking to some of the civilian leaders on the ground, including Mayor Giuliani and Governor Pataki. Um, but we were told there was no direct threat to him and no advance warning. And that in itself, Peter, is distressing to the uh, very small number of staff of the president here at Offutt. So, so the procedures are in place and, and they do what they do, right? Well, you know, in, in 27 years of covering presidents and crises, we have never played the kind of hunted game that uh, was played today where we would take off in the plane and not know where we were going to land. And then once we landed in Louisiana, where we were literally told not to use cell phones so our location couldn't be pinpointed, to take off again uh, and head to uh, the center. It, it does feel like a cat and mouse game. Ari Fleischer, when I asked him if the president feels in jeopardy or hunted, he said the president understands that this is kind of the precaution that is necessary at a time like this and that he's anxious to get back to Washington. And, and for example, when you phoned us just a moment ago, thank goodness you did, did you have to ask permission to do it? Uh, no, because it, it is hard to hide a great big airplane like Air Force One. And when we were coming in, I could tell we were over a flat area, a fairly <laughs> urban area. And uh, I guess it was Nebraska, knowing that uh, we hadn't been that far out of Louisiana. And indeed, as we came down over the field, I saw a satellite, a TV satellite truck out on the highway. <laughs> and sure enough, on our screens inside the plane, we watched ourselves land. The local media was already here, figuring this is where the President of the United States and the Commander-in-Chief would land. Because it's part of the old Strategic Air Defense Command. Exactly right. It has the facilities, the secure facilities here, where the president can still be, as what Ari tells me, is a seamlessly in touch with the command structure in Washington. And which we remind ourselves, and I'm going to involve George Stephanopoulos in this conversation, but just think about how the world has changed and yet in some respects hasn't. The president's gone to Nebraska to a facility which was designed during the Cold War, um, where the president might retreat or go in the case of a thermonuclear exchange or an atomic thermonuclear exchange between the United States and the Soviet Union. It, it, That's really amazing, something to think about. It, it, it's an amazing uh, comment on where we are in the 21st century. You know, we have been checked our bags over and over again today. We take that kind of security routinely on Air Force One, but it's been double that today. And just the thought of Americans who are stranded in airports all across the country trying to, to get home uh, today or tomorrow, the kind of security they will then, then uh, face, that uh, certainly the White House sees uh, the ramifications and the impact of this extending through American life uh, as far as you can see. Annie, thank you very much. I hope you'll stay in, in fact, I know you'll stay in touch. Um, you. There are five of us who have been allowed to stay with the president, but we are allowed in the underground bunker with him. I say that again? There are only five of us reporters who have been allowed to stay with him. Everyone else was left in Louisiana. Uh, there are four staff members, five, five of us from the press, and a very small Secret Service uh, contingent. It was an em almost an empty Air Force One that brought us here. We don't know how long we'll be here or when the president will find it safe to go back to Washington. But you're not in the bunker. No, they would not let us in the bunker. We are above ground uh, looking at the metal between, between him and us. Okay, Annie, thanks very much. Ann Compton, just to bring you up to date very quickly on the rest of the, of, of the, of the first family. Uh, Ari Fleischer, the president and press secretary, did say that Barbara, uh, the two 19-year-old ghosts, Barbara at Yale and, and, and Jen at the University of Texas were moved to secure locations. Mrs. Bush was with a group of friends, uh, and they were in, in an undisclosed uh, location, but she's had a chance to talk to the president, and everything is pretty cool.
there. But er everything we hear and everything we report to you hour after hour after hour um, is a reminder of how seriously people have taken this. And I want to go to George Stephanopoulos, uh, not so much in his position as a reporter today, but calling on his experience in the White House. George, I, to be honest, I plead naivete maybe here a bit, but I'm surprised at the lengths to which whomever has gone to keep the president on the move from Florida to Louisiana to Nebraska rather than going back to Washington. What's the thinking behind well, that, and what did it have occurred in the previous administration? Well, my, my guess is, first of all, we've never seen anything like this before, so it's hard mm. to answer your second question. I think this is a testimony to the seriousness uh, of the situation to make sure, number one, this means that the Secret Service, I think, is in charge. Right. Their number one and really only job is to protect the body of the president, and they're going to all links to do that right now. Peter, there are also some, some small indications and I, that that the, the broader evacuation of the senior staff of the White House that is always planned for in emergencies, as you hinted at, from a relic from the Cold War days, has also gone into effect. I spoke with the, the spouse on, of George, the senior White on, House. Hang on, George. George. I apologize. I'm only interrupting you because you're so... Okay, you don't have those sirens behind you. Go ahead. The sirens behind me. Sorry. I, I spoke earlier, just a little while ago, to the spouse of a senior White House official who received a call simply from the Secret Service saying, uh, your spouse is safe. Uh, is in a secure location right now. I remember from my early days, Peter, in the White House, several senior White House staff are given cards and have evacuation plans for places to go in cases of national emergency. And as I said, it does seem to be, there does seem to be some indication that that may have been put into effect. I, I would just add one more note. You, Ann was talking about the possibility of the president doing now a teleconference with his, his senior national security right. officials. There are facilities in the White House, not the normal situation room, which everyone has seen in the past, has seen pictures of, but there is a second situation room behind the, the primary situation room, which has video conferencing capabilities. The, the director of the Pentagon, the, the defense chief, can speak from the National Military Command Center at the Pentagon. The uh, sec Secretary of State can speak from the State Department, the president from wherever he is, and they'll have this capability to video conference throughout this crisis in my time at the White House it was used in, af in the aftermath of the Oklahoma City bombing, in the aftermath of the TWA Flight 800 bombing, and, and that would be the way they would stay in contact through the afternoon. Uh, uh, just a couple of, uh, of, of short questions. Um, gi given where the president has gone from Florida to Louisiana to Nebraska, and given that we hear from the political staff that he'd like, they'd like him to come back to Washington, does the president have any say at the moment? basically if the secret service says go left or go right or go here or go there well the president has the ability to overrule them if he wants but i think in this situation peter he, he would follow their directions obviously pushing them uh, to try to get back as soon as as soon as he could if that was really what his political advisors wanted but but he would he would take their direction on this one sometimes you can fight the secret service on you know how long you're going to spend in a rope line i don't think you'd do it on this okay dokie and the other question is in terms of dick cheney the vice president is in the white house now just from a purely operational point of view if you were trying to run things at the moment would you like to be in the white house or in a bunker in nebraska or would it make any difference? Um, well, it, it doesn't. I, I think right now, Peter, it doesn't make any difference. Air Force One and this bunker in Nebraska has complete communications all across the board. And as I said, my guess is that Vice President Cheney is in that second situation room. A camera is trained on him. He can see the president. The president can see him. They can see Secretary Rumsfeld, Secretary State Powell. It's as if they're meeting in one room. Now tell me, let's, re let's return to the, the immediate business at hand. Uh, I, I, every time I check in with you or we check in with you, I hear sirens virtually right underneath you. What's going on right underneath you? Well, right underneath, I'm at Canal Street and the Avenue of Americas, which is about 20 blocks away from the World Trade Center there. Every once in a while, right outside my window right now, there are about four police vans and a police car. Um, they're, they're, but the police seem to just be stationing there, almost resting right now. The area right around us is quite quiet. About an hour ago, two hours ago, there were hordes of people walking uptown. That's pretty much stopped. Now, Peter, I got to tell you, it's very strange. You look down on the sidewalk and you just have people strolling uh, in their summer clothes up in this neighborhood right here. But again, from what we've heard of that situation down by the World Trade Center, it's horrific. It's kind of eerily silent. The, the firemen are, are relieving each other every 15 minutes or so. They come out, they get showered down with fire hoses to get all the soot off, and then they go right back in and get to work. And, and we are going to jump out of the Peter Jennings interviewing George Stephanopoulos, seeing that you have seen 
we have relayed to you throughout the day, our own reporters at that scene. Fascinating Ann Compton leaving the Air Force Base in Louisiana, not knowing where she's going on Air Force One and landing at Offutt Air Offutt. Force Base outside of Omaha, Nebraska. Who knew that they had even departed Louisiana? I mean, they are very, very careful in the handling of this man at this hour. Top secret at this point, uh, Vice President Cheney at the White House, President Bush in a bunker at a former strategic command center at Offutt Air Force Base outside Omaha, Nebraska. And at we, some point, would there, are they going to have a National Security Council meeting, perhaps by teleconference, or do we know? What I'm sure they've already doing it. They're you doing it right so? now. Okay. Oh, yeah. Will um, it be teleconference, do you think? I don't know. Okay. I just, I, sim I simply don't. I would imagine that would be. Um, the communication systems, of course, excellent these days. Yes. Except, of course, when we're trying to get a hold of some of our reporters, because so much of our communication devices were on top of the World Trade Center. We want to turn, uh, children are leaving, are, are leaving school now and arriving home, and we really want to talk a little bit about that. How do you tell your children what happened. If they don't know already, they will know today and tonight. If they already know, they have watched this in horror as the rest of us over the last six and a half hours. Almost at America. Uh, as Linda said earlier, uh, Yasser Arafat, the Palestine, Palestine Liberation Authority leader, uh, condemned the attacks, but that is not preventing uh, this outpouring of great joy, if, if you want to call it that, among Palestinian people who doubtless see this as a strike against uh, the hated enemy, America. So these pictures taken earlier today in Palestinian areas. We take it back to Larry Korb, who is graciously joining us on the phone and helping us understand exactly how the U.S. military would formulate a response. Larry, even though Osama bin Laden wasn't necessarily considered a force during the Reagan administration, certainly you had procedures in place for how to coordinate a response to a terrorist attack. What were they? Well. Obviously, but there are things that you can do, but you have to know who to respond against, uh, right. and that's the, that's the problem. But I mean, in terms of sort of, you know, do you have the National Military Command Center in the basement of the Pentagon? Are they Well, yeah, obviously. I mean, what, what you do then is you have the forces in the area. Most probably you would have ships with cruise missiles or planes with uh, cruise missiles that would attack. Remember, we did attack bin Laden after the blowing up of the embassies uh, in Africa in 1998. We did attack his camp. Right. Uh, so, yes, I mean, there we have forces all around the world. We have bombers that can fly from the United States uh, that attack any place in the world. So that's probably what we would uh, do if we found the people. But that's the problem you have in this new era, that these groups don't belong to any one nation, and there's, there's no real central headquarters that you can hit. Also, you generally, as I understand it, you, meaning the Pentagon, I mean leaders of the at the Pentagon, have a list of response targets already prepared before an attack ever occurs against the United States. There's already a list that you, that you deploy uh, when given the go-ahead by the White House, correct? Well, that's right. I mean, you have a number. I mean, we have very good intelligence. Our technical intelligence is terrific. We know where these people are, and if we can make a link, yes, uh, then we can go ahead and, and go after them. The problem is making that link because the United States uh, stands for decency in the world and, you know, innocent until you're proven guilty. So it, it's hard for us to do some of the things that I think the relatives of these poor folks in New York today are going to want us to do uh, because of uh, uh, the, the procedures that we follow. Right. Now, I, I want to take you back again to a statement of a, of a Taliban official, obviously the Taliban government being that in charge of Afghanistan. He said, quote, bin Laden does not have the facilities to orchestrate such a major assault within the United States. Uh, some other terrorism experts are saying that he may be the only person who has the kind of organization to orchestrate this kind of attack. Where do you stand? Yeah, yeah I think he's the only one. And re remember, we're not talking, I mean, he didn't buy missiles or anything like that. What they basically did was hijack four airplanes. Right. And he certainly has the wherewithal to, to, uh, to do that. Now, the ultimate go-ahead for any sort of strike, when it comes, if it comes, if it is determined fairly clearly that we have figured out who is responsible for this, how does the chain of command work? I mean, who gives the go-ahead, and, uh, and where does it have to sort of, does it does, does originate from the top, from the commander-in-chief, the president? Right, only the president can order military action, and then he sends the order to the secretary of defense who transmits it to the uh, field commander, but only the president has that authority under under our Constitution. Now, when you say he transmits it to the field commander, does he speak to Donald Rumsfeld? 
Yeah, the president. And then it goes to the Joint Chiefs, or how exactly does it go no, down the... Normally what the president would do is he would sign the order or direct the Secretary of Defense to execute whatever the, the contingency plan would be. The Secretary of Defense would sign the order, and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff would transmit it through military uh, channels to the commander-in-chief of the Pacific, to the commander-in-chief of our Atlantic forces, or whoever is the area commander, the commander-in-chief of the... This is hard to put into the appropriate words, but a lot of people are girding for some very bad news. Uh, there is a, a chance that uh, uh, many members of uh, New York's uh, financial community, those people who make their living on and near and uh, connected to Wall Street, are uh, preparing to hear the very worst about friends and associates who may work in the upper floors of the World Trade Center where some very big firms uh, are headquartered. And uh, this is uh, one of the reasons this is such a, uh, a tough day. While we await the Pentagon briefing, we're happy to be joined by uh, our bureau chief in Washington and the